Hey guys, Masako X here, and welcome back to another What If Week! We are back with some interesting scenarios to get your grey matter going. Last month we talked about the possibilities that befell Bulma if she never met Goku, what if Piccolo fused early with Kami, and what would be the result if Kid Goku went Super Saiyan a lot earlier than he was supposed to. Pretty outlandish stuff, don't you think? So let's continue that trend with quite possibly one of the most requested what ifs I have received thus far. What if Raditz turned good? Goku's brother from the depths of space, our ticket to the stars. One that only stuck around for about five episodes before being killed by a special beam cannon by Piccolo taking Goku with him. But that's besides the point. What if we were to say that the events of that fight somehow changed, changed in a way that resulted in a long lost relative of Cousin It from the Addams Family surviving? Since Raditz does not make his mark until the end of the Dragon Ball arc and the beginning of the Z arc, around about chapter 195 of the original manga, the events of the original Dragon Ball series are pretty much the same as they were, with Goku and Piccolo remaining bitter rivals and Gohan being born. Raditz arrives on Earth and is shocked, disappointed and annoyed to not only see the Earth pristine, but thriving. Clearly his little brother needs a good talking to or he's dead. Whatever the reason, he has to do something about it. After coming across Piccolo and teasing him about his weaker power level, which is something that Raditz does a lot, he senses a slightly greater power level and goes off to investigate. At this time, he doesn't know it's his little brother because Saiyans at the time relied solely on their scouters. Instead of having the ability to sense powers naturally, he finds Goku at Kame House and the events of the manga and the anime play out as you would expect. Him informing his younger brother about his Saiyan origins as well as the fate of their race. After Goku refuses to join his brother in arms, Raditz kidnaps his nephew and flees the scene. This is the point where Goku and Piccolo reluctantly join sides despite being bitter enemies for the longest time. They have to fight Raditz in order to save the Earth and Gohan. Yeah, 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 I know, this is the story that you're very familiar with and I've really not deviated. Well, don't worry, this is where I start to do so. We are about to divert from this well-trodden path. Well, well, well-trodden path. We have now reached the point where Piccolo is about to fire the special beam cannon. Now let's just say, like in Xenoverse 1's alternate telling, that Raditz just about manages to muster enough strength to free himself of Goku's grasp. He has just enough time to dodge the special beam cannon whilst that hits Goku dead on. Oops, Piccolo just done killed the main character. Now Raditz has escaped being turned into Saiyan Swiss cheese, but he is still winded and injured from his spat with Gohan. You know, that moment where Gohan just launches himself at Raditz and kind of body slams him in the stomach? Now let's say in this instance that that impact left more of an injury than it did in the anime. At this point, Piccolo would have been rather conflicted about the whole incident. Yeah, he kind of let the enemy escape, but at the same time, he managed to best his rival, Goku. At this point, he'd be doing a lot of processing and not really paying attention to Raditz. Now, Raditz would have used this time to fire an energy blast in Piccolo's direction, giving him a quick getaway whilst being able to recover from his injuries in solitude. Wait, what? Raditz, run away? That's not like him, Masako. Ah, well, I think it is entirely like him. Now, you see, Raditz may be more like the archetypal Saiyan than Goku is, but he is still slightly different from the stereotype. He is a trickster and a manipulator, but he does have a level of empathy which kind of elevates him from the typical Saiyan. Now that I think about it, all of Raditz's relatives are somewhat different from normal Saiyans. You know, Bardock, Gine, Kakarot, Raditz. They're all much more empathic. If he was truly a cold-blooded killer, he would have killed Goku on the spot for failing to do his job of destroying the planet, terraforming it, and preparing it for Lord Frieza. Nope. He gave his brother many chances to change his mind and join him. Although granted some of those instances were traps. Also, more importantly, Raditz is a bit of a coward. He fears death greatly and is shocked to see that Goku would even contemplate sacrificing himself. That's not something a typical Saiyan would say. A normal Saiyan, if they were in a similar situation to what Raditz and Goku were in, would have commended Goku for his wise and cunning strategy. They would have been impressed by Goku's actions. Not Raditz. He was horrified. If you saw Raditz as your first true example of the Saiyan race, you wouldn't really think much of them. This also might explain why Raditz is so weak in comparison to Vegeta and Nappa. His less valiant persona probably gave him fewer opportunities to get a Zenkai boost. You know, getting to the brink of death and then healing up. He probably did that far less often by just 
not being there because he was scared. So whilst Raditz escapes, the main gang arrives. Like in the anime, Piccolo makes the decision to take Gohan and train him, just in case that Raditz guy came back to try and finish the job. So Piccolo's doing the same thing that he did in the anime, but for slightly different reasons. He's not aware of the incoming Saiyans, Vegeta and Nappa. As far as he's concerned, it's just Raditz. With a little bit of training and some assistance from Goku's brat, they could take him on, no problem, that's fine. They could take out that long-haired maniac. Speaking of Vegeta and Nappa, they have heard everything that's been going on on Earth. Remember, those scouters were open the entire time. Once Raditz has been able to recover enough so he can converse with the Saiyans, which is about a day or two, he reports back about what happened in great detail. Vegeta would have mocked Raditz for being so weak and allowing these pesky Earthlings to get the better of him. Also, he would have made fun of Raditz for having such a weak brother who couldn't do his job properly, and therefore branded him and Kakarot a complete and utter waste of space. As far as the Prince of All Saiyans was concerned, Raditz's incompetence on Earth was the last straw, and he would tell Raditz not to return to Vegeta and Nappa's company. But before Vegeta can say this though, Nappa jumps in and says that Piccolo guy sounded kind of fun and that he wants to try and fight him. He wants to check out that Earth and pay that green guy a visit. Well, they've got nothing better to do, so with his interest piqued, Vegeta agrees to go to Earth and fight Piccolo, using the coordinates that Raditz provided through his scouter transmissions. Raditz pleads with Vegeta to let him help the two, but Vegeta is having none of it. He gives Raditz an ultimatum, either stay out of their way when they arrive on Earth or die. Vegeta cuts comms with Raditz, leaving the Saiyan completely isolated and alone. He now has nothing. His planet gone, his friends gone, and even his long lost brother is gone. What does he do now? He's a disgrace to the entire Saiyan race. But he can't just sit back and take what Vegeta and Nappa has said, even if he is the prince of all Saiyans. He's gotta do what's best for his race and come up strong. Rise to the occasion! After a few weeks to further recover from his wounds, he decides to pay Piccolo a visit and try and find him somewhere in the mountains. He uses his scouter to try and search for Piccolo's power level. He notices that the power level has increased slightly and that there is another power level there with him. But due to the fact that I think that the scouter's battery is starting to weaken, he can't get a precise location for the two. Just a general direction, like say, oh, they're about so many miles northwest or something. He flies off in that direction to search for Piccolo and Gohan. Because Raditz cannot manipulate his energy and try and suppress it so that gives him cover, Piccolo can easily sense Raditz approaching and therefore change his location quite easily. For the next few weeks, it's a subdued game of cat and mouse. One night though, things change. Gohan looks at the full moon and so does Raditz. This results in both of them changing into great apes, not that far from each other. And you know what that means, big great ape fight! The two Saiyan apes duking it out with Raditz being the stronger and being far more in control of his actions than Gohan is. During this battle, he can sense that Gohan is actually quite powerful for his age. Piccolo is watching this with utter horror and destroys the moon before Gohan could potentially be seriously hurt or indeed killed. The two revert to their humanoid forms with Gohan left completely out cold and Raditz chuckling, putting on some kind of bravado. Piccolo is about to launch a barrage of key attacks at Raditz, but Raditz stops him saying that that he shouldn't bother and it's completely pointless. He then uses this moment to inform Piccolo about Vegeta and Nappa's impending arrival. The fact that these two Saiyans are far stronger than he, so Piccolo shouldn't do anything rash, Raditz could help them. Raditz then puts on an act, saying he's so remorseful for his brother's death and has come to respect his younger brother now that he has passed away and that out of respect, he wants to help them and change sides out of pure goodwill. Piccolo doesn't trust him one bit, but at the same time, two immensely strong Saiyans is much more of a concern than one mediocre Saiyan. If you're having to deal with three Saiyan warriors, it's better to have one of them on your side, right? Better the devil you know and all that. Whilst this has been going on, Goku has proceeded to King Kai's place via Snake Way like he did in the anime and the manga. The difference is, is that Goku is not aware of Vegeta and Nappa's impending arrival on Earth. But King Kai is though. He is the Kai of North Galaxy after all, and would notice two particularly powerful Saiyans heading in the direction of Earth, and that spelling not exactly good news. He would impress upon Goku to train harder than he ever has before in his life, much more than he did on the planet in the anime. So everything will kind of catch up. As the two Saiyans head for Earth, Raditz, Gohan and Piccolo are training with each other. 
Both Piccolo and Gohan are extremely untrusting of Raditz, but they believe that just to play along with this guy is a lot better than ending up dead. Hey, I guess they're just being grateful for that, I suppose. Then one night, Raditz asks about his brother and what he was like. Gohan says fondly that his daddy is the greatest and strongest fighter on Earth, beating every single guy in his path, even Mr. Piccolo. Piccolo annoyingly confirms this and says that not only is Goku a great fighter, but a very honorable warrior at the same time. This is a big deal for Piccolo, because this is not something he would easily say. Raditz is actually kind of impressed, and this is where his bravado begins to falter. He recalls his own childhood and how lonely it was. If you're familiar with the events of Toybull's Dragon Ball Zero fan manga, you'll know where I'm going with this. If not, I shall summarize it by the fact that Raditz did not have a good childhood. It's kind of obvious if you think about it. Bardock and Gine, his parents are dead, Kakarot's somewhere out in space, Raditz is left alone, just at the hands of Lord Frieza. Vegeta and Nappa, they're not friends, they're picking on him for being so weak and having a useless father that doomed everyone. Raditz was treated with contempt, what do you expect? By showing this vulnerability, finally, Piccolo and Gohan can sense that Raditz is not all that bad. On the inside, he is a scared and lonely soul. Raditz even goes so far as to apologizing for Goku's demise, but quickly regains his bravado and macho vibe. This is where Piccolo decides to share with Raditz that they plan to wish Goku back with the Dragon Balls. Inspired by this news, Raditz is completely revitalized, and Gohan and Piccolo continue to train with him with much more vigor, bringing Tenshinhan, Yamcha, Krillin, and Chiaotzu into the mix as well. By the time the Saiyans arrive, Raditz is a lot stronger. Strong enough to even hold his own against Nappa somewhat. The Z-Warriors meet up with Vegeta and Nappa as they do in the anime. Vegeta mocks Raditz and tells him that he signed his own death warrant for showing up. He has come to accept that he is weaker than Vegeta, but he doesn't care. He is going to fight for the Saiyan race and make Vegeta rue the day that he banished him from his side. Raditz is a true Saiyan. We then jump to the place in the story where Nappa is about to use his break cannon against Gohan. Sure enough, Piccolo does jump in front of Gohan, but then Raditz jumps in front of Piccolo. Raditz is stronger than Piccolo during this arc, so instead of being completely and mortally wounded, he is able to take it and just about stand up looking completely badass in the process. He would stand up, snigger, and laugh at Nappa for his feeble attack. Is that the best you can do, Nappa? We then get a short but well choreographed fight between Raditz and Nappa, which gives Piccolo enough time to get Gohan out of the way. Goku then arrives to witness Raditz fighting Nappa and is rather confused about the situation. Are they supposed to be on the same side? Vegeta was slightly amused at this fight, but now he's completely bored of it. He shoots a bang beam at Raditz's heart, stopping him dead in his tracks. Literally. Raditz is fatally injured and he falls down to the ground. Goku uses this time to head over to Piccolo and Gohan to check whether they're okay. They then tell Goku about Raditz, how he's changed, and how he's now on their side. Goku's still kind of confused though, so he walks over to Raditz to try and get some more answers out of him, with Nappa laughing on from the sidelines, saying about how they look too cute together, the siblings. Raditz looks up at Goku and is glad to see him again. He apologizes for his behavior the last time they met. Raditz tells Goku that he knows all about his little brother's fight and how proud he is of him because he's gotten so strong. He can sense the potential in Goku to make the Saiyan race proud, much more so than Vegeta and Nappa and how he can take those two bastards out. If only our father could see us now, he'd say, taking on a prince and beating him. Who'd have thought? <laughs> Goku thanks Raditz for his help in keeping Gohan safe as well as even forgiving Raditz for his original transgression in kidnapping Gohan in the first place. Raditz chuckles and slips away from consciousness. Goku is left saddened and angered and proceeds to body slam Nappa as he does in the anime. And thusly, the events of the Saiyan saga continue to play out as per normal. Only this time, Piccolo is around to watch the action unfold. Whilst Goku is in the hospital recovering, he is just thinking about stuff, reflecting on Raditz, and then just comes to the conclusion that he wants to bring Raditz back. Chi Chi reassures him and says that they can do that once the Dragon Balls have completed their one year cycle. But Goku's kind of impatient in this situation. He's having none of it. He's getting pretty argumentative and actually borderline aggressive. He wants to see his brother again and he wants to see him now. That's when Krillin has his brainwave about the Namekian Dragon Balls. He had overheard Vegeta and Nappa talking about them earlier on in the arc and then just assumes that they might be of use to them right now. Remember, 
They were talking about them around the time when we found out that Piccolo was also an alien, a Namekian, and kind of just a slug dude instead of a demon. By retaining this plot point and instead just changing the focus from bringing Piccolo, Tenshinhan, and Yamcha back to life, it's focused to Raditz, then for the most part, the initial part of the Namek saga is actually quite identical to the original. Mr. Popo and Bulma check out the ship that brought Kami to Earth and then take it back to Capture Core so that means they can repair it and make it spaceworthy. The biggest difference here in relation to the original saga is that everyone's still alive except Raditz. So, who would go with Gohan, Krillin, and Bulma? Piccolo, perhaps? Well, I'm gonna say no. Wait, what? What? Why Masako? Well, I'm gonna hold him back for later, you'll understand why. For now, we're just gonna say that Piccolo's hesitant to go to Nemec right now, he doesn't know what to expect, so he'll just hang back for the time being. The very idea that he is an alien and not a demon is something that he's going to need to process for quite a while. Much like how he needed time to process what happened during the 23rd Tenkaichi Budokai, that took a while. For now, we're just gonna say that Yamcha joins the gang, not only to help them out, but also be close to Bulma. Now remember, this is the part of Dragon Ball that Bulma and Yamcha were still pretty close, despite him having a baseball career and being a bit of a ladies' man. Way, 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 Masako. Didn't Yamcha and Tenshinhan die in your first part? Nope. They survived. Barely. Thanks to the assistance of Raditz, the impact of the Cybermen was greatly reduced and therefore lessened the injuries that the Z fighters sustained. They both hung in there long enough for Goku to come back and give everybody sensu beans. Now, if you're not happy with that explanation, consider this just a little retcon. I mean, that's child's play in comparison to the retcon of bringing Raditz back to life. It's down to popular demand, thanks to you guys. For Yamcha and Bulma, this is a great time for them to reconnect away from the press and publicity. Tenshin Han elects to stay behind and protect Earth, as well as mourn the death of his partner Chaozu. Yeah, I know everybody survived, but yeah, Chaozu still did die because he did sacrifice himself. So yeah, I know that might not be fair to Chaozu fans, but I think that was a good cause and it made for a good plot point at the time. Roshi says that Tenshin Han should go with the gang, you know? It's a great chance to explore space and do something different. You know, Roshi can take care of things here, it'll be fine. Tenshin Han thanks Roshi for this offer, but he again declines to go with the team. Now, if you think I'm being mean to Tenshin Han here, I'm not. He's a pretty serious guy, and when he realizes that if he went along with them, there would be really nobody there to help protect Earth should Vegeta come back and try and take over Earth again. Yes, I may have mentioned something to the contrary that Tenshin Han did go with the gang in another what if, but in this case, I feel that it's justified that Tenshin Han stays behind, not only to protect Earth, but also have a good dialogue between him and Roshi, just a chance for them to actually talk to each other. Gohan, Krillin, Bulma, and Yamcha head off to Namek in the old spaceship that has now been fitted with the latest tech from Capsule Corp. This time around, we're going to skip fake Namek. No reason, really. I I just, I just felt like it. During this time, Yamcha and Bulma would reflect on their past and start to bond again properly. I believe that this would become important later, just you wait. As that's all going on, Vegeta is on Freezer Planet 79, tending to his wounds in the medical machine. Afterwards, he's bragging to some of his associates that, Oh, that Raditz? Oh, he dare tried to stand up to me, the stupid idiot. But then he kind of glosses over the fact that Raditz almost killed Nappa. Yeah, he's just gonna not mention that bit. Like in the anime, Vegeta dashes off to Nemec when he finds out from Kui that Freezer is after the Namekian Dragon Balls, because remember, scouters pick up everything. Once Goku receives a sensu beam from Yajirobe, he goes to Piccolo and asks him to join him going to Namek. Piccolo has had some time to think whilst he's been meditating, and he then reluctantly decides to go with Goku. They both head to Capture Corp and receive the new ship that Dr. Briefs had been building in that time. Without hesitation, Goku and Piccolo head off to Namek. During this time in space, this would be the first time that Goku and Piccolo actually get to train together. You know, instead of just fighting each other to the death. True, they fought together during the Raditz spat, as well as the Dead Zone movie, but this would be a little different. Those two times were out of desperations. This time, they're actually training properly. At this point in the story, we can actually take a look at the power level pamphlet that came with the Tree of Might release. In that brochure, Goku's power level is listed as 10,000 and Piccolo's 8,000. Since their power levels are relatively close to each other, that means that they can go all out in their training and Goku can actually get some meaningful practice with a sparring partner. Based on a previous calculation from another what if, Goku's power level increased nine times during his trip to Namek. Thanks to Piccolo giving him some meaningful practice, that multiplier, I believe, could be increased to 10 times. When Piccolo and Goku arrive on Namek, their power levels are 80,000 and 100,000 respectively. 
But back to the others. Their adventures on Nemec initially are relatively same to the original, with the only difference being that Yamcha elects to stay with Bulma and keep her company so she's not for the most part alone and just ditched. He's also guarding her in case somebody dare try and attack her. Okay Yamcha, you do you and you just pretend to be brave. Or you actually might be serious. Either way, the events in the anime play out the same until the time the Ginyu Force arrive. Krillin has had his potential released and he then offers Gohan and Yamcha the same thing. Yamcha's a little worried about leaving Bomber alone, but Bomber thinks that she'll be okay for a couple of hours. Besides, if Yamcha can get stronger in some ways, then he can get stronger in other ways. That encourages Yamcha, and he then blasts off towards Guru's place before anyone else can even figure out what's going on. We then jump to Piccolo and Goku arriving on Namek. The Ginyu Force have been beating down on the Z Fighters. Goku gives Sensu Beans to everyone and they're back to full health, thankfully. He and Piccolo then proceed to wail on the Ginyu Force some more, with Piccolo being far less merciful than Goku in this case, especially with Jace. Jace is shot down by Piccolo as he tries to escape, and Vegeta finishes off Berta and Raccoon like in the anime. Goku protests to both of them, and they both turn around to then shout at him, saying that this is not the time to be soft. Huh, they actually seem to both agree on something. Hmm, go figure. After sharing this mutual agreement, they can sense that Captain Ginyu is on his way. Well, yeah, he would be considering that three of his men have suddenly died within the last few seconds. Like in the show, Krillin and Gohan, along with Yamcha, decide to gather the Dragon Balls as the others take on Ginyu. But then Vegeta flees the scene like he did in the show. It's up to Piccolo and Goku to take out Ginyu. And they do for the most part. Or do they? Ginyu uses his change ability against Goku, and then I think this will lead towards a nice little callback to the 2013 Kaichi Budokai in that it's a Goku versus Piccolo fight, albeit slightly different. But it doesn't last long though, because remember, Ginyu Goku can't tap into Goku's power entirely. So remember 23,000? Yeah, that still happens. Piccolo beats Ginyu Goku down to the point where Ginyu decides that he could maybe jump into Piccolo's body. But then Goku Ginyu jumps in the way and takes the Change Now Blast, so that means everyone's back in their original bodies. And of course, we have to, the frog bit with Ginyu happens as per normal. Now for those of you who've been wondering where Raditz is, now is his time. It's just that his contribution during the Saiyan Saga changed a lot of things that I had to cover. I just needed to go over those points before Raditz actually came on the scene. Once Piccolo takes Goku back to Frieza's ships, that means he can recover in a medical machine, the gang summon Purunga and they can now make their wishes. Their wish is to bring Raditz back to life and then transport him to Namek. Once Raditz shows up on Namek and gets his bearings and senses what's going on, he can do that now, he learnt that while he was training with Gohan and Piccolo, he can sense that Frieza is on this planet. What's been going on while he's been away? He's aghast at what's happening and he kind of thinks, why am I here? What good can I do? But he then decides to go to the ship reluctantly. Now he may not be as strong as the others right now, but he definitely got a Zenkai boost from being brought back to life. He could be of some use at least. Also, while he was dead, he was at King Kai's place because I imagine that Goku put in a good word for King Yemma. So he managed to get some training done. Whilst the others are summoning Purunga, Piccolo decides to fly over to Guru's place and talk with him and Nail. He's got a lot of questions to ask them about his heritage, but then suddenly he can sense that Nail is in trouble. Sure enough, Nail did fight with Frieza to actually buy the guys some time, so that means they can make the wish. Nail and Piccolo later fuse, with the only difference being that Piccolo is a lot less disorientated and a lot more willing to actually fuse with Nail. The subsequent power boost that Piccolo gained from this fusion is actually a bit more substantial because of the training that he did with Goku in the gravity chamber. Raditz cautiously approaches the scene and can see that Frieza's standing off against everyone else. He realizes that there's not that much he can do at this point, but he then can sense his brother inside the ship. Maybe he can do something there. Whilst Frieza is toying with everyone else, Raditz enters the ship and spots Goku inside the machine. He's frustrated by this because he's missed talking with Goku again. But after some soul searching and a couple of pep talks, he decides that he maybe should go and help the others. And boy, trust me, they're happy to see him. Vegeta spots Raditz in the corner of his eye and laughs at him. Why look, it's the plucky coward. What hole did you climb out of to get here, eh? Raditz simply ignores Vegeta. We then cut to the point where Frieza has reached his final form. Despite Piccolo gaining a big power boost in comparison to the original series when he was training with Goku, his new power is still not strong enough to take on final form Frieza. When Vegeta comes up with the plan to give himself a self-inflicted Zenkai boost, Raditz decides to actually join in with the fun. They ask Yamcha and Krillin to do the deed, and reluctantly, 
they do it. Dende heals Piccolo and Raditz readily, and he then grudgingly heals Vegeta, because you know what he did to his people and all that. Now with Zenkai boost, the Saiyans are now back and stronger than before. Together, they can actually prove to be a good fight for Frieza. When he's at 2% power. Frieza's jovial personality is elated at the fact that he gets two Saiyan monkeys to play with. Oh, what fun! This actually proves to be somewhat beneficial because Frieza is so distracted at fighting Raditz and Vegeta after actually having them as minions, this gives Goku enough time to fully recover and actually join the scene. Goku hails his brother and thanks him for helping keeping Frieza distracted until he got there. Raditz can sense that Goku's power is far greater than Vegeta's and eclipses his own. He deduces, using his more cautious demeanor, to just simply hang back and let Goku do his thing. Vegeta concedes that they need all the help they can get at this point, and he then tells Goku everything that Frieza did to the Saiyan race. Frieza tries to shut up Vegeta with a death beam, but Goku deflects it. Enraged by this, Goku takes on Frieza like he did in the anime. So there we go. Raditz may not have figured that much in this part of the story, but don't worry, I can assure you, there will be a third part. In this part, Raditz's impact on the series was monumental despite his physical impact being rather minimal. Thanks to Raditz, Piccolo was able to snuff out the Ginyu Force quite effectively, as well as keeping Ginyu Goku occupied so that means the others can do what they needed to do. It also meant that Yantra and Bulma could let their relationship blossom, and I believe that that will have long-lasting impacts on the series later on. As for Vegeta, he gets to live! Thanks to Raditz's presence in this saga, both Saiyans could actually exploit their Zenkai boost and be quite effective against Frieza if they decided to just team up. Now for those of you thinking that Frieza could have ended the fight by using 3 or 4% of his power, I don't believe he would have done that immediately. I think he would have found it rather quaint that these two in particular would decide to fight him. He had no idea that Goku was still around to clean things up. Remember, he can't sense energy. Oops, Frieza done goofed. Raditz turns around and smacks Vegeta and calls him a fool. He's kind of amazed by his own audacity in the heat of the moment, but he then regains his composure. He exclaims that Kakarot has transcended beyond the power of any Saiyan that has ever existed. Damn your pride, Vegeta! What I'm feeling right now is real pride! Pride for my brother! Vegeta then punches Raditz in the gut for daring to question him. Krillin then rolls his eyes and comments that they don't need another battle starting up right now, they got enough with Goku and Frieza duking it out. The fight between Goku and Frieza continues, with Frieza achieving 50% of his power and Goku starting to look a little desperate. Frieza is trouncing Goku quite convincingly and viciously. Vegeta is feeling quite vindicated. Ha! So much for the fight of a low-class warrior. Let's just see how Frieza takes up against the Saiyan elite. He then spots that Raditz still has his tail. He then turns to Raditz quickly as Raditz is watching the fight unfold. He then shouts to Raditz that he still has his tail. Raditz then snaps out of his trance and states to Vegeta that yes, indeed, he still does have his tail. Why doesn't he just change into the great ape and then try and help his brother? The power multiplier that it incurs should do something to Frieza. Raditz is shocked as he looks at his tail, which is quivering in a mixture of fear and tension. It's true, his power would be greater than it currently is if he were to transform right now. Since Piccolo has had some time to actually be around Raditz as they were training in the Saiyan Saga before Vegeta and Nappa showed up, he's begun to understand how the Great Eight power works. He knows about the Multiplier, Piccolo is shrewd about that. Piccolo then states, as he often did in early Dragon Ball Z, that even if Raditz were to transform, it wouldn't be strong enough to defeat Frieza. Raditz turns around sadly and he looks dejected. He knew about that all along, but he just didn't want someone else to say it. Vegeta scoffs at this and then just states, Oh Raditz, how useless you are. You always will be useless. Gohan walks over to Raditz and pats him on the back, stating, well, he tried his best. Raditz thanks him quietly. Back to the fight, Goku is getting pummeled as he unleashes his Kaioken times 20 which doesn't prove to be very effective at all against the likes of Frieza. He has no other choice than to power up a spirit bomb, a spirit bomb greater than the one that he used on Earth. He needs time to charge it though, and this is where Raditz comes into play. If Raditz were to just wade into the battle just like a normal fight and help Goku in his grade 8 form, that really wouldn't make much sense because he'd just get himself injured or killed. But now though, this is where he could be useful. Raditz is weighing up the options, and he then shouts to Vegeta to activate a Powerball option, which is what Saiyans often did if they invaded a planet that didn't have a moon, so that he could then become a great ape. As Frieza is distracted by Goku, Vegeta launches the ball, and Raditz begins to feel the effects 
of the transformation. He can feel it course through his veins, his body getting bigger, hairier, and more monkey-y. Sure enough, Raditz transforms into his great ape form and lets out a huge roar as Piccolo then uses that as a battle cry and he charges in to help Goku as well. He lands a kick on Frieza's head, sending him flying, and this gives Goku a little bit of time to charge the ball. And it also provides Raditz the opportunity to jump the Emperor. As Frieza flies out of the water, Raditz grabs onto him tightly. He tightens his grip as much as he can, but he can't quite hold him. It's enough for Frieza to get caught up with fighting Piccolo and Raditz, just bickering between them all, and Goku's just over there, charging the ball much more effectively than he did in the anime. Isn't Vegeta helping? No, he's just crossing his arms indignantly, as he often does on the show. You know, that pose. Krillin wants to chew Vegeta out for not helping, but he knows better. He doesn't quite have the chutzpah to actually tell Vegeta off. Piccolo and Raditz are, of course, no match for Frieza, but it's still an effective diversionary tactic. It was worth doing, and come on, it's Frieza fighting a really giant monkey. That would have looked awesome. The whole point of these what ifs is to make them entertaining as well as factually accurate. Goku successfully launches the spirit bomb, and it engulfs Frieza, sending him down into the ocean like it does in the anime. Vegeta, actually surprised this whole thing worked, negates the power ball. It disappears, and Raditz turns back to normal. Everyone gathers around Goku as they pull him out of the water. Raditz goes over to Vegeta with a huge smirk of satisfaction. Oh look, it's Vegeta! Tell me, what hole did you crawl out of? Vegeta just ignores this and turns away. As the gang are congratulating themselves, Frieza then reappears and aims a death beam directly at Goku. Raditz quickly turns around and jumps in front of his brother, taking the blast in the shoulder and collapses, barely alive. Don't worry, I'm not gonna kill him. He's just gonna just be out for the count for a little bit. After this first death beam, Frieza then launches another death beam within milliseconds of the first one at Piccolo, like in the anime. He too falls down unconscious. Frieza then does the same thing that he does to Krillin in the show, so yeah, we know how that turned out. The tyrant then spots Vegeta scowling and huffing in the distance and goes, Oh look, it's Vegeta! Good to see you! I almost forgot you were here, but <laughs> oh, don't worry, you won't be in a moment. As this is going on, Goku is absolutely livid. He is twitching and quivering with fury. This catches Frieza's attention, and Goku transforms into the legendary Super Saiyan, like in the original timeline. Vegeta, now having witnessed an actual Super Saiyan before his very eyes, is both stunned and furious. What? How? Kakarot the legendary Super Saiyan? It should have been me! I was the legendary Super Saiyan! Blah 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 blah! He is kind of impressed though. He just doesn't want anyone else to know that. Before he can process this anymore, Goku barks out to Vegeta and Gohan to take Piccolo and Raditz, find Bulma, get the ship, and get out of here. Gohan complies quite willingly, but Vegeta is reluctant. Goku, instead of saying anything, gives Vegeta the look that he gives Frieza in the original show, and you know how badass that look looks. Yeah, Vegeta kind of crumbles and complies along with Gohan. The fight between Goku and Frieza happens just like it does in the regular story. It all ends up thanks to the resurrection of Guru and everyone else killed by Frieza and his men, with everyone except Goku and Frieza being teleported off Namek and onto Earth. They can just leave the two powerhouses to duke it out as the planet blows up. Meanwhile, Raditz and Piccolo are healed by a now revived Dende. Raditz would then walk over to Vegeta and just stare at him with a mix of satisfaction and contempt. Vegeta, again, ignores this. He doesn't have to take any of this. For the rest of this arc, things tend to stay the same as they do in the regular series. Goku refuses to return to Earth, Vegeta then goes off into space to try and train and find Kakarot so he too can become a Super Saiyan, and the Namekians create a new planet Namek and cart themselves off to it further down the line. There is no Garlic Jr. Saga. Moving on. A year and a half has passed since the destruction of the original planet Nemec. The characters in Dragon Ball Z have begun to restore a sense of normality within the group. Since Goku's taking his time in the whole returning shtick, Vegeta then returns to Earth, having not found Goku, and then just takes solace at Capsule Corp. And thusly, his relationship with Bulma begins. What about Raditz, though? Well... In this whole scenario, I believe another character could be reintroduced. Launch. Launch, Masako? 
Yeah, well, why not? What else is she doing in the series past the Saiyan saga? I mean, nothing, so it can't hurt. Sure, she did have a little thing with Ten Shinhan, but Toriyama, in an interview that he did in 2013, ultimately stated that it didn't work out between them. He flat out said that Ten Shinhan wasn't interested in a romantic relationship, so where do you go from there, Launch? I say that instead of Ten Shinhan, she shacks up with Raditz. Well, I believe it has something to do with the fact that it all started back in the Saiyan Saga. As Raditz was training with Gohan and Piccolo, he would have spent some time around Kame House, where Launch lives currently. He might have been privy to Launch's outbursts and found them fascinating. He might have even been mesmerized and just endeared and fell in love with her right there and then. He would have been amazed by her strength and feistiness. After all, this is what drew Goku partly to Chi Chi and Vegeta to Bulma, strong women. Of course their femininity, but most importantly, their strength in character and their literal strength. I feel that once Raditz could have some time to settle down and, you know, not die, he and Launch would have connected. Good Launch would have been endeared to Raditz because he was slightly different to Goku, but a lot different to Vegeta. He was kind of like a happy medium. And when she was in her blonde form, Raditz would actually stand up to her, which is something that she wouldn't have expected and might have turned her on. And I think he would have been turned on quite similarly. So before Trunks arrives, I believe that that relationship will have hit its honeymoon period. They would have been very much in love. It'll become more potent later on, just you wait. So we get to the point where Mecha Frieza finds Earth and is about to blow it up. Earth is peaceful, and yet something big is about to go down. Ranch and Trunks haven't even opened the time machine hatch, and immediately they are swamped with negative energy. Which is, of course, from the likes of King Cold, Mecha Frieza, and a swarm of Frieza minions. Then there's the whole bunch of energies that they don't recognize all that well. Well, except for two. Gohan and <gasps> Papa! Trunks immediately turns to Ranch with a serious expression. Ranch, you cannot interfere. Only I can do this. In fact, I distinctly remember that Mom specifically said that you weren't meant to come. Well, why not? Because you would just barge in and make a mess. You're not exactly the most careful person going, you know. Oh, <laughs> come on. I'm not gonna make a mess. Trunks just looks at her as if to say, really? After more toing and froing, Trunks senses Freezer beginning to flex what's left of his muscles, and the time is right for him to do his thing. Now, in terms of the story, this is set slap bang in the middle of part three of What If Raditz Turned Good, for anybody who was curious on where it exists in the timeline. And as Trunks starts to do his cool routine with Freezer, Ranch just simply ignores Trunks' pleas to stay in the time machine and goes to take a closer look at the Z Fighters, but at the same time remembering to suppress her powers much like how Trunks was doing. Huh, show off. As it's clear that the gang are transfixed on the tussle between Trunks and Freezer, Ranch is inching closer and closer to the group to get a good look at them. Bulma and Gohan she recognizes quite easily, but wait, the, the, there's, there's Papa! Oh yeah, this is right where he and Vegeta weren't as big enemies as they are at certain points in the story. But hang on a moment, this thing isn't right. Where's Launch, her mum? Oh hello, what are you doing there, stranger? Ranch wheels around and is startled, falling backwards on her butt. There's her mum, she's right there. Ma, in your own business! Good Launch is here. And clearly, she was bored with the postulating that was going on, and had instead noticed a girl just weirdly sneaking around for some reason, trying to look stealthy. With Ranch being a good six feet tall and quite well built, she's not hard to miss, visually speaking. Hiding energy, sure, but hiding yourself out in the open in the middle of a wasteland? Not so much. Are you with that strapping young lad over there? He seems pretty strong. Are you strong, dear? Ranch gets up and dusts herself off and tries to roll with it, but then it hits her. This is the first time that she's been near her mother for over a decade. The urge to hug her and bawl her eyes out is intensifying right now, by the second in fact. But she did promise not to meddle in the past, and she had already sort of broken this by even engaging with Launch. If she held her own and made her way back to the ship carefully, she might just be able to get away with it without Trunks giving her a two hour lecture about the importance of not meddling with the past and time and whatnot. Hey, do I know you? Ranch is now beginning to look quite pale. No, no, I'm not from around here. You look familiar. Your hair's like my hair, only... She touches Ranch's locks. Only spikier. Like my boyfriend's. Oh, oh, you should meet him. 
the orc. Us launch in a sociable ways when she's in a blue form. Suddenly, Trunks can be heard screaming as he turns into a Super Saiyan, and this catches Launch off guard. Now, this should be the chance for Ronch to get back to the ship without her knowing, but the power-up spooked Launch into sneezing, and then, uh, hey, punk, who said you could leave? Oh, no. You're not one of them goons trying to sneak up on us, are you? You look like one of them. You know, with the armor get-up you got going on. Are you about to try summon? Because I'm about to try summon. Launch plays with a side weapon and points it at Ranch. And even though Ranch can't be hurt by this, it's still pretty scary. Scary enough for her to lose her cool and her energy to waver. This catches Raditz's attention, who then realizes that Launch has gone walkabout. Ah! Curse that woman! She always wanders off when I'm not looking! Oh, mm, she's too pure sometimes. Raditz descends on the pair and is bemused by what he sees. Two women who look very similar. What's going on here? Ranch thought it was bad when it was just her mum there. Now Papa's here too? Well, she can't run now. What if Raditz no Super Saiyan? Then there'd be no chance to escape, and the plan may fail. Uh, I'm with that guy. She points over to Trunks, who is busy turning Freezer into the contents of a meat pie. You mean, you mean the Super Saiyan is your friend? How? How is that even a thing? Kakarot is meant to be the only one. What gives? It's not fair. Raditz then grabs Ranch's armor. Teach me! I want to be a Super Saiyan too! If Kakarot can do it, then so can I! And since I'm his older brother, I should therefore be able to do it by default! Much easier! So teach me! Ranch manages to push herself off her father's grip. She tries to calm down the situation and explains that there is a reason that they've come here. She has no choice but to explain what happened and where they came from. Basically, what we're getting here is what Trunks tells Goku, but now with Ranch, telling her parents. Only that they don't know that this is their future daughter speaking to them. She is at least able to keep that bit of information a secret. Raditz is struggling to comprehend this information, much like how Goku struggled to do so in the original. But unlike him, Launch is getting the bigger picture. So what you're saying is that these two teenage robot dweebs go on a power trip across a planet in a few years time? That red ribbon army noticed the culprit what made them? Hmm, interesting. Thanks for the tip off, toots. She rubs her weapon with care. Ranch is looking a little worried. She hopes that her mom's not about to do what she thinks she's about to do. Well, of course! If this Dr. Giro guy can be stopped before he makes them, then, then there'll be no problem. But wait, how strong are these clowns? You can tell that Raditz is tempted to resort to his cowardly ways of offing the creator as soon as possible, so therefore eliminating the problem altogether. But then his Saiyan instinct for a good challenge kicks into high gear, much like how Vegeta and Goku reacted when Bulma proposed a similar idea in the original timeline. Ranch decides to then roll with this and overhype the situation. For the sake of the past! Oh, uh, super strong! That boy and I are the only survivors! Nobody else lived, it was a major catastrophe! We, we had to use up all of our remaining electrical power to get here to warn you all, so yeah, I wouldn't try anything. Eh, I still like my idea though. Launch is about to ready to take her bike and ride onto Jiro's place before Ranch grabs her hand. Please don't. Get your hands off me, you filthy Amazon. I said, Ranch goes Super Saiyan to demonstrate her seriousness. Don't. Raditz is amazed. A female Super Saiyan? Wow! Cool! He misses the emotional point here by a mile. If you go right now and take out the Doctor, it could destroy the timeline as we know it. Something even worse could happen. That boy over there may not exist. I may not exist. The entire course of human history could be ruined. Uh, it sounds like your future wasn't much of a picnic to begin with. He spots Ranch's stern look. It looks just like Launch's. So familiar. And he knows better. I've spent my whole life trying to stop this. I don't want to be erased. To have all that we fought to protect to be taken out of our hands. I know you mean well. But please, tell no one of this. Or else you may end what you and Pa... Him... Have just started. They only just started dating, you see. So they are still in the honeymoon phase. They wouldn't dream of breaking this whole thing off or ruining it or anything. Launch then just looks at Ranch, her yellow hair matching hers. One question. Me and the dingus over here. Oh, are we a thing? Right until the end. Ranch looks at Raditz, who is smarting from the remark, but she turns back and nods. That's all Launch needed to know. You got it, kid. Now get out of here. If anyone asks, you saw one of them Mirage things. Ranch powers down and heads back to the ship. Hey! Raditz calls out to Ranch. What? 
It'll be okay. Raditz winks. Raj looks stunned. Does he know who she is? Well, she can't check because Trunks is about to go and talk to the group. She then decides not to respond and flies away. Three hours later, when Trunks and Goku have finally finished talking to each other and the former heads back to the ship, he is then greeted by a snoring, fast asleep branch spread eagle across the floor of the time machine. Just completely, absolutely unconscious. Wake up! We're going home! Job's done! Branch looks really tired and turns over, continuing to sleep. Oh. Oh, good. I was asleep the whole time. So yeah, I'm gonna do that for a few more decades. Maybe not when we get home. The past is so boring. Trunks looks suspiciously at her, but decides to ignore it, and plots a course for home. As the ship rises up, Raditz spots it and silently thinks to himself, Yeah, I think I'll stay here. You've reached the point where we're about to go into the three year time skip before the artificial humans arrive on Earth. Now, if you remember from my last video in this series, I asked you guys two important questions concerning Raditz's future. You see, Raditz and Launch got together in my What If series. Yep, yeah, Launch is a thing now. And they had a kid between the end of the Trunks saga and the beginning of the Artificial Human Saga. I asked you guys what gender would the child be? Congratulations, it's a girl with 64% of the vote. Then I asked you guys in the comments to come up with a name for the child, regardless of the gender. And whoever had the most upvoted comment would then have that name selected. With 205 upvotes, Multisonic Dude's idea of naming the child Ranch is going to be the one that I'm choosing. And I will honor my promise from the last video, so Ranch it is. Also, some of you actually had the really good idea of Raditz and Launch maybe having twins, and that is what exactly I would have done had the vote been within 5%. So if either a boy or a girl had 55% of the vote, I probably would have just made it twins to make everyone happy. However, just because they have one kid now doesn't mean they're not gonna have more in the future, so watch this space. Also, big thank you to those who have actually been sending me fan art of Raditz and Launch's child on my Twitter account. It's just been amazing how engaged you've been with this series. It's fantastic. Keep on making them. I love to share them with my followers and actually just keep them for my collection. It's awesome. Although Raditz would have liked a more say any type of name, Launch got the choice in the end because at the time when they were selecting a name, she was in her blonde form and Raditz would know best not to argue with her in that form. That and Launch actually won the old Dragon Ball staple that is rock, paper, scissors. That's how you usually fix arguments in the show. Let's pick the story up when Goku and Gohan are about to head out to South City to wait for the artificial humans to strike there. Goku walks over to Raditz's place, which is actually located not far away from Goku's house, and Ranch is the one that answers the door. She's about two at this point. Even now she's walking around freely, you know, she's the daughter of a Saiyan, so she would be quite strong. It's kind of like what Pan is in Super right now. Now does she have a tail? Why yes indeed she does. Raditz was offered to have his tail removed, but he did decline that offer, stating that it was a hallmark of his Saiyan heritage and it was a throwback to his childhood days, so let's just not do that for now. Plus it would be kind of an insult to his race if he were to just remove it. And remember, it got him out of a sticky situation in the previous part. Raditz and Launch agreed that when Ranch reaches school age, she will be given the choice about whether she'd like to have her tail removed or not. And then it's her call. Whatever she wants to do, they'll do it. But for now, she's got one. Raditz joins Ranch at the door while Gohan's playing with Ranch a little bit, you know, keeping her distracted. Raditz and Goku discuss their battle plans concerning the robots and whether they can actually even win the fight. Goku is completely calm over the situation. Thanks to having Raditz as an additional sparring partner, his training over the three years with Piccolo and Gohan as well was much more effective than it was in the anime. In fact, it was so effective that Goku was able to achieve Super Saiyan Grade 2. And Raditz has also become a Super Saiyan, albeit at just Grade 1. Thanks, by the way, for Malik to come up with this commissioned artwork. It looks really cool, am I right? Now, Super Saiyan Grade 1 is still something that Raditz can be proud of. Not bad for a couple of low-class warriors, huh? They discuss whether Vegeta will show up or not because he's just been all over the place concerning his training, mostly on his own. And Raditz really doesn't care one way or the other. Their continued animosity towards one another has only intensified when Vegeta found out that Raditz became a Super Saiyan before him. This would have been pretty galling for Vegeta considering that he was Raditz's boss for many years, back when he was a weakling. To have him then surpass him, as well as Kakarot? Oh my god, Vegeta would have been so angry. You could actually say that Vegeta has a little rivalry between Goku and Raditz now. Launch, in her good form, waves the crew off as Ranch asks them where they're going. 
Good Launch tells Ranch that they're off to save the world and maybe she will too someday. In fact, Ranch wants to go right now, but she's way too young. Give it time, give it time. She could prove her worth later on. But for now, she's just got to live out as being an innocent kid some more. We arrive at South City and the Z Fighters are all present and correct for with the addition of Raditz. Bomber is there with baby trunks, implying that she and Vegeta still shacked up as per usual. I mean, hey, Vegeta's got nowhere else to go, so Bomber just puts him up in Capture Corp and... You know, one thing leads to another, you know, they're both quite sassy and aggressive and, you know. Once Yajirobe comes with his batch of sensu beans, he takes off and then his car explodes like it does in the anime, stating the arrival of the artificial humans. As usual, Yamcha succumbs to the sucking ability of Dr. Jiro and his life force is drained almost entirely. The gang can sense it and they confront Dr. Jiro in the middle of the city. Once the exposition has been drawn out and many lives have been destroyed by Dr. Jiro's photon wave, Goku manages to convince the Doctor to take the fight elsewhere, so that means more lives aren't lost. And the Doctor does this begrudgingly only because this is a chance to murder Son Goku. Back in the wasteland, Goku is struggling. For heart medicine? No, Goku still didn't take it, even with Raditz around. What, didn't Raditz remind him or anything? Well, no. Raditz is just like Goku. They're both Saiyans trying to get stronger. They're distracted on actually making sure that they can get stronger and they're training. As Goku goes Super Saiyan, Raditz, Gohan and Piccolo can sense that something is wrong. They mutter about what's going to happen next, whether Goku could even survive this, you know, before even a punch was actually laid. But for now, things are actually going okay because Super Saiyan Grade 1 Goku is managing himself fairly okay with 19. But Goku knows himself that he might not last the fight, so he's got to make sure this ends now. He then powers up to Super Saiyan Grade 2, and within a few punches and beam attacks, he manages to waste 19. 19 is dead. But as soon as Goku's finished the technique, and before the parts of 19 even touch the ground, Goku falls out of the transformation and is screaming in agony. The heart virus is taking its toll. Seems like going up to Super Saiyan Grade 2 only accelerated the virus. Raditz and Piccolo, as well as Gohan, are now trying to figure out what they're going to do. How are they going to get Goku home to take the heart medicine, they've suddenly remembered. And Yamcha offers to take Goku home, but Raditz steps in and offers to do it himself. He, being a Super Saiyan as well, could fly back much faster than Yamcha because... At this point, Goku's heart virus is a lot more accelerated than it was in the anime. If he doesn't get back soon, he could die. So Raditz does it, and Yamcha doesn't really want to be hanging around the area much longer because, you know, all through the chest. But he kind of knows the significance of getting Goku back fast, so, you know, he complies. Raditz unleashes his Super Saiyan transformation and looks over to Juro menacingly. I will be back, and I will finish what my brother had started. Dr. Juro is actually quite surprised that Raditz had gotten so strong. The last time that he read Raditz's power level, you know, that little insight nano bug that was actually tracking their power levels, Raditz was dead, and even then his power didn't increase over 10,000. How did he get so strong so fast? No time to dwell on this though, because as soon as Raditz leaves with Goku, Vegeta arrives in his Super Saiyan transformation, having powered up and accelerated to the scene much quicker, because he could sense that power levels were going, and he just wants to know what the hell is going on! Jiro is on the ropes, and he chooses to run away from the scene and head back to his lab so he can actually turn on number 17 and 18. He chooses not to test out Vegeta's new Super Saiyan power. The rest of the story carries on like it did in the anime. We then rejoin the action when Jiro has indeed activated 17 and 18. Goku has been taken back safely to his house and Raditz is on his way back. He can sense a congregation of powers located somewhere outside of North City and then deduces that this is probably the gang and so goes there. Dr. Jiro is lording it over the Z Fighters before ultimately succumbing to the wildish ways of his creations because, you know, they're being a bit rebellious. They don't like the idea of being controlled by an old man, so, you know, bye bye Jiro. And of course, Future Trunks has joined the scene because he's now come back and thinking, why these aren't the androids? Well, those are the androids. Ah, boom, and all that. Raditz lands near Krillin and actually wants to know what the hell is going on. Who are these androids? Trunks then says that 17 and 18 are the real menaces here. Dr. Jiro and 19, they were just temporal anomalies different to his world. Vegeta tells Raditz to go home. He's got it under control. Go home and tend to your mewling brat, Raditz. Raditz powers up to Super Saiyan and demands that Vegeta says that again. Trunks then launches his busted cannon which takes out the lab and ends the argument right there and then. 
In the ensuing chaos, 17 and 18, as well as 16's pod, leave the lab. Later on, 17 and 18 are waiting to jack a car before Raditz arrives with Vegeta alongside of him. Now this is the point when Raditz and Vegeta are actually fighting each of the androids respectively. If you're thinking that Raditz would actually fight with Vegeta, then you're sorely mistaken. He wouldn't help Vegeta open a cookie jar, let alone fight a killer robot. The difference between this scenario and the anime is that the other Z-Biters choose not to get in the way, with the exception of Krillin. Even though he's much weaker than the androids, he still gives it a go. He does his best, but 18 just finds his actions rather cute. Once Raditz have been healed up thanks to Sensu Beans, and 17 and 18 have chosen to just go away and jack another car on their way to murder Son Goku whenever they feel like it, Vegeta storms off in a huff like he does in the anime. Then Piccolo goes nuts and pretends to be evil, yeah right, and storms off to Kami's lookout to try and do the merging, which actually still takes place. But that does mean that the Dragon Balls are inert now, so no wishing on them for a while. We then rejoin the proceedings when the fight between Imperfect Cell and Piccolo has almost finished and all the exposition has been laid out before us. Raditz, Trunks and the others have no clue what just happened. They just got a little speck of Cell in their peripheral vision before he was just gone. You know, that's what Solar Flare does. Vegeta then arrives and is angry that Piccolo got so strong so quickly. He then, because Raditz is there, uses this opportunity to jibe at him some more. At least Raditz isn't the strongest one here now. Ha 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 ha! Raditz then loses his cool. He powers up to Super Saiyan and lays into Vegeta something heavy. He slams Vegeta into the ground and they begin fighting each other. They're actually quite evenly matched in terms of power. The decimated rubble of Ginger Town is then turned to dust in the ensuing battle. Piccolo can sense that these two will just end up killing each other if they don't stop, and he's the only one that could even get close to them and try and stop this madness. Piccolo waits for the right moment and gets behind Vegeta and chops him in the back, knocking the prince out. Raditz then stops by his own volition and drops to the ground. He apologizes for getting so angry right now, but Piccolo understands. He and Raditz have spent a lot of time training together, so Piccolo gets him. He understands what Raditz is going through and what he has to put up with Vegeta. I mean, anyone would get mad with the prince right now. He then offers Raditz a sensu beam. Back at Kame House, Goku is now fully recovered, having been transported there for his own safety. Shortly afterwards, everyone has descended upon Kame House, 17 and 18 and 16 included. But Goku isn't to be seen, even though they thought he would be here. He's busy off in the mountains trying to find Vegeta and Trunks. The fight between Seventeen and Piccolo goes off like it does in the anime, with Raditz not interfering out of respect for Piccolo's power. You know, even though Raditz is more cautious than Vegeta, he still has some say in honor when it comes to a battle. Before anyone realizes though, Seventeen is jumped by Cell and is absorbed by the biomechanical beast, and he transforms into semi-perfect Cell. Since Piccolo has been wasted by semi-perfect Cell, and then Raditz goes to rescue him, and then Ten Shinhan does his Kikoho blast thing that we all know and love, they spot Goku arriving in the nick of time. Raditz rushes over to Goku with Piccolo and Ten Shinhan in tow, and they all fly off together before Cell can even figure out what's happened. When they all arrive at the lookout, Goku gives Ten Shinhan and Piccolo a couple of sensu beans, and they fully recover. Raditz is offered one too, but he doesn't need one because he hasn't expended that much energy since his last one that Piccolo gave him. This is when Raditz finds out about the Room of Spirit and Time, and that Vegeta and Trunks have just about to complete their time in that chamber. Vegeta exits, looking directly at Raditz with complete and utter malice. Their rivalry has now transformed into something much more violent. It's going to be a miracle that they don't kill each other. Raditz can sense that Vegeta's power is now much greater than his right now. He has no clue what to do. Now here is where I'm going to stop and pose a question to you all in a poll. Who goes in the room of spirit and time with Goku? Is it Gohan or is it Raditz? If it's Gohan, then Raditz could then go and try and stop semi-perfect cell from transforming into perfect cell at the hands of Vegeta's cockiness. If it's Raditz, then this could mean that Gohan's out of the equation for this arc, so think carefully before you vote. So there we go. Despite Raditz becoming a Super Saiyan, he is not the strongest fighter there is. He's about the same level as Vegeta, or at least before Vegeta came out of the time chamber. Where we last left off, Raditz had just witnessed his arch-rival Vegeta exit the Room of Spirit and Time alongside Trunks and he witnessed Vegeta look back at him with a look that could kill multiple times. In this tale, Raditz and Vegeta have become really mortal enemies, and the only reason they haven't actually tried to kill each other is because there's an even bigger threat going down right now, and that is Cell. If the green bug weren't there, who's to say what these Saiyans might do? However, right now, I'm actually going to answer the question that I posed to you guys in a poll in the last edition of this tale. 
Who would be joining Goku in the Room of Spirit in Time? There were two options, Gohan or Raditz. I gave you the outcome of what these choices might be, so you can actually think about it some. But with a resounding 72% of the vote, you guys chose Gohan to join his father in the Room of Spirit in Time. Yep, we're maintaining the status quo in that regard and keeping Gohan relevant to the story. I mean, there's no denier, 72% is quite a telling number. All right then, let's go with that. We witness Goku and Gohan going into the chamber on their own. In the meantime, Raditz, Piccolo, and Ten Shinhan, who also, by the way, refused to wear the same armor that Bulma provided, obviously out of principle, do you think Raditz would be wearing the same armor as Vegeta, really? And they can sense the battle that is about to unfold between Vegeta, Trunks, and Semi-Perfect Cell, because quite clearly, Vegeta wants to go and get a piece of the bug. The fight plays out as it does in the anime, unfortunately. Vegeta is basically toying with Semi-Perfect Cell for what seems like an eternity. All that Trunks can do is just simply watch on and make sure that Cell doesn't try to do anything funny or like pull some underhanded tactic or something. Meanwhile, Raditz is fuming at Vegeta's cockiness and just, why is the hell he getting on with it? He wishes to go down there and knock some sense into Vegeta, but Piccolo stops him from doing so because he's just right about to go right now. Piccolo has to remind Raditz that he is nowhere near as strong as Vegeta at this point. Well, Raditz isn't in his current state. Well, what is that supposed to mean, Raditz thinks. He asks the Namekian what he's going on about. Piccolo then says to Raditz that they know quite well that Vegeta is going to be running rampant sooner or later, and that there's going to be an even bigger fight to come. They just know it. So, the best thing to do right now is to try and plan ahead and come up with a solution between the two of them. It's there and then that they decide to do what many of you suggested to do in the comments and I didn't think of in the last part. Seriously, I had no clue, it didn't occur to me. Thank you for pointing that out. You guys are geniuses. What is this plan? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Before these two can actually congratulate themselves on their idea, they then forget about the fight that's going on down on Earth. And Vegeta's pride is rearing its ugly head once more and it's currently being stroked lovingly by Cell. Cell has been given free reign by Vegeta to absorb number 18 whenever he can find her, and it's just a case of Vegeta just stroking his ego because he got dolled up in Super Saiyan Grade 2 for nothing, so it seemed, so he'd better make it worth his while. And also, blah, blah, better challenge, blah. Not even Trunks' protests are enough to stop this from happening. Sure enough, semi-perfect Cell gets his wish, and he ultimately fuses with number 18. I mean, she's not really party to all of this. Everyone up in the lookout is cowering in fear. Raditz is cursing to the even higher heavens, because technically they're on the heavens right now, about why Vegeta is so stupid and foolish and any other kind of negative derogatory term, and how the prince has doomed everyone on this planet. Damn his pride! Meanwhile, Goku and Gohan are oblivious to this as they're busy training inside the chamber. Gohan is busy becoming a Super Saiyan, which actually happens a lot easier than it does in the anime because of all the training that Goku did prior to the androids arriving, it meant they had a better grasp of Super Saiyan. You can thank Raditz for that because some more Saiyan training and exposure out there is definitely beneficial when you're doing this kind of training. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's still a very big challenge for the young man, it just takes a little less time. He's not gonna get the power that easy. Since Goku already knows about Super Saiyan Grade 2 prior to going inside the chamber, he then touches upon Super Saiyan Grade 3 much faster, as well as all of the drawbacks that come with it. Having realized all of this sooner, they actually eschew this transformation and go straight to Super Saiyan full power much sooner than they do in the actual story which in turn means they have further time to refine the transformation and make it even stronger. The perfect cell fight plays out as per normal with Vegeta getting clobbered eight ways from Sunday and Trunks' Super Saiyan Grade 3 transformation doing absolutely butt kiss and just showing again, oh dear, yeah, you're getting power but you're sacrificing speed. Around this time, Goku and Gohan exit the chamber to see everybody looking desperate. I mean, they have a right to be. Perfect cell is on the loose. Curious about this. Goku goes down to Earth and finds Perfect Cell and decides to weigh up the strength between him, and this is actually quite significant. When Goku returns, Piccolo and Raditz walk up to him in tandem and state their plan. Their intention is to train together in the Room of Spirit in Time now that Goku and Gohan have exited it. So that means they can actually try to figure against Cell in the next battle that is guaranteed to be arising, which we now know as the Cell Games. Having trained with one another quite regularly over the last few years, things get moving pretty quickly. Raditz appreciates Piccolo's level-headedness, and in time, he begins to actually understand what makes Piccolo tick. 
he actually becomes far less jittery and paranoid and scared, and he's just a lot braver now than he was five years ago when we first met him. As well as training, Raditz and Piccolo are quite keen to do some hardcore meditating, and this is something that the Saiyan is quite keen to master since his rationale wasn't the best when they went in, and he wants to kind of keep that under control, especially around the likes of Vegeta. The benefit to all of this is that means Piccolo gets a full year inside the Room of Spirit and Time, unlike the anime when he cut it short. With Raditz there, he has something to focus on when times get rough, and vice versa. When they emerge, Piccolo has been able to fully grasp the power of Kamikolo, so when he merged with Kami, and Raditz has risen to the power of full power Super Saiyan. Oh, let me guess, Masako, does Raditz reach Super Saiyan 2? Well, no, don't. No, not just yet. No. Raditz can sense that there is more power just waiting to be tapped into, but he can't quite get there yet. It's just something missing. He remembers about something that Goku said, like, almost a year ago, I mean, in his mind, about some kind of thing that emerged while they were in the chamber, and something that Goku believes that they could use against Cell. After Raditz gets home and spends some good quality time with Ranch and Launch, he goes over to Goku's place and tries to actually get some ideas out of the Saiyan. Goku explains to Raditz that he saw something inside of Gohan which was incredible, a power that could easily win against Cell if used properly. Something that Goku couldn't quite do, but Gohan? Yeah, he got it down, he just doesn't quite know it yet. Raditz is completely stunned. He knows that he can go back into the chamber one more time, so that means he can actually try to find out this power on his own. He then asks Goku whether he should actually go ahead and do it. Goku's not too sure about that because you don't want to spend too much time inside that chamber on your own. Goku did that as a child and he almost went insane after a couple of months. He tells Raditz this and warns him that it's not something that you should take lightly if you're going to go in there solo especially. Having spent a year inside the chamber with Piccolo trying to calm his mind down, Raditz can then sense, especially after all that meditating, that if he were to go in there on his own, his mental health would just deteriorate and all the hard work that he'd done over the past year would have been for nothing. In the end, Raditz chooses not to go inside the chamber. Fast forward to the Cell games. Given how that Raditz has chosen not to go into the Room of Spirit and Time again, this kind of means he's on the sidelines for the most part, and therefore, the initial part of the Cell games carries on as per normal, with Goku and Cell fighting, Gohan then taking the reins, and then you know the rest. And that includes a scene where Goku gives Cell a Sensu Bean and is completely chewed out by his colleagues. The only real difference this would actually have is that Goku would be getting Piccolo's rant in stereo because Raditz would pretty much be aping what Piccolo is saying. Gohan, with 16's help and sacrifice, achieves the power of Super Saiyan 2, and this is where the power and the secret actually start to click for Raditz. He now gets it. So Raditz is thinking, well, yeah, that's the power that Goku was talking about. Yeah, okay, I might be able to do it given enough of time. And when I'm not trying to fight off multiple Cell Juniors, because yeah, that's currently a thing. But, oh yeah, actually, I almost forgot about the Cell Juniors. How would Piccolo and Raditz fare? Well, I think they would be faring a lot better than Piccolo did in the anime. They would be able to hold their own quite easily and maybe actually get a slight upper hand. The rest of the story continues. Goku notices that Gohan is starting to go rogue because of Super Saiyan 2 power, you start to lose your rationale and control, something that Goku really shouldn't have thought about, and chooses to sacrifice himself, so that means semi-perfect cell or perfect cell or whatever kind of cell is ridded of for good. It's a harrowing feeling, because this just apes everything that happened in the Saiyan saga, only the roles have been reversed. And Raditz didn't really get to say goodbye to his brother, I mean not properly. The only other major difference is that Raditz joins Vegeta, reluctantly, to actually act as a distraction for Perfect Cell, while the Kamehameha beam struggle is going on. Vegeta mocks Raditz as he's doing this, but thanks to all the mental training that he'd been doing with Piccolo, Raditz is able to brush this off and just carry on with the task at hand. The attack? Why, of course, it would be a double Sunday. Later on, Raditz breaks the news to Chi Chi and launches there too to help console the widow of Goku. Ranch witnesses all of this going on, but Gohan is quick to notice this and distract her by saying that you might be having a new nephew very soon, so get excited for that! This is Goten we're talking about, by the way. Now that it seems that his brother is unlikely to return, especially for the fact that Goku actually refuses to return, it's up to Raditz to honor the family name of whatever Bardock's surname was and actually get stronger for his brother. In the anime, Vegeta lost his mojo after Goku disappeared because he didn't really have anyone to compete against, so he kind of lost his way. But now that in the story, 
Raditz is just as big a rival to Vegeta as Goku is, and he then puts his attention squarely onto Raditz in terms of a benchmark and a yardstick, so that means Vegeta carries on getting stronger. Right, it's now time for the time skip. We move forward seven years and we get to see Ranch now at nine years old. And here is a picture of her. Thank you, Malik, for the awesome art. I took everybody's fan art that you sent to me over at MasterQuex on Twitter, and by the way, they're all great, thank you so much, and incorporated all of the aspects from the different designs into this actual final version. In the seven years that have actually followed since the Cell games, Ranch has actually become quite the fighter, whilst also wanting to retain a little bit of feminine charm. She is someone who knows what she wants, and that is to kick some ass, much like her father, and also to look good whilst doing it, and she gets that from her mother. Can she go Super Saiyan? Well, yes, she can. Given how much that Raditz has been actually training over the seven years, and how much he'd actually want to include his daughter in all of this, you know, good bonding and all that, I think she would end up training with her father and actually reap the benefits of the Super Saiyan transformation, much like how Trunks and Goten did. In the meantime, Raditz and Launch have had more children. Twin boys, in fact. What are their names? Well, they're named after different types of Radish. Daikon and Muli. By the time we get to the Boo Saga, they're about three years old, and they're actually quite precocious and fun-loving children, and they love to see their big sister and their father fight as they're training, and sometimes they actually wish to get involved, but obviously they can't do much, they're only toddlers. In the seven years before the Boo arc, Vegeta and Raditz do meet up on occasion, but when they actually do, and especially when in public, the dialogue is very stunted and minimal. In fact, at one point, Vegeta wanted to test out his might against Raditz so badly that he actually caught Raditz unawares and just completely pounced on him. Raditz was able to hold his own, but he was left quite badly injured. Vegeta was absolutely adamant that he had to assert himself over his once underling. But don't worry, Raditz gets his own back eventually. Does Ranch train with Goten and Trunks as well? Uh, it's more Trunks than Goten. She did used to train with Goten quite a bit, but when Chi Chi put a stop to that when Goten accidentally went Super Saiyan, Ranch had to look elsewhere. They actually get on pretty well, despite the fact that Ranch is fully aware that Trunks is quite a spoiled brat, as we also know that he is. Nevertheless, the three young Saiyan hybrids get along famously, and there is actually a little contest between them about who can be the strongest. For those of you thinking that this is all completely irrelevant, trust me, it's not. It's time to get voting again. This time, I'm asking another biggie. Who does Trunks fuse with in the Fusion Saga? Ranch or Goten? If you pick Ranch, then that means that Goten doesn't really figure much in the next arc and he's kind of pushed off into the background. He does have his moments every now and again, but in terms of the Fusion Gotenks, yeah, that won't happen. If you pick Goten, then Ranch will still figure in the story, but the chances of her gaining any more character development than she would have done normally would be slightly limited. So think carefully before you vote, and if you do choose to vote, thank you very much. We shall leave things as they are with the great Saiyan man on the loose and the likes of Raditz and Vegeta getting ready for the 25th Tenkaichi Budokai, and even more so when they find out via telepathy that Goku wishes to come down to Earth and check it all out, as well as actually getting a chance to fight against Raditz and Vegeta. The gang were excited to be fighting each other in the 25th Tenkaichi Budokai, and Goku was about to come down to Earth to test his mettle against his brother and of course the principal Saiyan's Vegeta. Raditz is particularly interested to see how he compares to his powerful brother, and Vegeta's just keen to trounce both of them because he wants to show the power of the Saiyan elite, blah blah blah, yeah, you get the idea. What will be interesting is how much the Margin Vegeta arc will differ now that Raditz is an actual valid addition. How will the motives of Margin Vegeta be changed? Well, we're gonna find out now as we delve deep into part six of What If Raditz Turned Good? With Gohan being Gohan, the completely passive but very sweet boy, he has agreed to take part in the 25th Tenkaichi Budokai along with most of his family at the behest of Videl after being kind of blackmailed. Oh, that relationship, it starts off so well and sweet. Everyone agrees not to turn Super Saiyan so as not to actually trigger any bad flashbacks of the Cell games throughout any member of the audience. Ranch, being the cynical one here, thinks that Trunks will renege on this deal and will go Super Saiyan out of frustration if he's not winning, having a little tantrum there. Goten being Goten just champions that Trunks is the best, no one can beat him, he's awesome, I'm being a really nice little lackey. Goku arrives with Barber and we get the typical awkward first meeting of him and Goten, although it actually turns out pretty sweet in the end. Ranch is a little wary too of meeting Goku again, but she's not as wary as Goten because she does kind of remember her uncle from when she was a baby, but other than that, it's still been a very long time, especially when you're a kid. 
Raditz, though, he's completely jubilant to see his brother again. He gets him in a headlock saying, Oh, brother, good to see you again. I hope that you've been training in the other world because I want to test your metal at Saiyans and prove that we are really strong, brother. As you would expect, Goku and Raditz have just a big old hug. Ranch is a little nervous about joining this hug, but her mother launch persuades her to join it. And together, they now do a big family group hug. Aw, hugs are nice. Goku asks the kids if they're actually taking part in the tournament, and especially in the junior division now that's been actually devised for the under 15s. Ranch and Goten say yes, but Trunks, who wasn't aware of this change in the rules, is absolutely horrified that he doesn't get to fight any adults, he has to fight some punk kids. Of course, Trunks says a little tantrum, but Goten reminds him quite rightly that that means that they will definitely get to fight each other for sure. Ranch was aware of this rule, of course, and proceeds to tease Trunks incessantly for it, and just saying, what, you didn't actually read the rules, did you? Ugh, typical Trunks, always going gung-ho into something. Ugh, it's so readable. But don't worry, she doesn't hate him. It's like one of those playground crushes. She does have a little crush on him. Like, you know in the playground where a guy and a girl, they just kind of like, uh, uh, kind of like you, I do. It's, it's kind of like that. Remember, they're only like eight or nine. The gang meet up with Krillin, 18, and their new daughter, Marin, as they prepare to watch the Junior Division tournament. In the original story, Goten and Trunks make it to the final where they duke it out and cheat a lot. But in this scenario, I think that Trunks doesn't make it to the final. What? Master Code Trunks doesn't make it to the final? What are you blithering about? Well, do you remember that he got all flustered that he didn't get to fight adults? It shows that he's quick to anger and quick to temper if things don't go his way. Something that Ranch, that who knows him very well after training with him for so long, knows exactly how to exploit. She also anticipates that he will break out Super Saiyan at some point, especially when he finds out that he's being beaten up by a little girl. And sure enough, that does indeed happen. She can read Trunks like a book. As Ranch actually beats Trunks, Vegeta just looks on in disgust, going, Huh, a disgrace to the Saiyan race. I knew I shouldn't have trained that boy. He's completely useless. We then see Ranch and Goten duking it out in the final, but in all surprises, Goten is the one to win. What? Well, if you think about it, Gohan and Goten have been training incessantly for the past few weeks. Goten's really come on strong now that his brother's taken his training seriously. And also, do you remember from the last part that Ranch did used to train with Goten, but after Chi Chi put a stop to that, she then moved on to Trunks, so it's actually kind of forgotten how Goten works in terms of a fighter. And also, he's come on a lot since they last fought. With Goten winning the prize in the tournament and Trunks off somewhere licking his wounds, the whole Mighty Mask episode doesn't occur. Meanwhile, the Supreme Kai and Kibito arrive at the tournament like they do in the anime and proceed to enter the tournament. But as that's all going on, the whole Videl Spopovich fight, much to my dismay, continues and everyone is completely distracted at the absolute carnage. With his disguise as the Great Saiyan man all but gone, Gohan decides just to reveal his Super Saiyan 2 form to Kibito to prove his strength. And pretty much like a chump, he is then assailed by Spopovich and his energy is completely drained, ready for Majin Buu's revival. Shin then confirms that he indeed is the Supreme Kai and tells everyone that it's up to them to try and stop Babadi, the magical diminutive little wizard, and his assistant Dabura, the demon god, from actually bringing back Majin Buu to life. After all this exposition and lots and lots of flying, they arrive at Babadi's spaceship where they see Spopovich and Yamu being turned to jelly as they go... <laughs> Seriously, didn't that scare you as a kid? As Babadi takes the energy vessel down into the ship, Dabura then spots Piccolo and Krillin and turns them to stone like they do in the anime. Goku, Gohan, Raditz and Vegeta then enter the ship and descend down into its depths and then fight the same cronies like we see in the show. The entire team then descend to the third level. Who is going to take on Deborah, I wonder? As that's going on, there is now a battle royale going on to decide the victor of the 25th Tenkai Chibudokai. Mighty Mask still takes part in this, but it's actually the original instead of Trunks and Goten are hiding in the costume. And of course, since there's Android 18 in there and Mr. Satan, it's pretty much down to them again. And as you know, Mr. Satan wins because 18 likes money. But let's get back to the main event. Who is actually going to fight Deborah? Even though Gohan is actually saying that he's going to take him on, Raditz then steps up and says that he wants to take him on instead. As you might expect, he just wants to one-up Vegeta after witnessing him take out Pui Pui so easily. 
He just wants to show that, ha, I can take on a demon god and win against you, Vegeta. Then I'll show you who's stronger. In this situation, Gohan is more than happy to sit this one out because he is all too aware of the bitter feud that is going on between Raditz and Vegeta, and he chooses not to get in the way. A smart move, and also good for the fans. Raditz, who is a lot more trained up than Gohan at this point, immediately powers up to Super Saiyan 2 to try and scare off Deborah. The actual article that you see here. Thanks, Malik. Raditz and Deborah fight for a very long while. They are pretty much equal in power, but ultimately, Raditz is able to best Deborah and is ultimately defeated at the hands of the Saiyan. How does he actually finish off Deborah? Well, of course, it's gotta be one of his classic moves. It's a Dynamite Monday and Shining Friday combo. After the fight, Barbadi is left absolutely horrified that his entire plan is about to be unraveled in front of him. But suddenly, he witnesses an opportunity. Something staring him in the face, and something that is going to be clearly his golden ticket in this scenario. Vegeta and Raditz are straight up arguing. And this isn't like a typical little bickering match, this is a full on shouting match. Vegeta is really sore that he didn't get a chance to take on Deborah and show his power to Raditz, but then Raditz says that he never actually stepped up. I was the only one to step up and show my brother how powerful I am. You said nothing, and you were really tired after fighting that little twerp. Goku and Gohan are caught in the middle of this shouting match, and it's quite clear that things are going nowhere fast. Barbadi seizes the moment and catches Vegeta's mind off guard. He eventually takes over Vegeta's body. His mind is consumed, his power is increased, his mood changes entirely, and we then get the classic character that is Margin Vegeta. And of course, the whole world tournament disaster happens like it does in the anime. Goku tells Vegeta to stop, but Vegeta is focused squarely on Raditz. He wants to finally put an end to this rivalry for good, and this new power-up might just be the thing to do that and silence his former minion once and for all. Raditz, who is actually quite excited by this prospect, agrees to the challenge. Barbadi then transports Raditz and Vegeta to a wasteland location very far away. It's up to Goku to try and break these two up, but he can't find their energies, he can't lock onto them. Barbadi then enters Goku's mind via telepathy and says that his instant transmission power won't work. He has managed to actually mask the arena that Raditz and Vegeta are fighting in to the point where there can't be any magical intervention. Goku has to try and find them the hard way, the original way, trying to find them in a hot cold situation. Vegeta then lets rip how he's waited long enough to try and defeat Raditz. For years Raditz was his lackey, a weakling, a little mere minion in his actual peripheral vision. Now, this guy has actually risen up to try and beat him? This is the absolute ultimate insult to his character. It has to be actually gotten rid of. This has gotten to Vegeta's pride more than Goku's presence ever did. Raditz is fully aware that Boo might be released if they keep on fighting, but this whole tussle has been going on for far too long and it has to actually be stopped right here and now. And of course, the Saiyans, they do love a good fight. However, Margin Vegeta's power is just simply too great and his hatred towards Raditz is just fueling the fire even more. Raditz is on the verge of collapse, but before Margin Vegeta can unleash the final blow, Goku arrives just in time to try and save the day and stop this madness. Vegeta then decides to fight both of them, and even after Boo's seal has been broken and the Margin has been unleashed upon the world, the fight continues for a little bit. Boo is causing all sorts of infantile havoc, and even this begins to stop the trio of Saiyans in their tracks and actually concentrate on the bigger picture. Vegeta then insists that he's learnt the error of his ways and decides to give up there and then. Or so you think. Relieved to hear this, Goku walks up to Vegeta and actually congratulates Vegeta for actually understanding the scenario here. But in typical fashion, Goku let his guard down and is promptly knocked out by the prince. Raditz protests this, but Vegeta is absolutely resolute at this point. He has won their little game. Raditz doesn't matter to him anymore. He is simply trash. Vegeta has proven his point, and he can now finally move on. Vegeta then heads off to try and face Majin Buu alone, taking a sensu beam with him. The brother of Goku is left shocked, disappointed, and saddened, but he then remembers that he has to try and wake up his brother and try and stop this evil mess from getting any worse. After besting the Supreme Kai and Gohan, Majin Buu makes his presence felt to anyone who can sense energy. He is having the time of his life with all of these people playing with him. Meanwhile, since Deborah died quite a while back, Krillin and Piccolo are slowly revived from their stone tomb and actually try and figure out what is best to do right now. They spot Majin Buu and decide to keep their distance. 
Ultimately, Margin Vegeta then has to resort to sacrificing himself to try and atone for his sins and wipe out Margin Buu from the face of the earth. Albeit, the weight of his sins isn't as great as it is in the anime. He's not as remorseful here. But the one thing that's keeping him going through all of this is the personal satisfaction that he has actually finally defeated Raditz in a battle. He lets off an explosion which seemingly vaporizes Margin Buu, but as you know, it does nothing. In the aftermath, Boo reverts to his original form and is completely uninjured. Vegeta just died in vain. Once Goku wakes up from being knocked out, Raditz then informs him of the situation and that he can't sense Vegeta or Gohan's energy anymore. He decides to not tell Goku that he actually was defeated by Vegeta. That's a little step too far in his book. Out in the wasteland, Goku and Raditz get their bearings together, and thanks to the powers of instant transmission, they are then teleported up to the lookout to try and figure out what is going on. That and to make sure that Raditz gets patched up. Thank you, Dende. In this timeline, since Goku is not damaged, he is able to do what he's supposed to do a lot faster. He can sense that Shenron's been summoned, and he goes down to Earth to stop Bulma from actually asking for any more wishes. And no, this is not Goku being cruel or anything. This is to ensure that after all the cataclysmic damage that has been ensued from Majin Buu, they can actually get things sewn up a lot quicker, so four months instead of a year. Afterwards, most of the crew end up on the lookout. Ranch and the two boys Daikon and Muli actually see their father, now okay thanks to Dende, and they all get in for a big family hug. However, the outlook isn't so hot for the likes of Bulma, Chi Chi or Videl. Their loved ones weren't so lucky, except Gohan of course, we know that he's still alive but they don't. He's been healed by the Supreme Kai and he's off on his own little journey in order to actually break the Z-Sword, as we know. Now. We are about to talk fusion. Goten, Trunks and Ranch have actually been relatively absent lately because there's not been much for them to do, but that's about to change. After Goten and Trunks lament their brothers and father's deaths respectively, Ranch is all the more determined to actually avenge them. And it's actually quite understandable. Gohan was actually really caring to her. Gohan was a really good kind of attentive uncle when she was just a baby and a toddler. And Vegeta is Trunks' dad, so yeah. She's kind of got to be sad about that because after all, she and Trunks have a little bit of a crush for each other. That is what we call empathy. One little byproduct from all this is that Goku hasn't resorted to Super Saiyan 3 yet, and since he hasn't done that, he actually has a little bit more time to do what he needs to do on Earth. He is able to much more calmly teach the kids how to use fusion. Piccolo's there too to help out, but he doesn't have to actually be as responsible as he was in the anime. Remember that comment I talked about in part 5 from B Charizard 1 about the future and what happens with fusion? This is where it now finally comes into action. Goten and Trunks are really keen to learn what this fusion dance is, something that Goku learned from the Metamorans whilst he was in the afterlife. Ranch wants to learn too, but she is stopped in her tracks by Goku. He feels like it would be too hard for Runch to try and fuse together, and maybe because of the fact that she's a girl, it might not work properly. There are a lot of unknowns here, Goku doesn't really know, but he just wants to be safe rather than sorry. As you could imagine, Ranch is pretty hurt by all of this, not just for the actual action of not being told it because she's a girl, but because it comes from Goku. All of this time, Goku had been keen for her to actually get training and train with her father, and together they would all actually work out and practice and spar, and it was really good times, and then suddenly you get this slap in the face. It's not just her. Raditz is furious too. He goes up to Goku and demands that she gets to learn the fusion dance right there and then. In fact, Raditz is about to punch Goku in the face for it, but Ranch actually holds him back. She just says, it's okay, dad. I don't really care anyway. Just let them get on with it. Raditz, albeit a little confused, ultimately complies because hey, if Ranch said it, then it's probably okay. But don't worry, don't worry. Ranch has got a plan. As Goten and Trunks go about learning the fusion dance, Ranch watches from afar, hiding her power level so that means she's not sensed or seen. She observes the lesson unfolding and she begins to understand the principles of the fusion dance, practicing it on her own. She is a lot more studious than Goten and Trunks. After pretty much getting the idea of the fusion dance, she walks off to another area of the lookout to practice more on her own. Before the boys can continue, however, Goku can sense that Boo and Babidi are up to no good. Not only that, but Trunks has to get the dragon radar in case Boo and Babidi are going straight for it and try to destroy it. So yeah, as you know, Goku has to distract them by going even further beyond. And as that's going on, Raditz is checking on Ranch to see whether she's okay. 
She is, and this is when she reveals her plan to her father. Oh, good ranch, that's why I'm so proud to call you my daughter. You showed my brother who's boss. She will make a fine teacher for the boys when they get older. Once Goku's done with distracting Boo and he's actually dispatched Babidi for just being such a grumpy Gus, the Saiyan returns to the lookout and everything tries to continue on. Because he hasn't used Super Saiyan 3 so much, he's able to teach the boys a little more about the fusion dance before he has to go back to the afterlife with Fortune Teller Baba. Just that little bit of reassurance means things go a little bit more smoothly. No thin Gotenks here. Before leaving, he tells Goten how proud he is of him. He then asks where Ranch is so he can say goodbye to her, but then Raditz playing along with Ranch's plan sternly says that Ranch has gone home because she's so sad and full of shame. Goku feels a little bad about this, but he has no time to dwell. He and his brother share a somewhat hollow hug before he returns to the afterlife. A little while later, the whole Mr. Satan Boo slash B ordeal goes down and we then have to deal with the likes of Super Boo as he makes his way to the lookout. And of course, he then unleashes the horrible Earth extinction attack. With Goten, Trunks and Piccolo now in the room of spirit and time, it's up to Raditz to lead the charge against Super Buu. He then goes Super Saiyan 2 and proceeds to lay the smack down on Super Buu for a good long while. However, Buu's regenerative abilities slowly get the upper hand against Raditz. He begins to tuck her out and before too long, Super Buu has a lot more strength and stamina than Raditz does, despite the Zenkai boost he got after his tussle with Margin Vegeta. It's just not enough. Super Buu smacks him to the side and he is knocked unconscious. But Super Buu is fixated on the rest of the gang and he's about to turn them all into candy. Once that's done, the three remaining people out on the lookout are Raditz, Launch and Ranch. As well as Daikon and Muli. Thankfully, he, they were tucked away somewhere. In a last ditch effort to try and scare Super Buu away, Launch then actually fires her gun straight at Buu. And yeah, of course it does nothing, but it goes to show that even blue haired launch can actually stand up to any kind of fearful situation. This is supposed to be the opportunity for Raditz and Ranch to escape. The power of Launch's love is right there for us all to see. She tells Ranch and the boys that she is proud of them and for them to get out of there while they can. Reluctantly, Ranch goes Super Saiyan and grabs her father and the boys and hightails it out of there, with Launch holding the fort somewhat. But ultimately, she too is turned into Gan but ultimately she too is turned into candy. We then fast forward to the first battle between Super Saiyan 3 Gotenks and Super Buu. After dropping off her father and the boys, Ranch returned to the lookout to try and see what was going on. Raditz is still unconscious at this point. This fight has been all over the place, even breaking the dimensional barrier between the real world and the room of spirit and time. That's a big deal. Gotenks, as usual, has been doing his really trippy, wacky attacks to try and distract Super Buu and destroy him, but ultimately, because of the strong power of Super Saiyan 3, his fusion time begins to dwindle and a lot faster than normal. The fusion breaks and the two boys are left defenseless. Boo then surprises them both and says that he will wait for the two to be able to fuse again so that means he can have a decent battle and also get a more effective and delicious absorption later on. Whilst Boo is actually being noble, Ranch then appears out of nowhere and blasts Boo in the back, probably thinking Boo was about to absorb them both right there and then, but getting it kind of wrong. Boo is absolutely furious and he just turns around to Ranch and is about to absorb her and turn her into candy as well. Suddenly, before Ranch is turned into chocolate, Trunks leaps in and catches the blast and he is actually turned into candy instead of Ranch. He sacrificed himself for her. <gasps> Oh my god, how noble! The spoiled brat actually doing something selfless! Ranch then yells at Goten that the only way that they can beat Super Buu now is for those two to fuse as well. He's quite surprised that Ranch actually knows how to do it, but this is not the time to be asking questions. Ranch then tries to convince Boo Trunks that if he just waits a little bit longer so that means they can fuse again, she will give him all the candy he could ever want. Now polluted by Trunks' pride and selfishness and snobbiness, Boo Trunks actually takes the bait. We then see Goten and Ranch fusing, so yeah, we're gonna get it, and we then get the fusion that is Ranten! And yeah, okay, for those of you who actually want to see what a Trunks and Ranch fusion would look like, here's Ronx. Ranten's fusion is a very potent one because that blood connection is so important. It makes the efficacy of the fusion even greater. And also, thanks to Ranch's level-headedness and determination, Ranten is a lot more rational than Gotenks. This ensures that things are a lot more conventional in their scope. We also don't see Super Saiyan 3 Ranten because she realized as Super Saiyan 3 Goku was fighting Buu, it drained energy really quickly and it would actually be kind of useless so it's not really worth your time. So instead, the fusion is able to master Super Saiyan 2. Why is Ranten able to do this? 
Well, it's all to do with the fact that Raj would have been aware of Super Saiyan 2 because of Raditz and have actually trained against it. So it was just waiting, the potential was there. But thanks to this really effective fusion, she can now do it. The fight continues down on Earth and the battle is long and arduous. Since Super Saiyan 2 consumes a lot less stamina than Super Saiyan 3, the fusion lasts 15 minutes instead of 5. It of course reduces the time because it's Super Saiyan 2 still, but not as much. The fusion breaks. Branch and Goten are left at the mercy of Super Buu and sadly, they're absorbed. We then fast forward to the point when Goku's been revived by the Elder Kai and is sent back to Earth to try and deal with Super Buu. Meanwhile, Gohan has learnt the ultimate form, Piccolo 2 has been absorbed by Buu and things are beginning to look a bit bleak. Patara fusion is the only hope left. By this time, Raditz is awake again, has actually grabbed a few sensu beans from his home and has actually returned to the battle scene in order to meet Goku again and hopefully try and patch things up after their really awkward departure earlier. As Super Buu is dealing with Gohan and Goku, Raditz then slams into Super Buu in Super Saiyan 2 to try and distract him. This is the perfect opportunity for Goku and Gohan to fuse via Patara and we get Gokan. Uh, except we don't. Like in the anime, Gohan is absorbed by Super Buu and we then get Buhan. And since Raditz is here, another important omission arises. Vegeta is not sent back down to Earth to try and fight Buu. King Yama's not exactly endeared to Vegeta, and since Raditz is there and he's just as strong as Vegeta, he does not grant Vegeta a one day pass back down to Earth. At least not yet. Let's see how Raditz does first. Since Raditz is Earth's only hope, Goku tells them about Patara fusion and that it's the only way that they can actually defeat Buu now. The resulting fusion is a very big and significant one. The two sons of Bardock now combine to form one, Radito! This fusion, like the one with Ranten, is even more effective than Vegito because blood connection, especially because they are brothers. It's emotionally, narratively, and physically much more potent and significant, and oh my god, the feels in this situation would be really strong. The resulting battle between Radito and Buhan is even more one-sided than with Vegito. Yes, we get Super Radito, and we also get Radito being absorbed by Buhan, and the plan still goes ahead, but the big difference this time is that Vegeta isn't around to screw things up. And this is all down to the fact that Raditz is a lot more cautious, logical, and able to work together with his brother. That's kind of a big thing. Once Buhan has reverted to Super Buu, Goku powers up to Super Saiyan 3 and Raditz to Super Saiyan 2, and together they blast Super Buu out of existence. Well, the reason why I wanted to do this was because this is a perfect way to convey the progression that Goku and Raditz have had. Initially, when they first met, they were mortal enemies despite being brothers, but now they were working together, the sons of Bardock as one against the forces of evil in the universe. The ultimate rites of passage. And don't worry about Vegeta, he'll get wished back with the Dragon Ball, so yeah, he'll still be around, don't worry. We are left in a bit of a quandary. What to do with all of this? Now originally I kind of wanted to end the scenario right here because like I said in the Kid Goku scenario, I didn't really want to cover Super in this actual adventure. However, there's been such an outpouring of emotions for this tale and for this not to end, I'm really struggling and... Ugh, okay, go on then. We'll carry on into Super, okay? Okay, one more time next month. We will cover the Super arc as much as we can, probably up to the Tournament of Power. With Ranch and Goten being able to fuse together to form Ranten, they have shown their fighting spirit. Goten is a lot more confident and Trunks has actually got some strong rivals in order to train with. Those three children are chock full of determination, fighting spirit and cooperation. They are going to be knocking on the door of Super Saiyan 2 in no time. They'll have easily achieved it by the time we get to Beerus. We're gonna go into Super, so let's go! We start the story four years after the end of the Boo arc. In that time, Goku and Raditz's friendship has gotten even stronger. They practically train with each other all the time. An easy feat considering they practically live next door to each other. With Gohan having moved to Satan City to live with his wife Videl, Ranch hasn't really got anyone else to train with other than Goku or Raditz. Now it's Goten. She and Goten get a little bit close and they get to know each other a little more through the art of training. And of course, Trunks is on the picture. He kind of has to be after what we implied in the last part. And of course, Ranch has to be the good big sister to her brothers, Daikon and Muli. Now, Daikon and Muli are seven years old at this point, and they're pretty good at fighting, but they really lack focus, much more so than the days of Goten and Trunks in the original anime. Most of the time when they're training, it just mainly devolves into them playing practical jokes on each other. Now, you're probably asking, can they go Super Saiyan because Goten and Trunks did? Well, Daikon can't yet, but Muli can. 
Muli, the lackey to Daikon, spent the longest time basically being his twin brother's subordinate, but then one day, he actually discovered he had a little bit of a quirk that he inherited from his mother. He developed a terrible sneezing fit, and by the end of it all, he let out this huge sneeze which almost blew the house down, and he suddenly became a Super Saiyan. And this of course made Daikon, the alpha brother, very jealous, but at the same time, it made sure that their relationship was somewhat equal, because Daikon to be kind of impressed that Muli was able to come up with the goods, but at the same time, resentful because he doesn't have the power himself. If you want a point of reference to what I'm going for, look at the relationship between Khalifa and Kale and you'll see what I mean. As for Ranch, she's gone from strength to strength. Now she's 13 years old and entered the quagmire that is teenage life, but that hasn't stopped her from becoming even stronger. And of course, her relationship with Trunks is getting all the more complicated because Trunks is completely oblivious to her advances, or even implication that she really kind of has a crush on him because, you know, he doesn't really know. But in that time though, Ranch has perfected the art of Super Saiyan 2, having trained with her father, her uncle, and pretty much everyone else, and after having it been exposed to it during her fusion with Goten, you know, Ranten. The three of them are a lot stronger than Goten and Trunks are in the anime because they have much more determination to do better, having much more competition with themselves, and that's all down to, as well, Goten's newfound confidence. He doesn't even have Goku's hairdo anymore, He's now got his own one, you know, the one he has at the end of Z, because he's his own person now, and that is fantastic news. But as this is all going on, far in the depths of Universe 7, Beerus, the god of destruction, awakens. He has had a terrible dream, something about a Super Saiyan god rising up and then trying to threaten his power and domain over Universe 7, something that he will not abide by. He decides to where it's located, Earth and try and pinpoint the exact location, and then try and get rid of it before it can actually outclass him. Whis was able to point this out due to the highest concentration of Saiyan energy in Universe 7, but he then points out too on King Kai's planet that there is an even greater signature, and this is coming from two Saiyans alone. Now you're probably asking, where is Vegeta in all of this? Well, he's still around, but not very much though. He kind of keeps himself to himself much more these days. Having bested his former minion Raditz back in the Boo arc when he became Margin Vegeta, he doesn't really have much call to socialise anymore. He kind of just wants to train on his own. He's got what he wanted. He's got purpose. However, he really didn't take too kindly by being ignored by the likes of Goku because, you know, Raditz was still friends with them. They'd gotten even closer. They fused. They'd gotten stronger together and this did not sit well with Vegeta and he just kept himself to himself because of it. Back on King Kai's world, Goku and Raditz are still training when Beerus and Whis show up. Whis is surprised to see Raditz here of all places, but Raditz remembers them all too well. Now you remember that Vegeta recognised Beerus from his childhood? The same thing kind of applies to Raditz, although Raditz never saw Beerus directly. He heard tales about it from Vegeta, back in the days when they were actually starting to get to know each other. Vegeta would tell stories about Beerus and then describe what he would look like and how he felt like his power. And this is something that Raditz remembered and was horrified by. So yeah, based on just purely the description alone, Raditz knows who Beerus is. Goku has no clue as to why Raditz and King Kai are so frightened by this kitty cat. But Goku can't sense his energy though, so it's kind of a curiosity and he's gonna go, Yo kitty cat, how strong are you? Let's fight. Goku asks Raditz whether they'd like to take this guy on, but Raditz is in no way going to be fighting this guy. He knows exactly what he's going to be fighting, so yeah, no point, no point, he's just going to get trounced. But Goku decides to go and fight Beerus all out, and yeah, we all know what happens. Beerus then turns to Raditz and asks him whether he might be the Super Saiyan God, and naturally, Raditz is basically going to say, Oh no, Lord Beerus, no! Um, I'm just a mere weakling! Uh... Yeah, you gotta understand, Raditz has developed a lot of confidence, but when you got the likes of Beerus who was connected with his childhood, yeah, the old cautious Raditz is slowly going to shine through. But then unfortunately, Beerus doesn't really give him much of a chance to say no after that. In a flash, Raditz goes Super Saiyan 2 out of desperation and can barely dodge Lord Beerus before he's bested too, even quicker than Goku. Having been disappointed, Beerus then goes to Earth to try and look for more Saiyans. Goku and Raditz then regain consciousness and try to figure out what on Earth just happened, or what on King Kai's world happened. However, one thing that they do know is that they need to get to Earth right now. Speaking of which, Beerus and Whis arrive on Earth and Vegeta's doing his usual groveling routine with them, as you know. And yes, don't worry, 
Super fun time bingo occurs. At Bulma's birthday party, you might remember that Goten and Trunks were quite impetuous and annoyed Lord Beerus a lot, but thanks to Ranch's presence there, they are kept under control, and they definitely don't get involved with Beerus. The three of them are really intimidated by Beerus, and by the time they actually think to go up to Beerus, Vegeta tells them to scram, and so they do. I mean, if Vegeta is groveling at this guy's feet, then probably best to avoid him. Now, another thing to take note of is that Mr. Boo isn't here. He never got revived after the previous arc, since Kid Boo never turned up, and Mr. Boo never got a chance to really show how good he was. This makes things a lot less tense because Boo's not around to muck things up with Beerus and Pudding. But nevertheless, he is still quite keen to fight all the Saiyans' presents one by one. But before he can do this though, and before he can finish off his lovely Pudding, Goku and Raditz show up for round two. The two of them then explain to everyone else, because Vegeta was too scared to try and explain himself, that Beerus is a god of destruction and will stop at nothing to get what he wants. The whole summoning of Shenron takes place as to try and ascertain what to do to get the Super Saiyan God to show up, and the, pretty much the tradition happens, you know, the routine, the ritual, yeah, that goes by. And thankfully, though, they're not scrabbling to try and find Saiyans because there's like at least four more Saiyan descendants present. So the Dell's pregnancy is not known about right now. That will be a surprise for later. Goku becomes a Super Saiyan God, much like in the anime and movie, and the universe is almost torn asunder, like in the actual series. Also, like in the show, Goku is bested by Lord Beerus, but before Lord Beerus can destroy the Earth and rid the world of Super Saiyan God, he naturally falls asleep and is whisked away by Whis promising to return again, not only to fight Goku some more, but also to have some more of that delicious pudding. Now here is where things get really interesting, the Resurrection F arc. Now you remember that Vegeta had that really strong sense of contentment after beating Raditz in the Boo arc? You thought that grudge was quelled, but no, it's not over yet. Whis returns to Earth not only to have some food on the sly, but also to offer a chance for Goku to train with him because, you know, Beerus is asleep and Whis has got nothing better to do. Goku is more than happy to accept this invitation and asks Whis whether he can actually take his brother along. Whis considers this for a moment, but eventually accepts the offer because, hey, he gets what he wants. Goku might even train more because Raditz is there, and why not? Having two Saiyans there might be really interesting. I would have it that Vegeta doesn't get to train with them and, as such, doesn't become Super Saiyan Blue just yet. But why is that, Masako? Why are you being such a Vegeta hater? No, 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 no. Don't worry, he will get his time. It's just not yet. Of course, Vegeta would see this and try and plea with Whis to actually train with them, but Whis just doesn't see the point of having three Saiyans there. It's far too much effort and not necessary. And do you think Vegeta's really going to go against Whis, an angel who's even stronger than Beerus? Yeah, I don't think so. He bites his tongue for now. And also, Goku and Raditz really don't speak up for Vegeta because after the Boo arc, as I said, Vegeta's really gone to the periphery of the group. Having become more and more isolated, his relationship with Goku and Raditz is practically non-existent. But the fact that Raditz got to go and train with Whis and not him is plenty to reignite the grudge between him and his former minion. So that's back on again. It means that Vegeta's character arc is now alive and well again. He can achieve great things when he puts his mind to it. From here, a lot of things happen quite similarly to the original story. Pan is born and the three Saiyan children, Ranch, Goten and Trunks, are now joined by Daikon and Muli in part. But however, all these kids' participation at the moment is somewhat limited due to the restrictions of the story. But do let me know in the comments whether you'd like to actually hear a spin-off about their adventures and what they do. because. A lot of people really like Ranch Goten and Trunks' interaction, and I would love to actually explore that some more outside of a what if Raditz turned good here, because we have to remember the focus is on Raditz. So if you want to actually see that, I'll leave a poll right here. As for the Resurrection F arc itself, it plays out pretty much the same as it does in the anime for the most part, with the biggest exception being that Raditz is the second Super Saiyan Blue instead of Vegeta. But Frieza can see Vegeta present at the matchup, and of course Frieza being Frieza, and having that particular relationship with Vegeta, he's going to really rag on the prince something chronic, and really touch a nerve because thinking, Oh, why isn't that Prince Vegeta present in the fight? Has he gone soft? Oh boy, let's make fun of him. Oh my my, isn't it ironic that the low-class Saiyans bested the royal blood? Maybe you two aren't so dirty after all. It's the royalty that are trash. Right, Vegeta? All of this gets Vegeta angry and even more resolved to best Raditz, but really right now there's not a whole lot he can do, especially against the likes of Golden Freezer. Well, looks like he's going to get his revenge against Frieza some other time. Oh no, wait, he won't. With Goku being taken down by Sorbet's blaster, it's up to Raditz to finish Frieza off once and for all, and avenge the Saiyan race. 
and it's all down to a low-class warrior. Unlike Vegeta, who once again, as we remember, muck things up, Raditz knows when to end the fight properly, and so he does. Instead of just blathering on about pride and avenging the Saiyan race and all that, once Raditz has actually pummeled Golden Freezer into the ground, and he reverts to normal Freezer, then Raditz just blasts him away and Freezer is dead. All of this done with a Kamehameha, something that he learned from Goku during the four year time skip, because hey, it had to happen eventually. And this is the final straw for Vegeta. His former nemesis and dog's body managed to do what he had been longing to do for decades. He screams to Raditz that he will kill him someday and that he will get his revenge on him once and for all. So now all that vengeful blood has gone to Raditz. So Vegeta disappears from the scene out of frustration. This leaves everybody concerned as to what Vegeta might be plotting, but for now there's no time to dwell because hey, they gotta celebrate the fact that Freeze is no longer here. And also ensuring Goku's safety because remember, he was injured by that blaster. Of course, this is the beginning of the Universe 6 arc where Beerus and Sharpa are having a typical brotherly spat about who is the better god and who gets to have the Earth of Universe 7 after all. This all ends up with a tournament being devised 5v5 about who gets to have Earth. Before that happened though, Goku and Raditz were on Beerus' planet training with Whis and trying to hone the Super Saiyan Blue power that they just recently acquired. After they find out about the tournament, Goku and Raditz are given their marching orders to try and find some fighters from amongst their ranks to actually come to the tournament. Raditz is very concerned at this point that the sake of the Earth's future is being just settled on the sake of a brotherly feud, but Goku's not worried too much because as he rightly points out, the Earth isn't in danger per se, it's just a case of it moving somewhere else. He's not fully convinced, but he does feel a little bit better. They then return to Earth to get Bulma to make the Super Dragon Radar, so that means they can find the last Super Dragon Ball that Shamba hadn't collected. They then also pick their team for the tournament. Piccolo's a no-brainer because he is game for the tournament, and Beerus has someone up his sleeve, later we know to be Monica, to actually try and get Goku to become even stronger. Gohan is still not selected because Goku's keen not to take him away from his studies and his precious conferences. So what about Vegeta then? Wouldn't he be right? So that means you can have three Saiyans in the roster? Well, Raditz is particularly averse to having Vegeta in close proximity to him, but Goku's still keen to at least ask Vegeta, so he goes to find him on his own. He asks if the fool Raditz is taking part in the tournament. Goku says yes. Vegeta then blows up a nearby mountain. And, uh, mm, well there's your answer, he says. Goku is feeling a little uneasy now because Vegeta won't help and Vegeta's still plenty strong. The prince then states that he is too busy to help out in piddly tournaments because he's trying to find a new power of his own. Something that is true to the Saiyan bloodline and doesn't need the help of the gods to then give them a leg up or something. He will find it himself. Goku then leaves feeling both concerned and dejected. When he tells Raditz the news that Vegeta's not going to take part in the tournament, Raditz does feel relieved, but this does mean they have to still find one more person. But who exactly? Well, it's time for Ranch to step up. Masako, why are you inserting your original character into here? You're not sticking to the what ifs! Well, okay, no, hear me out here. If Gohan's too busy and Vegeta won't take part, then it makes sense to at least have one of the kids take part because they can hold their own. Trunks would have been a non-starter because Vegeta would have forbidden him to take part if Raditz was involved. And then Goku feels like Goten wouldn't take the tournament too seriously. Goku's still not too sure about this, but Raditz has an ace up his sleeve. He says to Goku, the fact that you snubbed my daughter for fusion training all those years ago, this would be the perfect way to make amends, right? Make sure that you're her favorite uncle, eh? Goku then reluctantly accepts. Raditz then finds Ranch and tells the news. She is overjoyed about this. She gets to show her full potential. Launch is a little bit concerned about this and whether she'll be safe, but then Raditz assures her that no one's going to be destroyed, no one's going to die, everything will turn out okay. It's just a friendly little tournament, and at worst, the Earth will just be in a slightly different place. The worst Ranch could possibly get is a little scuffed up. Ranch then goes to find Trunks and Goten to tell them the good news, but Trunks is feeling a little sore about this because he wanted to show his potential at the tournament too, but his father wouldn't let him. But Goten, he is totally thrilled for his cousin's good fortune. Ranch then promises Trunks that she won't rub it too much in his face in a somewhat flirtatious manner because remember, she's got a little crush for Trunks and vice versa, but it's still in the works. 
Don't worry, Trunks, it doesn't make you any less of a man, she says. Suddenly, Vegeta shows up without any warning as he's planning whatever nefarious deed he's doing and gives Branch a scowl. He does not want her near his son and looks speak volumes. Branch then is about to leave with Goten, but then squeezes Trunks' hand slightly as if to say, don't worry about him, everything will turn out okay. It's just a bit of solidarity there. Goku and Raditz then spend three years in the time chamber, and then when they leave, they spot Vegeta up on the lookout as well. For some reason, he's not wanting to grab Raditz's throat. In fact, he's being quite cordial, worryingly cordial. He asks Goku if he's well, and whether he could spend some time with Goku in the time chamber to test out something so that means he can get some eyes in and train a little bit more. Naturally, Goku is keen to do some training, especially with someone else, because he wants to see how Vegeta is for old time's sake, you know. He then is about to head back into the chamber with Vegeta and tells Raditz that he'll catch up with him later tomorrow. And also, it's probably best to get back to Ranch and then do some training just to get her up to speed. We then cut to the Universe 6 tournament about to begin, with Vegeta once again turning down the invite to join. Goku, Raditz, Piccolo and Ranch then head off to the Nameless Planet to take part in the tournament, with the rest of the gang following in hot pursuit with the Whis Cube. They also then meet up with Monica, Beerus' selection for the tournament. Kaba then introduces him as indeed a Saiyan, and then goes on about the exposition of that the Saiyans of Universe 6 are much more peaceful, their planet Sadala is still alive and actually thriving, and everything turned out okay for the Saiyans. Raditz is absolutely overjoyed with this news, and he is much more enthusiastic than Vegeta was in the same arc in the original story. Together, Carver and Raditz are just a ball of laughter and Ah, excellent! I knew the Saiyans would indeed rise up and be thriving! Raditz is so excited he brings Ranch over and says, Look Ranch, this is our heritage right there! You get to see your legacy! But Ranch isn't particularly interested with this. Raditz then promises to come and visit Sadala once all of this is over and Carver is thrilled for the prospect. Maybe they could even do some training together. You know, that whole prospect is a lot more concrete here than it was in the anime. The first three fights of the tournament, Goku vs. Batamo, Goku vs. Frost, and then Piccolo with Frost, happen as they do in the original story. Raditz is feeling very cathartic about all of this because he knew that someone who looks like Frieza would indeed act like Frieza. Piccolo and Goku are reinstated, but Piccolo declines the invite and instead offers Raditz to go and do his thing and get his revenge on the Saiyans again. However, the next fighter that's scheduled to take part is Ranch, and Raditz isn't about to take this opportunity away from her. Let's see how she does against Frost. Ranch then does her thing and one-shots Frost to going Super Saiyan 2, so uh, yeah, that was pretty quick. Hey, if Vegeta can actually one-hit Frost in Super Saiyan, I think Ranch in Super Saiyan 2 could. And boy, Raditz is very pleased to see that. In fact, Goku takes notice too. The next fight with Mageta plays out in a similar way as it does in the original story, with Ranch finishing him off. Instead of a final flash, it's a Shining Friday. And she was also able to catch on to the whole weakness of Mageta being sensitive to insults after Shampa was hurling insults at him earlier. Raditz looks down at her and asks her where she learned such words, and she just says, Blonde mum? Raditz then goes, Ah oh, yes, that makes sense. Next up is Ranch vs. Kaba. Kaba is very keen to talk to her and ask her about her Saiyan blood. She goes Super Saiyan and just tells Kaba, get on and go Super Saiyan too, but he can't do it. Ranch tries to coax it out of him and she ultimately succeeds. Kaba goes Super Saiyan. The fight continues, looking particularly even, much more so than the anime. This looks like it could go down to the wire, but then Ranch pulls out the ace up her sleeve, Super Saiyan 2. She ends the fight with Kaba falling down to the ground. He is excited though to try out more of this Super Saiyan power. Branch then congratulates her and looks forward to their next match and Kaba is indeed excited too. As well as thinking, wow she's strong, imagine how Master Raditz would be. So now we've got Hit. Hit has been particularly quiet in the tournament as you all know, but how does Ranch face up against him? Can she actually do some damage? <laughs> oh my no. She is not going to get that. She is ice within a few seconds because of Hit's time skip ability. Raditz then goes to a raid and is utterly furious that Hit could be so cruel to a child. It's his turn next and he is going to exact his revenge upon Hit. Oh no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same result kind of happens. Although this one takes a little longer. As you see, he goes blue. Hit just answers that immediately and just says, when's the real fight gonna start? It's down to Goku now who's been reinstated because of the whole Frost fiasco 
And the story then continues as it does in the anime. So after all of this and once Ranch has recovered, she has gained a very significant Zenkai boost, much more so than she did in the Boo arc, so she's confident to see what she can do later on in the story. She reckons that she's just about as strong as Vegeta now, but little does she know about what Vegeta's been up to lately. We then take a bit of a break in the story and arrive at the Potofu arc. That plays out somewhat similarly to the original, only with some slight changes. Ranch and Trunks are the ones to be sent off to the planet Potofu in the back of Monica's ship, and with Goten staying behind with Chi-Chi because he's gotta do some studying. They have to hold their own until Raditz instead of Vegeta shows up to try and take them home. He ultimately gets copied and we get copy Raditz, and then we see Raditz with the dummy fighting for his life. Goku and Vegeta then arrive to help with Vegeta only being there to gloat at Raditz's misfortunes. And he's only towing the line with Goku for now, so that means he can enact his plan later. Copy Raditz is ultimately bested by Vegeta, with Monica getting the assist with the whole, you know, destroying the core thing. And throughout all of that fight, Vegeta really went to town on Copy Raditz, and I can't imagine why. After all of that's done, Vegeta then turns to Raditz and gives him a very twisted look. It kind of looks like at this point that Vegeta's going slightly mad. He then explains that he only offered to help, so that means Ranch doesn't get to see her father die in front of her. It was just an act of pity. Oh, this is on right now. So lastly, we begin with the start of the future Trunks arc. And disappointingly, it plays out initially like it does in the anime because it's mostly about Goku going with Beerus and Whis to trying to find out the identity of Goku Black, so, you know, that continues. However, Vegeta is much less stable than he is in the original story, and Future Trunks notices this when he's trying to train with his father, and he's thinking, oh, something's not right with him. What happened? Trunks notices that he is so much angrier than he was in the Cell Saga, but that whole desire to bond with his father is much less strong than it was. The part ends with Goku, Future Trunks and Raditz heading off into the future for the first time to try and figure out what to do against Goku Black. So there we go. Part 9 covered a lot of things, much more than I thought. Ranch got the chance to step up and did pretty well going against the likes of Frost, Megeta, Kaba and only succumbing to hit because pretty much anyone who isn't Goku would have the same thing happen to them. Vegeta's plan to try and best Raditz is taking shape and Goku is just Goku. What is Vegeta's new power to be exact? In the original What If, I sort of skated over this part of the story, but there are some key changes here which actually makes the first half of part 10 actually work out normally. When the time machine is detected on Capture Court property back in the past, present Bulma is the first on the scene and spots Trunks, who she instantly recognises, but then sees a girl that she doesn't, at least not for a few seconds. She then gasps and asks her son from the future, is that your ranch? Yeah, she's in a bad way. She needs urgent medical attention. Can you help us? Suddenly, Trunks could sense a number of powers heading their way. Goku recognizes Trunks instantly and greets them. But after all they'd been through, all they saw was Goku Black before them. Despite Trunks being more aware than in the original at this point, you know, being a bit more mobile, both he and Ranch still flew into a massive frenzy and started attacking Goku, Ranch especially. She was screaming wildly, calling out Balsa and Greta's names, punching Goku with all of her strength, which had been lowered a lot thanks to her atrification. Goku wasn't hurt at all as Ranch's punches were way too weak to do any damage really, but it was still enough to shock the Saiyan. But not long after it started, Ranch just collapsed to the floor. She was still too weak and Trunks regained his senses. Huddled around the bed, the gang see Ranch wake up, and she then apologises for her actions wearily. Raditz and Launch entered the room, and also with present Ranch. Sorry we're so late getting here, we got the wrong room! What's all this about- shouted Raditz, a little too loud for the situation. He then spotted what looked like Ranch on the bed. He then looks to that Ranch, then back to the bed, then his Ranch. What is that the- Future her? He gasped and then looked awfully upset. Despite having never seen her before, at least for a long time, at least he could remember, he had heard about her from Trunks, but to see her like this, even if it wasn't technically his daughter, it made him feel this primal sorrow which rarely made itself known on his usually goofy and daft face. He immediately rushed to her side and she spotted him for the first time, as well as her mother. M Mom? It had been years since she had seen them both. That time she came to the pass and almost got rumbled. They didn't recognise her though. 
She had changed so much. Looked so gaunt. Kid, said Launch. It's all right now. You're safe here with us. Despite her blonde hair and her sassy nature, she actually here sounded caring and docile. Meanwhile, Present Ranch was utterly bowled over with this sight. She didn't know what to think. For now, she hung back and kept to the corner of the room, not sure what to do. Trunks noticed this and decided it was best not to press the matter further. After all, he had his own present self to meet yet, according to what Bulmer had said. A couple of days pass, and while the trio of Goku, Trunks and Raditz headed for the future for the first time around, like in the original What If, Raj is spending time regaining her composure and her strength after travelling back in time. One day, present Ranch plucks up the courage to knock on the door and enters to meet her future self. Similar to how the two trunks talked, this meeting of minds is actually very fruitful. Future Ranch smiled, a rarity these days, and motioned for Ranch to sit down on the bed, and the two of them got to know one another. What happened to you, uh, big sis? Present Ranch said with a question. I guess I am your big sister in a way. Let's go with that. It's far less confusing. But in answer to your question, a lot happened. She was more willing to talk with herself since it was herself in a way. I lost something precious to me by that monster black. After that, it was like a massive portion of my soul had been ripped away from me. I lost the two most precious things to me in a manner so callous and heartless that I never thought it was possible. No, mere mortal could do something like that. I don't know what happened. Two things? You mean that you had kids? Yeah, a boy and a girl. And Trunks is the... Yeah. Ranch blushed profusely. So in the future, they actually did get together after all. Present Ranch's thighs squirmed a little and she looked very sheepish at the prospect of having twins, but she remembered that her manner right now wasn't exactly appropriate, but Future Ranch simply laughed. A coarse and quiet chuckle, but it was the most that she'd laughed in ages. <laughs> Young love. Oh, I miss that. Can we use the Dragon Balls to bring your kids back or something? It's not as easy as that. Our Shen one's gone. And as for the Namekian dragon, we lost contact with them ages ago. We have no idea whether they're alive or dead. It's best to assume that Black took care of them before arriving on Earth. Present Ranch felt really bad for her future self, but then an idea struck. Are you going to help Trunks and the others fight? From what I heard, you're pretty strong too. I was, but look at me. She got out of bed and showed off her skinny arms and legs, as well as touching her gaunt and pale face. I'm in no condition to fight. I can't even go Super Saiyan anymore. Present Ranch stood up and looked determined. Well, that settles it. We're taking you to the Room of Spirit in time. The Room of... Wait, you still have one of those? Yeah, don't you? Not for a long time, but even if I wanted to, what good would it do? I'm not in the mood to be trained by someone else. Not even Trunks. Sometimes the best way to heal is to get to know yourself. She then placed her thumb on her chest, the Present Ranch. That being me. Feature Ranch looked confused, but then got what she was saying. With that, the ranch is left with the present one, leaving a note on the bed. She was taught very well about that, explaining where they had gone. When they arrived on the lookout, Dende bade them to the room and had heard all about the plan. He chose not to question it though, and reminded them that if they wished to get out of the room at any time, all they had to do was just walk out the door at any time. After all, there was no time limit being in there now. In the year they spent there, both ranches learnt a lot from one another. Due to her emaciated body, it meant that her power was lower than that of present ranch at the moment. But as her muscles grew back once more and her focus shifted, the balance of power tipped back into the future's favour. As present ranch said, sometimes the best thing to do is just to get to know yourself. This was the best thing that could have happened to her right now. Inside this chamber, there was no worry about Goku Black showing up. There was nobody else nagging at her. It was just herself. With each passing day, color returned to her cheeks. She looked healthier, thanks to not only the selection of food in the fridge and the lack of outside stimulus bogging her down, it helped reset her mind away from her recurring nightmares of seeing her children die. 
Granted, that memory would never truly be extinguished, that's impossible, but she could at least try to compartmentalize it. Every night, after a good training session and nursing plenty of massive food babies from all the food they ate after some intense training, the two ranches would casually chat about life, how their futures panned out, and how each other's timelines differed. Our ranch found this to be a fascinating year. She had learnt a lot about herself, and she felt like she'd grown up a little herself, gaining more of a sort of carefree vibe like her father had. After all, when in full flow, Future Ranch had a very roguish sense of humour, like Raditz did. When they exited, Trunks and the others were there to meet her, knowing where they were. When the two of them met eyes once more, they both smiled at one another and embraced. Trunks hadn't seen his bell so well in months, and Ranch could once again put her pain aside and appreciate the here and now. Ranch, are you okay? How do you feel? Ranch thought about this for a moment. She turned to her present self and she nodded. I feel like it's time to take back our timeline. She looked determined and focused, her body ready to take down Black, whatever the cost. Now fully recovered and back to full strength, Future Ranch and Trunks were able to reconcile their relationship and figure out a plan as to how to get back at Goku Black, them of course unaware of the additional backup of Zamasu, yet. However, their planning was cut short when an unexpected item was in their bagging area. Goku Black, using a time ring, had made his introduction into the past, keen to find out what had happened to Ranch. Oh Ranch, come out, come out. I've been missing basking in your self pit. What? What is this? The gang had congregated, and Goku Black gazed down at Future Ranch, not only standing up, but also back to full health, revitalized. This was not what the Fiend wanted to see. He had held off further destruction of Earth simply because Ranch had been broken by him personally and so completely. But now she was fully restored. He clenched his fist. You. You're supposed to be damaged beyond repair! Ranch was now the one wallowing in Goku Black's emotional state. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Black. Oh wait, no. I'm not sorry. Sure, <laughs> you tore apart my family beyond recognition. But all I've been doing is feeding your overly lumbering ego. I realize that. Well, I hate to say this, but you're cut off. Permanently. You won't be getting any of that from me anymore. She was the one in control now, and this got Black extremely angry. He had grown so cushy from her misery that to suddenly have that taken away from him? Oh, he lunged forward, screaming with frustration. But he didn't even notice the fact that the likes of three big burly Saiyans descend upon him including Trunks, obviously, with Raditz leading the charge. I won't let you anywhere near my daughter. You've tormented her long enough. Time for a little payback, right? Future Ranch blushed a little bit. It was nice to hear her father's voice, even though it wasn't exactly the same version of Raditz. Mm, all right, she'll take it. Goku Black was looking wild with anger, but tried to keep his voice as stable as possible. No matter. You, you mortals are all the same. Raditz powered up to Super Saiyan 2, and the fight between himself and Goku Black began. Unlike Goku, who was dawdling, not taking this fight seriously, Raditz was. He was not holding back. This fight was showing clearly that Goku Black was not as strong as he had expected to be. He didn't care though. He was going to make this fool suffer for all that he had done. Goku Black would be the one left dead ridden here after many months of pain for Ranch. Black had little answer to this and was left bowled away by this. His trip to the past, nearly acting as like a victory lap, rubbing Ranch's face in his dominance, had gone completely and utterly south. After a few minutes, Black was injured far more than in the original, not just like a, oh no, my side, as in like, yeah, he's barely standing. He's on the verge of passing out. Raditz decided to finish this off in his blue power, but before he could do so and power up, a weird temporal anomaly dragged Goku Black out of the timeline and back to the future. Raditz cursed for not doing more sooner, but Ranch was very impressed by his power, and it was great to see Black suffering like that. He'll be back though, stronger than ever, I'll bet. His key is so strange, it, it feels like Goku's, but yet it's not. Whis piped up and echoed those sentiments. And that leads to the beginnings of the investigations of the Zamasu in this timeline, but we're keeping that to the original Raditz turn good timeline. Not important here. Trunks and Ranch knew they had to capitalize on this quickly. 
Bulma had been able to, in all this time while Ranch was training with present Ranch, filling up the fuel tanks from half to full so that the time machine could escape to the past if they needed to, if things got troublesome. Raditz then elected to go into the future with them, keen to see how it had turned out. No offense, Raditz, but, said a nervous Trunks, three people in the time machine? And you especially? It might be a little cramped for you. Raditz beat his chest. Ha! Nonsense! My hair is very versatile, you know. It can squish in enough to act as cushioning, in fact. It'll be fine. It won't be a long trip besides anyway. Ranch and Trunks looked to each other and nod. Perhaps it might be worth a shot. When they get there, they can't sense Goku Black in the city, but Raditz can sense something several miles away in what looks like some kind of forested area. Masking their key as best they can, they pocket the time machine and fly over to where the energy is coming from. When they find it, they are bemused to see a nice little log cabin just perfectly resting nearby the woods. Raditz was floored. Seriously? This being of galactic destruction lives in a little hut like this? How ridiculous. Trunks, though, was serious. That's their hideout, all right. Black's not fully healed yet. At least I can tell. Let's rush him while we have the chance. Runch then motioned for her to do it. He's been after me for the longest time, Trunks. If he wants me, he can have me. And if he's still badly injured, I want to be the one to kill him. With that, she flew over to the cabin and entered. The door was open, and Ranch looked at the interior. It was very plain, not much stuff inside. The only items of note here were some elegant pieces of crockery, some dinnerware, and a pot of tea, still steaming, and a couch. That was it. This wasn't exactly extravagant or what she expected. A bedroom door, though, was ajar on the other side of the room, and in there, she could hear coughing, spluttering, and cursing. Black was in there, and having a bad time of a dream. She entered the room and saw Black sleeping, but in a cold sweat. She walked up to the bed and raised her hand up, ready to blast him away. But he was just lying there, vulnerable, completely helpless. Screw on her! He'd done that long ago anyway. She'd been dreaming about blowing Black away in an instant. She wanted this. But then suddenly, Black opened his eyes and grinned. Then a voice emanated from behind. I wouldn't do that if I were you, mortal. She turned around and a green man with pointy ears met her view. Zamasu. I knew you would do this, said Zamasu. Mortals are so predictable. Your emotions get the better of you, I must admit. My friend here is quite injured. At death's door, I imagine, if not treated properly. I would be mad if it were any other person here getting in the way, but you... Oh, you've been the apple of my friend's eye for quite some time. Your friend took everything from me, and my family, and in the coldest and most heinous way imaginable. Oh, that! Oh, your children! Oh, he did enjoy that. I can see why now. Snuffing out mortals before they can wreak their havoc upon the universe at their most infantile? <laughs> oh, fantastic. Black laughed softly in bed, still hurt. <laughs> I'd do it again if I could. My sole goal in life now is to make you and Trunk suffer. All that's left in this universe is this world. So, I'm more than happy to take my time for you. Ranch had had enough. She powered up to Super Saiyan 2 and blasted a hole right through Zamasu's chest. Almost like he just took it. But the hole repaired itself almost as quickly as it had been made. Oh, I love this part. He grabbed Ranch's wrist and pulled her up close. If you thought Black was trouble, you've not seen anything yet. I am your worst nightmare. Black is a pussycat compared to me. The things I've seen, the things I've done, all part of my plan to rid this realm of mortals. Ranch spat in his eye and punched Zamasu in the gut with her free hand. This was enough to get her out of the way, and then, sensing trouble, Raditz and Trunk stepped in to roll in and help. The three Saiyans fought Zamasu for as long as possible. They were able to tire him out and injure him many times, but it didn't matter. He kept on regenerating thanks to his immortality. He would relish in telling them more and more about his plan, knowing that they would get frustrated by the second thanks to his powers. With Goku Black injured still, he didn't have Rose to count on, but he didn't care right now. He was only keen to rub salt into Ranch's wounds. But then she remembered something. Black had said something crucial. Wait, I have one question before you kill us. A question? Well, that's a change of pace. It's better than hearing you grunt and moan again whilst trying to kill me. 
All right, I'll humor you. One question. Ranch then asked Zamasu, a crucial one, about the plan, and that Black said that they were done, and that this planet was the last one left before the plan was enacted. Yes, that's correct. What's your point? Ranch then motioned for Trunks to hand over the time machine capsule, and he did without question. Goku in a sense of being anyone? Well, you don't have anything left here. Why not go to another timeline and do it all over again? Surely it might be more fun. We must be bored here with so little left to do. Why settle for one timeline when you can perhaps do it in many? Zamasu thought about this and liked the idea. Mortals in other timelines. Of course. If I give you this time machine, Trunks and Raditz then exclaimed protestations but Ranch ignored them. You can start anew. Truly expunge mortals from other dimensions. Not just this one. This, this is a dead husk of a realm. Where's the fun in that? Zamasu was getting more interested by the second. Oh ho ho ho! Ranch assessed correctly that Zamasu was just like Black. Ego center. She threw the capture onto the ground and out popped a time machine. All you gotta do is push the big red button in there and away you go. Plenty of fuel to bring you back if you get homesick. Zamasu looked at her suspiciously but then entered the time machine and spotted the red button. Correct. Do not think of this as me letting you go. I'll be back to finish you off. And when Black is back to full health, you will see the full wrath of my might. Zamasu then pressed the button, and the time machine disappeared from view. Raditz couldn't hold his tongue any longer. He had to say something. That was my ride home! What have you done? Now he's going to do the same to other worlds that he had done here! And... and I'm stuck here! Trunks thought for a second, and then his face dropped. Raj, did you mean... that button? Raj then looked with a cheesy grin. Oh, yeah, the emergency escape button. Raditz looked amused. I don't follow. What does that button do? It's a means to get out of a timeline as quickly as possible. Then when you're in the timeline, you can just program a new destination there and then. But, oh, I didn't tell Zamasu that part. He doesn't know how to work the thing. Exactly, of course. And he'll get frustrated and try to escape thinking his immortality will protect him. But if mom's predictions were accurate, they then looked up to the night sky. In the time stream, Zamasu was waiting for the time machine to stop off at another timeline, but it didn't. Sure enough, his patience wore thin, and he tried to press all the buttons and was met only with error sirens and nasty buzzers. Then a ticking. It was the failsafe. A countdown appeared on the console, and Zamasu cursed. <sighs> Those mortals have tricked him. <gasps> oh, he'd get back at them. He didn't care, though. He was immortal. Any puny explosion would say... The machine exploded and immediately Zamasu felt time itself pulling himself apart into spaghetti. The vermicelli that was once an immortal Kai could barely comprehend the pain of being contorted by time itself and its forces. And within a few seconds, he had been stretched out so far across time and space, across so much of history, that his mind was too far gone. And thusly, he and his identity were no more. Surely it was immortal, but that only meant he didn't die instantly when the time machine exploded. He had a few seconds of utter torture going for him. Maybe it was for the best he wasn't immortal. Assuming the best, the trio looked down at Black, who had staggered to the door of the cabin looking for his compatriot, but was only met by Ranch. Sorry, buddy. Your friend bounced. Where, where did he go? Oh, I'll tell you. Some other time. Ranch then powered up to Super Saiyan 2 and began to beat down the wounded Black even further. He hadn't had the time to recover at all, and so he was now even more injured than ever. Thanks to Raditz, of course. In his last moments, the three Saiyans looked down on him and in unison blasted him into oblivion. Black was no more. In the aftermath, Ranch had never felt so overjoyed. Well, I mean, except for the time when her kids were born, obviously. Raditz was amazed by the power on display here from his future daughter, and was getting more and more thrilled to see them overcome everything here, and then maybe his own ranch would have Trunks. Oh, Trunks was a keeper. You picked a good one in ranch, kiddo. I only hope Trunks makes just as good a decision as you, and that Vegeta doesn't try to put a stop to it. The two future people laughed, but then the reality set in. Oh, the time machine was gone. They didn't have the means to repair it, and, uh, oh... Okay. But then suddenly, they could send somebody back in West City. Goku. They rushed back to see what it was. Was it Black Resurrected? No, it was the present Goku with Bulma. 
and a mossy time machine. What the? My time machine! shouted Trunks. Bomb looked quite pleased with herself. <laughs> I knew that I had this weird feeling in the back of my head about this. It was just knocking around from the time of Cell. Turns out I was right. Thought we could come and give you a hand if you needed it. Goku gave a thumbs up and was ready to help out, but then found out his help wasn't needed. He looked a little downbeat, sure, but he was happy to see no more trouble to be had in the future. Raditz hugged his brother, pleased to see him, and told them everything that had happened. With all of that squared away, Bulma, Goku, and Raditz head back to the present to tell everyone the good news. But this time, they are solely met by a very confident and snarky looking Vegeta. He walks up to the injured Raditz and pats him on the shoulder, saying, You, meet me down by the beach tomorrow. Come alone. The brother of Goku doesn't really know what to make of this situation, but he feels that deep down in his Saiyan heart, he knows that he has to do this. After eating his sensu bean and resting up for the night, the day approaches. Vegeta vs Raditz, the final conclusion. Branch, Daikon, Muli and Launch are there to see Raditz off for the big battle. Launch pleads with him saying that he doesn't have to do this, Vegeta's just being a sore loser. Raditz tells her that he has to. Vegeta's pride, the way it's going, it'll keep going on forever and ever, and he will not rest until Raditz fights him. This has to happen. Even though Launch can't understand it, Ranch does get it, being part Saiyan and all that. Raditz arrives at the location as promised, and Goku is there too to see the fight in question. Raditz is very concerned whether Vegeta will react to Goku being there, but Goku promises not to interfere and he just wants to watch as a bystander. He will not interrupt. Vegeta arrives and scolds Raditz for bringing Goku. The prince reluctantly allows this, saying that if that low-class buffoon interrupts, then he will stop at nothing and kill the pair of them. From the side of the beach, a tank-like vehicle rolls up into position. The antenna emits a green-like beam which strikes Vegeta in a direct hit. Vegeta laughs out loud, feeling the sensation of the Blutz waves working. This is a feeling he remembers very well. His tail grows back, he starts to grow in size, and he lets out a huge roaring laugh. I have found a new power of my own, Raditz! Know your place under your prince! He slowly becomes Uzaru before calming his mind down, becoming Golden Uzaru, which surprises everybody. We then see, after all the smoke and light clears, Vegeta as a Super Saiyan 4. Goku and Raditz are aghast. This is nothing they've encountered before. They don't recognize this Super Saiyan form at all. The Blutz Wave Cannon, like we saw in GT, is now in this scenario. Why exactly? Well, it's all down to the fact that Bulma designed it thanks to Vegeta's inspiration. And since Vegeta was so angry and so stubborn, Bulma agreed to make this Blutz Wave Cannon in order to shut him up. Now, much like Toriyama, I'm going to go with what works best dramatically. So we get Vegeta and Raditz going toe to toe with Goku and Bulma simply watching on. The battle is intense, but Raditz hasn't gone full power yet because he doesn't want to kill Vegeta because this is just a petty fight. They don't have to do this. They can end it and just try and figure things out the normal way. Raditz keeps insisting to Vegeta to just let this all go. Trunks shouldn't have to deal with all of this. This is meant to be peacetime. Vegeta then responds saying that he doesn't care what his son thinks. And oh yeah, he doesn't want that trash of a daughter to be anywhere near his son ever again. Oh, you did not just call Ranch that. He then lets out a scream that explodes like a supernova. He is now raging. The Super Saiyan Blue Aura shocks everyone around. It's bigger than any scene before against Goku Black. He punches Vegeta across the horizon, sending him flying for miles. And while Vegeta's all completely confused, he prepares a god double Sunday, the likes of which has never been seen before. This is a full power attack. But once Vegeta's recovered, he's got an attack of his own final shine. The two beams collide and the Saiyans get closer and closer as they try and drive each other to submission. It's getting more intense. Who's going to win? Who's going to win? By the end of it, they are only 10 feet away from each other with Vegeta smirking and laughing, saying, Ah, oh, Raditz, this power is great and ultimate. Yours was not deserved. Mine was. Vegeta lets out one more furious scream and we see an explosion of white light which encompasses everything around them, including Goku and Bomber on the ground. Goku and Bulma fear the worst because they cannot sense any energy from the pair of them. Bulma then pulls out a capsule which contains a boat. And they then head out, out to sea to try and find their bodies. After about 20 minutes, they successfully find them and they're barely hanging on to life. Hours pass and Vegeta finally regains consciousness. He has nothing but his thoughts for company until Raditz wakes up, looks over to the prince and smiles. You see, prince, 
It doesn't matter what class you belong to. Any being has the potential to become stronger than what destiny provides them. Anything is possible. Kakarot proved that to you years ago, and I proved it to you today. Vegeta is stunned by this, and he wants to deny it, but deep down, in the heart of hearts, he knows this to be true. Once Vegeta and Raditz have actually recovered, their relationship begins to heal. Sure, they're not going to become friends anytime soon, but they can at least tolerate each other in the same room and work together for once. As for Trunks and Ranch, well, they're allowed to see each other again, and everything is just coming up roses for the pair of them. When they're told the good news, Trunks kisses Ranch on the cheek, and Ranch hugs him back, and with all of that happiness around us, this part ends. So there we have it. Ten parts of the story, and we pretty much reached this conclusion for the time being. But does this mean that the story is over? Oh, absolutely not. But in this part, we did lay down the groundwork for a potentially interesting part 11 in the future. Zamasu was contained, future Zeno wasn't brought back, and this could mean that the tournament of power could be changed significantly. In any case, Vegeta and Raditz's feud has finally been put to rest. After many years of squabbling, they can now finally begin to try and work together. It's time to begin the universe survival arc, and this time we don't have two Zenos, but just one. He is playing some games with a random guard because he's extremely bored. He gets to the point of boredom where he basically just wants to erase one of his guards because he can, leaving the rest of the guards, understandably, a little bit shaken. Meanwhile, since it's been quite peaceful for a while, Goku and Raditz have actually started up a new company delivering fruits and vegetables. What's the name of the company? Well, it's the Sorn Brothers. But honestly, this was all down to Chi Chi and Launch because they basically told their husbands, get real jobs, okay? Together, they've actually made quite a name for themselves selling their produce, with Raditz especially proving very effective in getting sales. He is very pompous, but he's also really talkative. He can actually engage with people. He gets into the moment and the spirit, whereas Goku kind of just doesn't want to be there. You know, if it makes Chi Chi happy and he can train more, then fine, but you know, whatever. However, despite Raditz loving the job, he can't help admit with his brother that, you know, they kind of want something else to do. Despite Raditz calming down a lot and embracing his new human lifestyle on Earth, that little thing with Saiyans and fighting and pride, it's still there. And he can't help but just remember it's there. And he can't ignore it. Raditz immediately thinks that, maybe we should go to Universe 6 sometime. I can fight that Kaba person because Ranch made light work of him. Maybe I want to see how he does with me. The most likely plan is basically to persuade Whis to come to Earth and take them over so they can train. After coming up with a plan to lure him, they both head off to Capture Corp to then actually inject it out. However, this time they aren't surprised by the fact that Bulma's pregnant because with Ranch being there all the time hanging out with Trunks, the whole fact that Bulma's pregnant and about to have bra born, yeah, it's pretty much common news. But Goku can't help but forget things because Super made him forget stuff. He has to be reminded with a slap to the back of the head from his brother. This time though, instead of just the pair of them going with Whis, Raditz decides to show some goodwill towards Vegeta, and offers that he can come along too. And the Prince of All Saiyans gladly accepts the proposal. This Vegeta is less inclined to stick around for the birth of his new child, because he's a bit more of a jerk in this one, wanting to mess with people. And the fact is now, Raditz is wanting to include him, you know why not? It's something interesting, he can show Beerus what he can do. It's kind of cool. Bulma's going to chew him out, of course, but really, deep down, she knows better. He's going to feel really embarrassed when he gets whomped by Beerus. <laughs> she thinks to herself. When they arrive on the planet, Beerus is actually kind of curious about the Super Saiyan 4 power. All right, tell you what, Vegeta. How about you go up against me with your new monkey form, all right? How does it stack up against Super Saiyan Blue? Well, yeah, but at least it wasn't two seconds. It was more like, like, ten. Beerus is disappointed, but appreciates Vegeta the fact that he actually tried and didn't run away. After watching Vegeta getting totally stomped by Beerus, Goku remembers something. That Omni King person. Maybe he might be worth pursuing. He might be able to get Vegeta up to speed. As well, of course, himself and his brother. Goku's not all that selfless. Goku then asks Whis to take him to the Omni King because he wanted to ask him a question about something after seeing Goku Black and about different universes. Basically, Goku's acting a lot smarter than he would be. Whis is a little suspicious, but, you know, if it means that Goku's, you know, actually taking interest, then, oh, well, why not? After all, he did bring food. Before Raditz can realize where his brother's gone, Whis and Goku then head off to talk to the Grand Priest and the Omni King. Moments later, Goku and Whis return. 
Whis looking really sullen faced and Goku looking really satisfied with himself. Raditz asks where they went and Goku naturally spills the beans because he's excited. Beerus overhears them and immediately heads over to Goku going, what in the blazes do you think you're doing you monkey? In fact, Beerus is so distracted when he finds out about this, Vegeta gets a punch on him straight in the face. Vegeta doesn't really care about what's happening at the moment, he's just happy that he got a punch him. Ha! <laughs> Showed him. Before Beerus can get any more angry words towards Goku though, the Elder Kai pops up in their minds and says, they need to come to the sacred world of the Kais immediately because the Grand Priest is there and demands their attention. Once they've all arrived, the Grand Priest delivers his message. The Tournament of Power will happen in two days time and they'll require to get 10 people to fight in this battle royale. I won't bother you with the details of the rules because that's pretty much commonplace and we don't have all day. To make things even more complicated for Universe 7, they have to take on Universe 9 in an exhibition match to show the proof of concept for the tournament. Oh great, Goku's in a whole heap of trouble. Naturally, Beerus says that he's not going to help Goku find a team, he has to do it himself. And Raditz is angry too. He's absolutely furious at his brother for doing so reckless, so he's out. Well, someone is about to step up, and that is Vegeta. Witnessing an opportunity here, Vegeta decides to chime in. <laughs> oh well, well, looks like the low-class warriors are having a bit of a tiff. Well, I don't mind helping with my new power. It'll be the most fun I've had in years. Now that just leaves one more fighter to take part. And of course, that's Gohan. The same thing with Goku recruiting Gohan happens as it does in the anime, with Gohan being kind of manipulated into taking part because of the whole, oh, your family will be destroyed because Gohan loves his family. He will defend them to the ends of the earth. And this is almost the end of the earth. So, you know, that whole thing plays out as per normal. Once they settle on a team, Goku, Gohan, and Vegeta, they then return to the Sacred World of the Kais where the Supreme Kai takes them to Zeno's palace and the exhibition match begins. Universe 9 is there too with their team as well as all the other universal divine beings. Of course we have Ro, Sidra and the Trio de Danger. They square up against the three Saiyans and Vegeta is loving this. After so long, Vegeta's now back in the top billing. He's going to make the most of this. There is no Raditz here to outshine him. They may be getting on with each other on face value, but deep down, there's still a little bit of resentment. But thankfully, Vegeta's got a little more sense in the fact that he's just going to toe the line for the time being. But here, he can do and think what he wants. So, it's time for the first match. Basil versus Vegeta. And I say match, it's more like a curb stomp. Vegeta is out to prove a point to Goku that he is still strong and could ultimately surpass the Saiyan. He goes Super Saiyan 4 almost immediately having got a handle on it over the intervening weeks and Basil has no chance against him. Vegeta is going all out right from the start. He ain't holding back. Vegeta is having the time of his life but everyone else around him is looking absolutely mortified. All the gods are so disgusted by this barbaric creature. These Saiyans are they? They're absolutely horrific. Universe 7's horrific. They're just a bunch of savages. Beerus and Gohan have to yell out to Vegeta to stop or else Basil's gonna end up dead. And that could get them destroyed by Zeno right there if he's displeased. So Vegeta reluctantly relents. The next match is Lavender versus Gohan and then that plays out as the same as well as Goku and Bagamo. But this time around, the two fighters from Universe 9 are a little more cautious having witnessed Vegeta be so barbaric with their brother they're going to be naturally apprehensive with all of this. They thought it was going to be a friendly exhibition match, not a complete bloodbath where one of them might actually die. And of course, once Bergamo is down and Toppo steps up, we have that whole thing happen and that's called a halt because Zeno is absolutely satisfied. The groups are then told they have 40 Earth hours to find a 10-man team to then head to the World of Void and then actually enact the Tournament of Power before they're all sent back home. Vegeta immediately says to Goku that he will take part because he absolutely loved this. He will take more of this, please. The rest is up to Goku because Beerus still ain't gonna help. Luckily, Gohan did well enough to actually feel more interested. His Saiyan instincts are kicking in, so he's in. And once Raditz has realized the importance of the situation here and the fact that the Earth will be destroyed if he doesn't help because he's basically the second strongest person here, he then reluctantly agrees to take part too, but he's still angry at his brother, you know. The rest plays out as you would expect in the original story, only with two major changes to the lineup. First off is Ten Shinhan, and don't worry, I'm not going to do it in a way which makes him look bad at all. He's going to look pretty dignified with all of this. 
Goku still goes to his dojo and the episode still happens, only with Tenshinhan actually holding his own against Roshi instead of what actually happened. But the fighter declines and seriously suggests to Goku that they should find someone else because surely there are people out there that can be more justified for the place than him. Tenshinhan does it on his terms. And honestly, if we can do that, then that's something. It means he can hold his integrity. He then suggests that maybe Raditz's daughter might be up to the task. She did well in the Universe 6 tournament, remember? Goku considers this for a moment, well, considers, and then thanks Ten Shinhan for his time. So don't worry Ten Shinhan, you still got your dignity. So now we have the team form up like it does in the anime only without Ten Shinhan. Krillin and 18 are recruited as well as Piccolo, and we still get Goku's sequence with Android 17 even with the weird thing in space, but there's no Boo, because remember, Margin Boo doesn't exist in this universe. The time has come, there are three hours to go before the Tournament of Power begins, and the team still needs to find one more member. Who's it gonna be? Goku still hasn't figured it out, despite Ten Shinhan basically giving him the biggest hint. But then, Goku suggests that they recruit Frieza. But everyone says no, and Raditz basically punches him on the back of the head, saying, What are you doing? You seriously would lump that tyrant fighting with us? That's so incredibly stupid, Kakarot! Because remember, he's still angry with Goku. He's on a bit of a short fuse. As Ranch is there with Trunks and Goten, she's witnessing the situation and the fact that her uncle is digging himself into an even bigger hole she then, basically, stands up and volunteers as tribute. But then Goku decides to dig the hole even more and says, Are you sure you're up to the challenge, Ranch? Raditz clips Goku on the back of the head again. You moron! Didn't you see the Universe 6 tournament? She was our most effective fighter in that thing! Having witnessed her uncle basically doubt her again, she's a little bit nervous and begins to doubt herself. But ultimately, she promises to do her best and take it all seriously. Goten and Trunks, especially Trunks, are a little annoyed that they weren't even considered for the task. But then Raditz points out, have you been in a multiversal tournament and held your own? No? Has Ranch? Yeah? Well, there you go, there's your answer. Having understood this, Trunks then grabs Ranch's hand and asks her, will she be safe? She says yes, and they both hug. Oh wait, what about those Universe 9 assassins? What do they do? Well, since they're at Capture Corp, they basically just put themselves in the lion's den. They're going up against all 10 of the fighters, so <laughs> at least they all get to live. <laughs> Unlike with Frieza. Vegeta decides to not waste his time any longer and takes himself off to the Room of Spirit and Time for the last couple of hours. The time has come. We have our lineup. Goku, Raditz, Vegeta, Gohan, Piccolo, Krillin, Android 17, Android 18, Roshi, and finally, of course, Ranch. Ranch once again feels a little bit nervous of this whole thing because the universe is at stake, but both her father and her now boyfriend assure her that she will do absolutely fine. But where does the biggest crumb of confidence come from? Her cousin Gohan. To her, Gohan is basically her idol. She admires him incredibly, having spent a long time when they were children just being in each other's company. She absolutely adores him because pretty much everyone adores Gohan. He will do his best as team captain to keep her safe and he's not worried about her. He knows that she will do fine. They both hug, they both have a little bit of a tear and oh, it's all so emotional and sweet. But with that, the crew then head off to the World of Void and the Tournament of Power is about to begin. So part 12 begins with our group heading into the World of Void. Goku still comes across Jiren and gets really excited and is of course told to get lost like in the original. The biggest change at this moment is that Khalifa and Kale are interested in finding Ranch, the girl who beat Kava, the Saiyan girl who beat Kava. The two find her, but she is shielded by an overprotective Raditz. He tells them to get lost themselves because the fight hasn't started yet. Khalifa then gets all uppity with Raditz, and I can imagine the two of them are just locking eyes in each other. It's like, what? How dare you come over here? Oh yeah? Well, I can go wherever I want. <sighs> When the fight proper begins, Gohan and the rest of the Earthlings then just stick together, including Ranch, who's basically going to do whatever Gohan wants her to do, because, you know, she looks up to him. Goku and Vegeta are set upon by the fighters of Universe 9 as well, with an even bigger motivation this time from the Trio de Danger, because, remember back in the last part, Vegeta almost killed one of their brothers, but unfortunately the trio are knocked out of the ring by Goku and Vegeta with a merged final Kamehameha. The first time that that's happened in this universe, and this really interests the pair of them. Ah, huh. I didn't know you could do that, Vegeta. That's really cool. Oh, interesting. Maybe the prince is interested in making Kakarot his new rival and someone to strive for. 
In the initial parts of the tournament, Raditz is trying to avoid Goku because he's still mad at him, so keeping a distance is probably for the best bet right now. So he puts his efforts into taking out Roselle and Napapa like Frieza did in the original. Meanwhile, Ranch is being set upon and targeted by the likes of Frost, who understandably wants to get his revenge on the girl who embarrassed him during the Universe 6 tournament. But she doesn't have time for any of this. She immediately powers up to Super Saiyan 2, finds Frost, and then just smacks him out of the ring. And thus, Krillin is saved for the time being. Krillin would then indeed go on to fight Majora of Universe 4, win that round, and then regroup with the rest of the Earthlings. Now that Ranch is getting a blood flowing with so much fighting and excitement going on, she then decides to break off from the Earthling group. She then finds Raditz and together they perform some tag team combo moves on some of the other lesser known fighters, including an attack that they came up with that they can do together called Fortnite, which is basically just a double weekend. However, Ranch spots Kale being assailed by Methiop of Universe 10, you know, you know the big squid guy. But instead of going over and just talking to her, she decides to just jump up and then send a flying kick to Methiop, knocking him out of the ring. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely the saying, all right? Kale thanks her for the assist and is just very shy about all of this, but then Khalifla shows up and just distracts everything. Khalifla then eyes up Ranch and just goes, Ah, so you're a Saiyan, huh? What's with the tail? Ranch then explains that all universe Saiyans, at least at birth, have a tail. This intrigues Khalifla greatly and she desires to see what a universe 7 Saiyan can do. That means that instead of Goku, Ranch is Khalifla's guinea pig. The pair then begin to fight with Kale looking on in total awe of her senpai. They go through the base form, Super Saiyan, Ultra Super Saiyan for a brief moment, and then of course Super Saiyan 2. At this point, both of them are equal in power, but Ranch does have the upper hand given her experience with martial arts from all of the training that she's done with Goku and Raditz. That does count for something. Khalifla, remember, she was the leader of a gang, she was more of a brute, so like with Frieza, she's not really had that much training, other than what she might have gleaned from her brother Renzo. Remember, Khalifa has an older brother. But then Ranch really turns the screw by unleashing her recent weapon that she acquired from Bulma as a late birthday present. And by late, I mean that Bulma practically forgot her birthday and just went like, crap, 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 gotta think of something. She unravels the bow from her hair and we see the power bow. But Masako, you're just inserting Mary Sue weapons now. Uh, no, 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 this is gonna go somewhere in part 13. Just hold your horses. The ribbon can now, thanks to Bomber's engineering, actually channel key. And depending on what kind of key Ranch channels through it, it can be a different type of weapon. A certain type of key, it can be just like a whip. Other types of key, it could be just like a blade. It depends on what she wants. Champa is beside himself with fury saying, this is an outside accessory. How dare she use this? She should be disqualified. But as you know, with Zeno, or at least the Zenos in the original, he thinks that this is really, really cool and ingenious and he's going to allow it because, you know, he does that. He, he goes like, rules? What rules? Cleveland doesn't mind though, she's just really excited to be fighting. She manages to duck and dive under the power bow's assault. It's looking really, really spectacular and so much flourish. The pair then take a break for a second and she asks whether there's a greater power than Super Saiyan 2. Having been energized by all of this fighting, pretty much never been this energized before in her life, Ranch then does let slip that there is a higher power than Super Saiyan 2, Super Saiyan 3. She does know the form technically, because she has seen it been done before, but she's never used it because, as she would know, and we all know, it's kind of pointless. And as that's happening, Kale is beginning to feel isolated because Khalifa's completely forgotten that Kale's even there. Ranch succeeds in going Super Saiyan 3, but immediately regrets it. This is what the power drain must feel like, so she's got to get this done fast so she can go somewhere and recover. Thanks to the power difference though, Khalifa is easily slammed to the ground and this makes Kale feel even more angry because now her senpai's in danger. She's got to help her somehow. And then Raj is just there. She's getting more like, ha, ah, yes, yes. It's at that point Kale goes berserk and rounds on Raj. Raj then decides she needs to get the heck out of there. She tries to power down, but it's too late. Kale just, Whomps her and then she gets them flying and Ranch is out of the ring. She's out. Up in the stands, Ranch is completely beside herself, not knowing what happened, and immediately regrets her decision to go Super Saiyan 3. She vows to herself that she will never transform into it again. She let her pride and arrogance get the better of her, just like her father. Beerus is indeed very disappointed in her, but 
At least she managed to take out that slimeball Frost and saved Krillin for the time being. The rest of the Tournament of Power goes on as pretty much the same as it does in the original, with only instead of her Miller taking out Ten Shin Han, Krillin is the one to do that instead because the basic moveset of Krillin and Ten Shin Han is kind of the same. They both know the multi-form technique, so they could still do that same trick, but unfortunately it's still someone bald that gets eliminated in that round. Everything stays the same all the way until the point we see Ultra Instinct Goku for the first time going against Jiren. This astounds both Raditz and Vegeta, and Raditz is now thinking, hmm, maybe I could do it. But he is then distracted when Goku has lost all of the, his energy and is about to be thrown out of the ring, he has to go find him and give him some of his energy, just like Frieza did. And I think he'd be a little bit more inclined to give a little bit more energy, and this would be the point when Raditz is like, Okay, brother, I forgive you, because, you know, it's imperative that Goku stays in the tournament, because if he's not, then Universe 7 has no chance. Hit and Jiren's fight plays out the same, and we pretty much have the same amount of eliminations as we do in the original. We then, we then cut to when Kaba's about to be eliminated by Mona of Universe 4. Instead of Vegeta stepping in, it's Raditz that steps in, because he remembers that young boy from the Universe 6 arc and has taken a shining to him, and he is more inclined to want to become this young boy's master. Champa's really confused and then goes to his brother, What's he, what's he doing? And then Beerus is just, oh, I don't know, showboating I guess. Khalifa then goes on to fight Goku, having gotten a hankering for Super Saiyan 3, and hoping that this Saiyan knows the form too. And then of course the fusion card is instigated when Champa feels like that they both need to get the upper hand, and we then get to see Kefla go against Goku. That scene plays out the same as it does in the original, with Raditz being distracted by Toppo, and then we get to see Ultra Instinct Goku. And this annoys Raditz somewhat. He feels in his pocket, and then he has the Patara. He was planning to fuse with Kakarot, and it's just like, what? He's fighting! I, I wanted to fight a fusion! Universe 2 and 6 are promptly eliminated, with neither Raditz's presence or Frieza's omission making any difference. Where's Vegeta at this point, Masako? Well, he's adopting the freezer position and just lurking around, taking pot shots at people that are not expecting it. He's biding his time to use the full force of Super Saiyan 4. We are heading towards the end game, and that plays out kind of the same, with Goku and Raditz leading the full assault against Jiren and Vegeta skulking about again. But then he has to take on Dispo and Super Saiyan 4, with Gohan giving the assist. And with being a Super Saiyan 4, Vegeta is still prone to Dispo's grabbing of the tail. Goku's starting to doubt himself because he's getting majorly fatigued, but Raditz is like trying to be the bigger brother and go, snap out of this Kakarot, you can do it! But then Goku's just talking nonsense and getting really, really despondent, but then Raditz just does this. He shuts his brother up and tells him that everything will be okay. Goku initially protests this, but then stops. It's as if he understood something or got the taste for fighting again. So, okay, at this point, does Raditz get that stupid Super Saiyan Blue evolution power like Vegeta did? Well, no. I'm gonna take a leaf out of the manga and the Goku Black Zamasu arc, and instead of that form, Raditz gets something a little bit more akin to that, and I think it was actually the better of the two. Mastered Super Saiyan Blue. Like what happened with Goku in that chapter, Raditz begins to actually bring in all of the ki that is initially being exuded in Super Saiyan Blue. So everything is operating at maximum efficiency, and therefore all the power is available to him. This promptly leads to then Toppo jumping in, fighting Raditz for a second time. While this has all been going on, Vegeta has managed to take out Dispo with Gohan's help, and is feeling really keen to disrupt things again. He then takes a pot shot against Toppo, and as we see with Frieza being underhanded, this angers Toppo greatly, and we eventually see him go beast mode. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I, I don't want Toppo breaking anybody. The two of them go on to struggle because they are both feeling fatigued and Raditz is beginning to fail. He has no other choice but then to try and ape something that Goku did in the manga as well. And I think Raditz would do this. Hakai. How does he know this, Masako? Well, I could ask Goku the same thing after seeing this in the manga. How? Well, if it's there, it could be available to Raditz. Toppo and Raditz would then Hakai each other out of the ring, they'd both be eliminated, and the ring would therefore be destroyed, or at least half of it, like we saw in the original anime. We then head into the final stretch with Vegeta, Seventeen, and Goku taking on Jiren. The Universe 7 fighters are getting desperate, and Goku's struggling to find out what he can do. But then Goku remembers something and he decides to bite down hard. Well, remember when Raditz put his hand over Goku's mouth? 
there was a sensu being cupped in there. Yeah, Raditz being sneaky and all that, that's in his motivation and personality. And then Raditz is just sitting there with his arms crossed going, <laughs> oh, it works. Goku gets back up with the bean taking a little while to digest, but it means that eventually he falls into unconsciousness, but the ultra instinct power is then re-energized. This fight continues with Goku learning how to master the form like he does in the anime. This time though, he does succeed in beating Jiren. Since the sensu beam brought him back to full health, it's meant that his body's not suffering from the fatigue and struggle and lack of integrity like we saw in the original, so he can actually do the deed and take out the final blast and eliminate Jiren. I mean, don't get me wrong, Goku is still absolutely poleaxed and tired, but at least his body's not exploding. So when it comes to making the wish on Super Shenron, Goku is coaxed and is hinted to, to, you know, bring everybody back. Everything then reverts back to the way it was with Vegeta now feeling invigorated to test his new powers out against Kakarot. So, Masako, what are you gonna do with this timeline? Well, put simply, we're gonna be tackling Dragon Ball Super Broly in it. Although it's going to have some pretty big changes in it. The biggest change being the fact there is no Frieza. Freezer is no longer in this timeline. He's still in the realm of nastiness deep down in the heck of Earth. He's still having that thing going on, so therefore, there's no Freezer to cause mischief in the main Universe 7. But a byproduct from all of this is that the situation on Earth is far less worrisome because Vegeta's no longer worrying about Freezer suddenly returning. In fact, there's no really bad stuff happening at all. It's all rosy. They're all just chilling out on Earth. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that things are entirely hunky-dory. There are some things going on unbeknownst to our heroes, but we'll get to that in a little bit. We are going to be involving something with another bad guy who recently came to the fore in another byproduct of Dragon Ball. For now, as we enter part 13 of What If Raditz Turn Good, all is at peace. We are now down at the island retreat of the Briefs family, where not only Goku, Raditz, and Vegeta are training, but also Goten, Trunks, and Ranch as well, because again, as everything is pretty much hunky-dory, they can pretty much do whatever they want to do. The main reason why the kids are there is that Ranch is really keen to try and test out her new power after the Zenkai boosts of the tournament, and to really kind of inform her best pals about what they can do as well. And her two cohorts are very much keen to try out the Super Saiyan 3 power that she'd been holding back from them. Even though Ranch promised herself she'd never use it again because it pretty much ate up all of her hubris. Then again, had she actually mastered it properly and gave it the time of day, she might have been able to win against Khalifla. And I think she knows that this isn't the last time she's going to see Khalifla. But then suddenly, Bulma gets a call on her wristwatch. Now, in the original timeline, it's from Trunks, but this time, I get the feeling it would be from Dr. Briefs. Apparently, someone broke in and stole the Dragon Balls that she'd been collecting. It turns out that it was some goons who just so happened to be wearing armor similar to Lord Frieza. But that doesn't make any sense. Freezer's no longer here. So who would be trying to mimic Freezer then? But before we continue with that, we gotta go a few months back to the point why they're even there in the first place. In the realms of space, the remainder of the Freezer force are just drifting around trying to hatch a brand new plan. Even though the fact that Sorbet and Tagoma, they failed their expedition, they feel the time is right to do it again. But this time, it's being led by Berry, Blue and Kikano, the characters that you may recognize from the main Broly movie. They've been finding it really tough because now they have no figurehead that's really worth speaking of. They've been having a tough time trying to gather new material and new soldiers for the Freezer Force because there's no figure, not even Sorbet. Sorbet had like some good influence, but Berry Blue and Kikono, they didn't exactly create inspiration or intimidation. That being said, due to the fact that they're more keen to keep the soldiers that they have instead of offering them for no good reason, it means that the numbers that they have is similar to what we actually have in the Broly movie, because, you know, they're still around. Berry Blue and Kikano are coming up with a contingency plan because they're thinking about the Earth Dragon Balls. They could go and get them again, but just in case they can't, or maybe if the Earthlings are anticipating their next move and they'd be able to off them instantly, they might need to get another leader. Kikano's trying to figure out who on earth could be just as intimidating and formidable as Lord Freezer. But Berry Blue isn't all that worried. She's got someone in her mind that might do the job just perfectly. Even better than Lord Freezer, maybe. His brother, Kula. Kula? Masako, you're bringing Kula into the mix? Well, how? Well, like Cooler said in the Super Dragon Ball Hero special, if his little brother can do it, then so can he. 
Besides, if Broly can be brought into the main timeline, then why can't Kula? I mean, come on. It's so obvious that the next material for the next Dragon Ball movie is going to be about Kula. Berry Blue knows exactly where to look for Kula because she pretty much raised Freezer and Kula from when they were little kids. She knows exactly what they're thinking and where would they go. And they managed to locate him deep on a Dust Bowl world where he basically created a personal exile, waiting for the moment when he can next strike next and claim his spot next to Freezer, or maybe usurp him. The reason why I think this is because where we find him in the fifth movie of DBZ. He's basically just stalking about on a throne on a nearby Dust Bowl of a planet. I think that's where he is right now. This all changes when Berry Blue approaches the planet and Cooler recognizes her instantly. And it's not really like, oh my dear darling Berry Blue, oh how I missed you, I just missed you so much. No, it's just curiosity. The mood is cordial enough though. Berry Blue and Kikuma request an audience with Lord Cooler and ask him to represent the Freezer Force as a figurehead for the organization. A figurehead of the Freezer Force? Are you serious? No, 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 this will not do. Is Freezer back somehow? What does he want to do? Ridicule his older brother for not accomplishing anything? Cooler's piercing stature and intimidating look scares Kikuno even more than it would do for Lord Freezer. But Berry Blue isn't here to argue. She doesn't really care about what the force is called or who is doing what. She just wants to activate her plan. And if Cooler wants to call it the Cooler Force or be the main Grand Supreme Leader, then whatever. And with that, Cooler basically plays himself good. And with that begins a massive campaign drive to recruit new members for the newly founded Cooler Force. And thanks to Cooler's much more demure and much more sophisticated look, he actually strikes a sense of admiration, much like his father did. Cooler is a lot like King Cold in a way. And even though the actual campaign is less intense than it would be for his brother, it's just as effective because he actually knows how to handle people. With all of these planets under their control as well as their resources, they're able to recruit a massive batch of ships and really get their tentacles out into the universe even faster. Oh, well, okay, what about the plan for the Earth Dragon Balls then? Are they gonna wish Freezer back somehow? Well, yes, Cooler is on board with this plan. Or so it seems. Well, all right, what about Cooler's power then? Isn't it a little bit tiny in comparison to Golden Freezer's? Well, yes. You do have a point there. Whilst talking and getting up to speed with what's been going on, Cooler finds out about the Golden Freezer form via Kikuno and how powerful it is. And Cooler is really curious to get a piece of that action then to get Golden Cooler. How did his brother achieve it? Well, it was just due to that training thing. Really? How primitive. But he's not above trying to get stronger. And if his brother was able to do it, then so can he. Either way, Cooler does see the point in getting stronger in order to really get his grasp fully tight on Universe 7. So thusly we get the training period, with Cooler being much more effective than his brother because he's actually willing to put in the effort, unlike his brother. We return to the present day and Cooler is just about ready to head to Earth to gather the main Dragon Balls. Chila and Lemo still get assigned to one another and they're still targeting Planet Vampa because there is still a very big power there because all of the establishing thing from the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie, that still takes place because all of the events of the Raditz Turn Good scenario, it all just kind of kicks off at the beginning of the Raditz saga. Broly is brought back to Cooler's ship and the exchange between Cooler, Broly and Paragus is pretty much the same with Cooler willing to comply Paragus' efforts to get revenge on Vegeta. And Vegeta's whole thing with Freezer, it's a really big curiosity to Cooler because he does want to meet the Saiyans that managed to best his brother. And so the stage is set for the battle on Earth. Now with the peril seemingly not as great as it is in the original movie, I feel that the kids would be here as well because they're just going off to get the last Dragon Ball. It can't be all that bad and if it's just two tiny little weak goons, even the kids will be able to test them. However, the goons do find the last ball and Cooler's ship as well as the rest of the force are summoned to Earth's atmosphere. This catches the attention of Goku, Vegeta and Raditz and pretty much anyone else that can sense energy. Feels like freezers but it's a little different somehow, more refined, more mature. Cooler, Paragus and Broly step out of the ship and Cooler gathers the last remaining Dragon Ball just like Freezer did, but for now, he's willing to watch the battle between Broly and Vegeta. Now like in the original, Vegeta has the upper hand for the long time. We go through the transformations of Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, 
and then ultimately we get to see Super Saiyan 4 Vegeta versus Broly. He can really show how he's been able to refine Super Saiyan 4 even more than he did in the tournament. Cooler is keen to watch even more so, and then entrust the Dragon Balls to Kikuno for safekeeping later on. He's playing along, but eventually, I get the feeling that Cooler will want to wish for something himself. He's not going to bring his brother back, he's going to get immortality. Power and everlasting life, something that his brother never achieved. Ha! Vegeta is beginning to flag majorly. He's not weakened or anything, but he's losing energy fast, and I get the feeling that this would be the point in the story where Raditz steps in without Vegeta's request. Vegeta, battered and bruised, curses Raditz's intervention and impudence, and once again trying to outwit the principal Saiyans. But having said that, deep down, he's actually quite grateful for Raditz's interruption because now he can actually try and regain some stamina and then go back for round two. Raditz goes straight into his ace form. If Super Saiyan won't work against Broly now, then it's time to pull out the Super Saiyan God power. We then get to see for the first time Super Saiyan God Raditz. Broly is then exposed to Raditz's God Key and is sent hurling into the realms of ice and almost succumbs to the watery depths. But this was a big mistake. It unlocks the wrathful form of Broly and much like we see in the original movie, Raditz is now on the back foot again. It catches Raditz's attention, but he still feels like he's got enough power in reserve. After all, he still has mastered blue. He then calls out to Goku. Brother, I get the feeling that you've been missing out. Why don't you come in and have a go? Goku doesn't need telling twice. Goku then does his thing going all the way up to Super Saiyan Blue, including the God Hold thing trying to convince Broly to be a good guy again, and then we all know that that doesn't work. And then of course we then get the, uh, how do I put it delicately? The ice bath. Piccolo communicates with Goku and asks what's going on. Goku's been really flagging, and the fact that Raditz and Vegeta are just dawdling around, why are they doing that? What's going on? Goku hatches the plan to get the three of them out of there so they can then regroup and try something different. Now, if you're wondering where the kids are, Whis and Bulma pretty much told them to go home. And I think at this point, they're not going to be told twice because it's looking pretty dire. Raditz then comes back in to team up with Goku and both of them going blue, with Raditz then going up even further to mastered blue. Cooler is getting impatient. He is bored of this fight and just wants to go back and use the Dragon Balls. He turns to Paragus asking whether Broly can get any stronger, and when finding out that he can't, Cooler just basically offs him with a, you know, with a beam. If you do not come down and end this, you are going to end up the same way as your father. Now instead of Frieza trying to be conniving or deceitful or going, oh no, Broly, like he did so hilariously in the movie, no, Cooler's just going to get to the point, and it's going to backfire badly for him later. Seeing his father's motionless body, Broly then powers up to full power Super Saiyan like he does in the original, and things are not looking good for our heroes. Vegeta has had enough. He powers back up to Super Saiyan 4 again despite not having full stamina, and the three of them are then frantically trying to fight up against Super Saiyan Broly. This is all going really, really badly for them, but they then decide to actually head off to Piccolo and then set Broly on Cooler because Broly, Broly doesn't care who he's fighting. He just wants to fight someone now. But hey, we at least get to see Golden Cooler. How does that fare up? Not very well, like his brother. The three Saiyans head off to Piccolo. They regroup and decide to now think about the fusion dance. Raditz and Goku don't hesitate to use Goditz once again because it's a tried and tested formula and is more than strong enough now with the power of blue. But Vegeta then uses this moment to pipe up and says that he will not be sidelined again. He does not care what he has to do so long as he gets to fuse with one of them. Whatever this fusion thing entails, he promises to do it with Raditz. Why would Vegeta want to fuse with me? Why? But then Goku just gives him the look of saying, you know, this could be good for your friendship. Raditz then comes along to the idea, especially with the fact that it involves Vegeta doing a really silly dance. So Raditz, Raditz is going to have a lot of fun watching that. And after various failed attempts, because Vegeta, you know, he still is learning, Raditz and Vegeta fuse successfully into a brand new Saiyan entity, Radjita. Goku gives Rajita a lift back to the battlefield and offers to assist him if things get pretty gnarly, but Rajita is pretty confident that he'll be able to take the beast on no problem. With the skill and calculated tactics of Vegeta as well as the sheer bravado and shrewdness of Raditz, Rajita is a very formidable Saiyan, much less showy than Goditz, but actually just as effective, if not more so. Rajita has an answer to Broly every step of the way. We go through the original base form, Super Saiyan, Super Saiyan 2, but where do we go next? Because Raditz has blue and Vegeta has four, 
Well, we get Super Saiyan 4, but with a little bit of a twist. It has a very different key. It's like the blue key around blue Raditz, but it's the Super Saiyan 4 being of Vegeta. It's like a variation of Super Saiyan Rage in a way, but just with 4, but it's still Super Saiyan 4, just given a, a godly boost. This powerful fighter is just about to finish Broly, but Chile is able to get the wish, saving Broly and sending it back to Planet Vampa. When the dust clears, Raijita finds Cooler and is about to finish him off, but Cooler stops them before they do so. He is very impressed by this fusion form and wants to fight them again someday with his golden form. He will be training and the next time they meet, it won't be as one-sided. Meanwhile, Chile and Lemo are setting up their new digs on Planet Vampa with Broly, but just as they're doing so, Goku shows up, along with Raditz this time. I get the feeling that Raditz would be quite curious to see what Goku's up to, and what this new Broly person is like, because it's another low-class Saiyan, or at least a non-elite Saiyan. It's someone to relate to in Raditz's eyes. Not to mention, it's a Saiyan who's actually taller than Raditz. That's a real oddity indeed. When they depart, they both promise to train alongside Broly in the future, and his integration into the main team as well as the fold of friendship is pretty much guaranteed. Let's presume that some time has passed between the latest part of Raditz turn good, whatever it is, pre-GT. Over this time, Vegeta has become much less prickly since the days of part 10, where he had reached full rage mode and fought Raditz with that classic Super Saiyan 4 vs Blue duel, which ended in a draw, and was then the beginning of the reparations between Raditz and Vegeta, their relationship. By now, things have cooled down a lot, and the prince is now looking for a way to redeem himself without seeming nothing like his character, like he's a simpering coward. <laughs> kind of like Raditz, am I right? He has a good idea which he pitches to the kids. Well, I say kids, they're now like in their teens, and unlike the main storyline, they're actually going to age up, instead of being forever toddler-sized, like the original. Vegeta proposes that he will train the three of them together, as they seem to come in a package. I hate to split you up, because quite clearly, you can't seem to exist without each other. Trunks is getting very bashful, and Ranch is prickling up at the thought of being codependent. But Goten gets what Vegeta is trying to go for. I mean, this is Goten, of course. He can see the best in almost anyone. Guys, relax! Vegeta is serious. He wants to help. Don't you, Mr. Vegeta? Ugh, first off, you can drop the Mr. Routine. It's not becoming for the principal Saiyans. That being said, Vegeta does appreciate the good word from Kakarot's kid. And so, Vegeta begins to train the three children. But, in his own way, he will teach them the power of Super Saiyan 4, and ensure that his way of learning things will carry down to the next generation. Yeah, he may be feeling better towards Raditz nowadays, but that doesn't mean the desire to be the better fighter and being the top dog of all the Saiyans hasn't disappeared. That's still there. However, it's becoming clear that despite his support, Goten throughout all of this isn't really adjusting well to Vegeta's style of training. After a few weeks, Vegeta calls him out on it, but doesn't act nastily. Hey Goten, I think it's time you went to train with Kakarot. What? But Mr. Vegeta, I can do it! I told you to drop the Mr. Act! I can tell that you're only training with me because your friends are. The last thing I want you to be is a suck-up, like Raditz can be. Ranch throws him an ugly look from behind. Go and train with your dad. I can tell you would be much better suited to his training. Be true to yourself and do what you want to do, instead of doing what others want to do. Goten looks a little surprised, but deep down, the guy is right. He had been struggling with the ideas of Vegeta's training and Super Saiyan 4. It didn't feel right to him for some reason. Goten thanks Vegeta for his honesty and apologizes to Ranch and Trunks for wasting their time, but they both hug him and tell him it's okay. They look forward to hanging out with him afterwards and seeing what you know, the results are of his training and see how it compares. And with that, Goten heads off to train with Goku, and of course sometimes Raditz, and Ranch and Trunks continue their progression to Super Saiyan 4 with Vegeta. Over the years that follow, Ranch and Trunks' relationship blossoms into a full-blown boyfriend-girlfriend affair, with Vegeta's ulterior motive for training them coming to the fore. Becoming quite clear, he can keep an eye on the two of them and make sure that nothing funny happens, and also make sure his son behaves in a way best suited to the son of the Prince of All Saiyans. 
it goes to show that ultimately Vegeta does care about his kid and maybe his possible future daughter-in-law. Still, that would mean he'd be brothers of sorts with that tall oaf Raditz. Oh, Vegeta shudders to think of that. But what he doesn't shudder at is the aptitude of his two students. Ranch and Trunks are able to toughen up, and when they are then exposed to the Butts Wave Cannon to coax Super Saiyan 4 out of them, they are able to transform. Ranch with a little more ease thanks to the fact that she had her tail already. And when they gaze upon their Super Saiyan 4 forms for the first time, they are amazed and also freaked out by the abundance of hair all over them. Oh please, says an unimpressed Vegeta, also in the form. Is that your only concern? Give me a break. Vegeta then tells them to keep this part of the training a secret. He doesn't want anyone to know that these two can transform into Super Saiyan 4 just yet. He wants to wait for the right moment to reveal it to really grind Raditz's gears. This time for more playful purposes rather than just for pure malice. Progress, I guess? As the kids become adults, their personalities change slightly. As Goten and Trunks grow up, they still sort of revert to what they are like in the original timeline in the end of Z, with Trunks growing a little bit more reserved and respectful, and Goten becoming much more confident, playful, loud. And in fact, Goten is even more playful now that he's been given more opportunities to show off his own identity for once. Not to mention the fact that Raditz sort of encourages all of this, and he's being nurtured quite well in that regard. And as for Ranch, her mother's side has definitely given her the drive to show her strength, as well as her good looks. She has become quite assured of herself, as well as tall, that she got from her father. She's basically shot right up to being almost as tall as Raditz, about six foot tall or so, towering over most of the dragon team. Except for her dad and Piccolo, of course. Her personality has changed a little too. With age has come a more eccentric mood when not in battle. She's basically acting a little more like her father in terms of being a goofball, but thanks to the influence of Vegeta and Launch, she can be serious and gets what she wants whenever she needs to. With Trunks, she knows how to push his buttons and get him going. Okay, let's get to the end of Z proper. World Martial Arts Tournament is upon us, and by this time, Pan has now become a little girl and is taking part in the contest with Grandpa Goku, looking to maybe train her much more seriously nowadays if she does well in the tournament. Raditz has actually backed off a little in this time in the last couple of years, really gelling well with all of this peacetime. He still likes to train, sure, but he would go and have some more fun with his sons Daikon and Muli, who are now in their teens and love spending time with their dad. The three of them often go on trips around the planet, having fun, not having any cares, despite Launch wanting Raditz to get a proper job, of course. When the tournament comes, the boys fail to make the top 16, thanks to their unlucky matching, which saw Daikon being beaten by big sister Raj, who would never hold back, and Muli up against Pan. But it's his sensitive nature that causes this. He let his five-year-old cousin win just to be nice. We get to the top 16, which sees Pan win against Wild Tiger like in the original, Goku wins over Raditz, and Vegeta getting through as well. Captain Chicken, thankfully, also gets through. And there's also a couple of extra guests. Khalifla, Kaba, and Kale have come to take part as well. Khalifla instigated this trip as she wanted to fight Ranch again and beat her for the second time in a row. Thanks to that Saiyan pride and all and growing rivalry between them. You know, that stuff we talked about in part 12. They meet in the top 16 clash and Khalifla wins. Wait, Masako, doesn't Ranch know Super Saiyan 4? Surely she could have won, right? Well, yes, in theory she could. But remember, she had promised to keep this power a secret. Vegeta had told her not to reveal it yet, and so she would respect that and not use it. Also, she didn't resort to Super Saiyan 3 either, as she promised herself that she would never use it again after what happened. But Khalifa did, and therefore she won thanks to Ranch simply restricting herself. As we get to the final, we are then down to Vegeta versus Goku, with Vegeta having beaten Khalifa and Goku winning over Pan, not wanting to hold back, but still going a little bit easy since he didn't want to upset Gohan. In this final, we get the ultimate battle, which the crowd absolutely love. It's a 
pretty intense tussle which sees Vegeta come out on top and win the fight because he gets to use Super Saiyan 4 and Goku doesn't have access to Ultra Instinct, so therefore his blue power could only go so far. We then get to the grand final between Vegeta and Mr. Saturn. Now, like in the original, there is an understanding between the Dragon Team and Mr. Saturn that would see him carrying on to win the tournament forever in exchange for favours or cash, all until the day the champ wished to retire and pass on the crown to somebody else, if you know what I mean. Unfortunately for him, Vegeta had no intention to follow this trend. In the grand final, Vegeta wins within a matter of three seconds. The crowd are aghast. What just happened? Mr. Saturn gets up and walks over to Vegeta, looking furious. Hey, what do you think you're doing, huh? I, I thought we had an agreement. As if I'd agree to something so demeaning. I'm actually doing you a favor, pal. Vegeta then turns to face Mr. Saturn, who is quivering with anger. If you come back and win next time, people will love you even more. You'll be the underdog. And if you get somebody else to agree to your little understanding, the crowd will herald their savior's return to glory even more than you just constantly winning. You'll be more popular than ever. Mr. Saturn thinks for a moment and beams. Oh, why, yes, that's a good idea. I'll do that. Thanks, Vegeta. You're so smart. Vegeta ignores the compliment and just sinks off to collect the prize money and trophy. Meanwhile, Bomber and Chi Chi are lamenting Vegeta's defiance despite the paycheck, whilst Launch and Raditz are in hysterics watching Mr. Satan fall to Vegeta like that. That had been the best thing that they'd seen all day. And that was even after seeing a grown man in a chicken suit being tossed out of the ring by a little girl, Pan. Related to that, Launch congratulates Pan by saying, <laughs> You made your great ants day with that one, kid. I salute you. Goku feels that Pan did very well out there also. So well, in fact, that he offers to train Pan full on from now on. Take it up a notch. But here comes another twist. Pan declines Goku's offer. She would much rather be trained by her cool aunt, Ranch. Ranch and Trunks whip around in surprise, but Pan is certain in what she wants. You are so cool out there, I want to be cool too! Ranch then blushes. Yeah, I, I, I guess I'm pretty cool. Trunks, being the nice guy that he is, backs this up by saying Ranch is indeed pretty awesome. And Ranch sees through this though, and knows that her boyfriend is only saying this so that he might get some later. She is totally getting Trunks flustered and teasing him to no end. She's in total control here. Trunks is beat red right now and covers Pan's ears, who is totally unaware of the situation by the way. And throughout all of this, Goku is a little confused and even a little sad. Goten then comes over to cheer him up, trying to comfort him by saying that, don't worry, he will train with him even more and together they could get really strong. This does perk Goku up and the two of them hug it out. Gohan is then worried that Pan might end up bothering Ranch, but Ranch isn't that worried. She gets on well with Pan and the two seem to already be clicking. Khalifla asserts this too. <laughs> You're gonna have a blast. <laughs> Maybe next time they come visit, I'll spar with you both and probably win again. Ranch doesn't take too kindly to that. So to try and gain some cool points with Pan, she decides to show the kid a secret. Something she wasn't supposed to share, but now wants to, especially if the two of them are gonna be training together. She wants to be honest with her potential new student. Naturally, Pan wants to know this secret as adorably as possible. And with Ranch being subject to her cuteness, obliges, showcasing the Super Saiyan 4 power by powering up to it epically in a corner of the tournament grounds. Ranch then exposits the properties of the power to Pan, saying that if she trains hard and once her body is fully ready for the powers of 4, she could have this power too someday. And this just makes Pan all the more excited to practice with her. Pan then promises Ranch that she will do her very best and not let her down. Now, just as Ranch powers back down, Raditz rounds the corner, having sensed this Super Saiyan 4 power, but mistaking it for Vegeta as he has no idea about Ranch having this power too. She affirms this supposition and tries to brush off the comment. And with that, Raditz then suggests the three of them go and get some ice cream as he's now pretty bored. He also took Launch's wallet, so it's free ice cream too. But she then finds out and is running after them pretty angrily. We part company with the group as Raditz hurriedly grabs Ranch and Pan under his arms and carries them away. 
Dan Dan, who is I am part of this story? Now, if that little bit of a ditty, that opening little ditty, didn't give you any clues as to what the subject matter of this video is going to be today, then allow me to enlighten you. The What If Raditz timeline has been a long one, with Ranch's birthday actually coming up. July the 10th for your calendars, so you know. Two years almost. Either way, the story has been going ever since Raditz came to Earth, saw his way through Z, well into Super, come together with Vegeta in the Broly movie, I mean literally together with that fusion Rajita. Yeah, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? And then, well, we don't know really. We never really got to the end of Z because we don't know. We've been wanting to find out. But don't worry, I will have a separate video for you all at a later date with some special visuals and voiceover. That will explain in detail some points that we will cover today, which is going to take place in the world of Dragon Ball GT, but with some extras attached because we know some things now that we didn't when the original run of Dragon Ball GT came out originally in 1996. I am going to treat GT for the time being until the main timeline goes past age 789 and properly overwrites GT's timeline as if it were the de facto future of the What If Raditz universe, but with the addition of elements that we got in Super, such as Beerus and Whis, God Key, as well as all the powers that we witnessed in that series thus far, including Rajita, you know, the fusion of Raditz and Vegeta and maybe Ultra Instinct, who knows? I just thought I would include all of this at the start so to keep you in the loop. So for those of you who are familiar with the GT plot, we will do our best to tidy it up, improve it a little bit. And for those of you who aren't, then um, prepare yourselves. Five years have passed since the 28th World Martial Arts Tournament at the end of Z, where we saw a lot of interesting things happen in that tournament, which I will explain in a future video in great detail. But what I can give you in a summary is that we get to see what adult Goten, Trunks and Ranch can do and also, here's the kicker, Goku doesn't leave or go anywhere since Oob isn't a thing. We open up proceedings in the world of r, &R GT with a cinematic sparring on Earth instead of the lookout. This isn't between Oob or Goku because Oob is gone or never existed. It's actually between Goten and Goku in the mountains. Goten stepped up and offered to train more with his dad at the 28th tournament, and the two of them really hit it off and realized that, hey, they're pretty good training with each other. It really made Goku realize that his family is pretty awesome, and that Goten was a really good sparring partner, since, really, he was basically like him in many ways. As these two are duking it out in their base forms, Raditz is watching the entire thing, not very keen to join them this time. He is pretty contented though. I mean, this has been the longest run of peace on earth that he can remember. Granted, things were a little dull, but it meant that he could relax, something that he could never do during his formative years as part of the freezer force. This whole scenario, it's you know, a breath of fresh air. Here, in this timeline, he's got a family, he's got a brother who's pretty strong and pretty cool, but he knows that he is in a way stronger. Now remember, Raditz knows mastered Super Saiyan Blue, and even though Goku has actually tapped into Ultra Instinct you know, during the Tournament of Power, he has never been able to use it since that day. So as far as the elder brother is concerned and likes to point out many, many, many times, he is better and they're so there. Despite not wishing to intervene in this father-son bonding, Raditz looks entertained by just watching the two testing their limits. Well. As much as you can test your limits in your base forms, you know, without destroying everything around them and causing natural disasters. It's a good thing they don't use blue around here. I mean, I want some excitement, but not like this. After all is said and done, they decide to take a little break. Goku casually suggests that with all of this peacetime, the three of them haven't been to visit Dende for a long time. There's just been no need to do so. Yeah, you, know, you should probably go and say hi at least. It can't be much fun with Vegeta being the only one that comes to visit so often. Well, it's not so bad, Dad. Trunks and Raj are there too. They at least know how to socialize. Raditz snorts loudly in approval. Any job of Vegeta is cool when he's not around. The three Saiyans then make their way to the lookout to visit Dende. However, when they get there, they are met with a surprising bit of company. They discover that they are not alone there. People they haven't seen for quite a while, actually. Pilaf and Shu are also there. I mean, sure, they have been seen around Capsule Corp much more because, you know, they were there during Super when they were kids, but lately they had just, you know, vanished. Only Mai stuck around, 
these two just didn't show up to work one day ages ago and no one really chased it up because, you know, it's peel off and shoe. Now, since they've grown up a bit since the days of Super, these two are now in their late teens and they're pretty angsty and rebellious. Mai didn't really want to participate in the gang's activities anymore. She much rather wished to just stay at Capture Corp as it paid well, provided security, as well as being close to Trunks. The love triangle might be strong with this one. She even took up training in the gravity chamber, slowly but surely. I mean, it's not produced massive gains yet, but it meant that she didn't need peel off and shoe anymore for support. You know, she could hold herself together. Ugh, initiative? Ugh, that's not the peel off way. This action left the two of them pretty bitter. Where was her drive to get the Dragon Balls? We've been together for decades and now you just give up? Huh, fine. They don't need her anyway. Goodbye forever. You know how moody teens can be. So Pilaf and Shu came to try and persuade Mr. Popo and Dende to tell them about the legend of another pair of Dragon Balls that were even more powerful. But they are then met by the three Saiyans who then witness how Pilaf and Shu now look pretty, uh, goofy looking. Seeing these two in their punkish attire, Raditz just simply has to make a comment on their teenage angst, which greatly angers Pilaf. Wow, it's a good thing Ranch didn't go through that. I wouldn't have been able to stop laughing with how ridiculous she would look. <laughs> Pilaf is absolutely livid at being made a fool of. You know, not being taken seriously. But he knows that the Saiyans are way too powerful for them to deal with head on. For now, they're just gonna sulk in silence. Meanwhile, Goku asks Dende if he and Goten can try some training in the Room of Spirit and Time, since there are only a few places on Earth that can give them the luxury of sparring in their transformed states. Dende reluctantly agrees, but tells Goku that they will be tasked with fixing anything on the lookout if anything happens. Goku's curious as to his stubbornness. Oh, I mean, sorry Goku, I don't mean to be like this, but it's just... You know, that Vegeta and his pupils, they've been wrecking the place a couple of times a month. It's just so much effort rebuilding this place. You know, everything the way it was, only for them to just blow it up again. I can only do so much, Goku. Just please, promise me, will you go easy? Sadly, Goku isn't listening. He's just hearing that Vegeta has been here frequently. Before they go in, Goku goes Super Saiyan Blue, with Goten transforming in kind. Also going blue. Between Super and the end of Z, Goten was gifted by Goku training with Beerus and Whis, and so he eventually got to handle Blue. Raditz also decides to join in for a training session, something that Dende sadly didn't anticipate. And as you can imagine, a three-way Saiyan duel causes massive damage, including blowing a hole in the lookout's vault. Pilaf uses this distraction to his advantage. This has caused quite the distraction, and he discovers a chest with a red dragon head on the lid. This was the legend that he was looking for. He opens it to discover seven Black Star Dragon Balls. He grins to himself. The Dragon Balls were here? Just in one place? They look a little weird, but still, these are Dragon Balls. They must work the same, right? He wants to prank Goku and Raditz for their hurtful comments earlier. Now, while the three Saiyans are busy fighting, and Dende is now lamenting, again, the work he's going to have to do later, a huge red Shenron appears in the sky. Dende and Mr. Popo know exactly what this is and try to run as fast as they can to call off the dragon, but it's too late. Pilaf has made the wish. He wished for Goku and his oafish brother to be turned into kiddies. And that's what happens. Pilaf starts to roll around in laughter at seeing these once great fighters reduced to pint-sized brats but then gets reminded by Radis's punch to the gut that he didn't really decrease their power that much. It was still pretty potent. This was more of a cosmetic alteration. Dende tells Pilaf that he's a fool. These weren't the real Dragon Balls, these were far worse. Pilaf is in a good mood though, so he humors what Dende has to say. These are Black Star Balls. These balls do not work the same way as the regular ones. They were created by the nameless Namekian before he split into two, and are much more destructive. Sure, you get a wish like the regular balls do, but there are consequences to be had with them. Now, they're scrambled around the universe, not just the world, and if they're not found and brought back to Earth within a year, the world will be destroyed and split into two, and all kinds of nasty things, you know, due to the negative energy that is amassed. The world will go bye-bye. This shocks Pilaf to the core. His teenage angst has gone and it's turned to regular fear. Uh, uh, can't we use the regular Dragon Balls to fix it? 
Dende explains that the regular Dragon Balls cannot interfere with the Black Star ones. They're, they're not strong enough. They are only half as strong with, of course, the negative energy not present. Goku says that, yeah, they really shouldn't worry about this. This should be easy. Bulma can just make another radar and use instant transmission to do the whole thing. Oh, Goku tries to use it and it doesn't work. The balls are too small and too far apart. This isn't just like the Earth or anything. Oh, no matter. They'll just simply gather them back the old fashioned way by going on an adventure. Raditz is exclaiming that they would have to do it twice since there is no way that he's going to be staying this way forever. My height! My precious height! Raditz has forgotten what it's like to look up at people. Now, just as in the original, Goku and Raditz need to find a crew to travel with them into the stars. They find Pan stopping a bank robbery like in the original, with the girl being confused that her grandfather and great uncle have seemingly become so famous somehow that the kids around have actually started to cosplay as them. But then seeing Uncle Goten around them at the same time helps her understand what has just occurred. This is pretty trippy. Also, don't worry. This version of Pan is far less annoying, thanks to Aunt Ranch's influence. I thought I would address that here and now, in case you were fretting that Pan was going to be a jerk like she is in the original. They then bring this news to the rest of the family, with Blonde Launch being particularly amused by Raditz's current state. In this reality, Bulma builds a slightly bigger ship, and this time, Pan gets recruited in place of Ranch, who is, at the time, visiting Universe 6 and training with Khalifa and Kale. You may remember from part 12 of Raditz that Ranch and Khalifa developed a rivalry that Ranch was keen to work on. Trunks and Goten are also going with, you know, Goku and Raditz. You may remember if you watched GT that he was lined up to take over duties of running Capture Corps. Well, that didn't happen since Vegeta upped his training with Ranch. Bulma had to forgo that dream for now. Vegeta and his majestic moustache are tasked with guarding Earth and collecting the regular Dragon Balls just in case that they won't make it back in time in order to use the wish to evacuate people to New Namek as some kind of backup. The race is on. And yes, just like in the original story, a part of the ship falls off which causes them to crash prematurely on planet Emeka. They spend the night at a hotel where they are charged a lot and the local authorities scavenge their ship. Also, a robot called Giru steals the dragon radar. You know, same old, same old. Raditz is nearly ready to blast the annoying little can to pieces, but Goku stops him because, you know, he's oh so trusting. Instead of Giru, Raditz takes his anger out on the Emekin army, and since our characters are much more powerful in this continuity, logic is not really much of a challenge. Mind you, he wasn't too much of a challenge in the original one because Goku could have easily gone to Super Saiyan had the writers decided to. Now appreciating the power of the Saiyans in this state, he allows them to overthrow his greedy leader, Don Ki. The Saiyans can continue their journey. They spare Trunks the humiliation of being Princess Trunks in this reality. Goten uses his diplomatic skills to learn that Zunama, the monster, is not fully in control of the earthquakes that he is causing. So he asks the townsfolk just to forgive Zunama's actions. Oh, Goten, you're such a precious cinnamon bun, even as an adult. I love this version of Goten, not the one that likes to call people up all the time. The grateful townsfolk give them the first Black Star Dragon Ball. But you know what's coming. Boom, para para. They steal one of the Black Star Dragon Balls. But Goku and friends get another one, luckily, on Bihei. The trio then attempt to hypnotize the group, but they then get beaten up by Raditz before they even actually started their dance properly. No, none of that. I'm having Universe 2 flashbacks! You could tell right about now that with Raditz being here and his cautious nature and vivid memory and personality, it sorts out a lot of GT's oddities really quickly before they can even spread and become ridiculous. The brothers reveal to our heroes everything that they know about the lewd cult in exchange for Raditz not hitting them again. They decide to tie them up and deliver them to Cardinal Muchi Muchi, who turns them into dolls and throws them to lewd. Our heroes then win with ease without Doll Taki being creepy with Pan. And instead, he escapes right away, warning General Rildo of the Saiyans. Rildo thanks Doltaki for telling him and executes him for his failure. What a lovely reward. The Z Fighters are now heading to M2, Giro's home planet, unaware of the trap that was set for them by Rildo. Now, at the same time on Earth, Vegeta discovers that something weird is starting to happen with their set of Dragon Balls. This isn't supposed to happen. They're starting to hum and emit a faint glow of some sort. Our radical heroes are on the way to the planet designated as M2, the whole planet of Giru, their new robotic companion who seems to grind Raditz's gears. 
This is all in order to take a break on their way to gather Black Star Dragon Balls, as well as provide Giru a chance to reminisce. And for Raditz's sake, hopefully they can just leave him on one and then skedaddle. There is something amiss when they land. Everyone is quite surprised to find the planet almost entirely deserted. There doesn't seem to be any signs of life here, despite the seemingly man-made structures that litter the landscape. As they venture around the area they landed in, Raditz remarks that this is giving him chilling flashbacks to the times when he himself was doing dirty work for Lord Freezer. By the time they were done with these worlds, they would have these like sort of eerie winds that seem to only arrive when life had ceased on these worlds. This feels just like that. Meanwhile, everything that Giru sees is being transmitted to General Rildo, which he finds extremely illuminating. He especially takes an interest in Raditz. Huh, there's no mistaking that here, as he spies on the group some more. He sends the Sigma Force after them. Now we know what you're thinking. Masako, come on! The Sigma Force posing a problem to our group? There's five of them, two more than in the original. And for the most part, you would be right. Except in this continuity, we had a little thing called the Tournament of Power happen before this timeline. And things did change accordingly. So, for the purposes of this scenario, let's say that General Rildo and his master had a mysterious ally who held a grudge against Universe 17. A grudge which came at the cost of their own universe, and they were keen to settle the score outside of the confines of the tournament grounds, without anyone to stop them. Needless to say, thanks to all this extra support from this as-of-yet unknown benefactor, the five members of the Dragon Team subsequently <laughs> you know, get captured by a successfully well-coordinated attack and plan from this new Sigma Force. And as that's going on, a missing member of this posse is busy off in another part of the Omniverse, building on a friendship stroke rivalry that was formed during the aforementioned tournament, if you may remember. On planet Sadala, our ranch is training with her new friends from this alternate Saiyan home, Khalifla, Kale, and Kaba. It all began after the Tournament of Power, when Khalifla and Ranch began to take an interest in one another, and then fought again at the World Martial Arts Tournament around the time of End of Z, when Pan was about five years old. In that tussle, Khalifla won again, but Ranch was keen to follow Khalifla back to Universe 6 and train with them so that they can get stronger and she can break Khalifla's winning streak without having to resort to Super Saiyan 4 and cheating. In that time also, she befriended Kale and Kaba, so as to ease any awkward feelings that Kale may have, and Kaba, he just seemed like a nice guy, you know? Since the Tournament of Power, the inhabitants of Planet Sadala have started to unlock greater potential within themselves, thanks to the efforts of Kaba and company, much to Shampa's delight. He had instructed the three of them to do this by shouting at them after the tournament, I want more Super Saiyans! Gimme, gimme, gimme! After all this time, his sweet, sweet mortal level was going up and the pressure was being taken off of him. So, this would mean he can slack off even more and not have to lose weight. Perfect. Now with more free time, Biles and Champa often attend matches when Ranch is in town. The fat cat is pretty intrigued by this whole Super Saiyan 4 thing that Vegeta showed in the tournament, and Ranch had now perfected this herself. And he then demands the Universe 7 Saiyan to teach Khalifla the same trick. His own Super Saiyan 4 fighter? Wow! Even more free time was on the cards, perhaps! However, it's not going to be easy to get the guest to comply. You see, Ranch is very much aping her father's tendency to be a little over the top in situations like this. Rubbing people up the wrong way she doesn't like that much. In this example, she's just trying to play dumb just to irritate Shampa, which greatly amuses Vados. After some base form training as well as a smattering of Super Saiyan training, the four decide to have some snacks and relax for a little bit before doing some more training because that's what Saiyans do. The conversation then steers towards Universe 7 and Vegeta. Kaba is curious as to what Vegeta and the others have been up to lately. You know, since the tournament, Vegeta had slowly reduced the amount of times that he got in contact with Kaba. They hadn't really talked that much and it got to the point where they barely communicated at all, which really saddened Kaba. 
And this was, of course, down to the fact that Ranch and Trunks were taking up Vegeta's time training together. Ranch responds that they've mellowed out quite a bit, though, in the last couple of years. Especially Vegeta, since he takes his role as Bra's father very seriously. They all share a bout of laughter at this aside on Vegeta's expense, but are then interrupted by a rather perturbed Vardos, who informs Ranch that she has Vegeta on the line through Whis. Vardos does not take kindly to being used as some kind of telephony device, to which Whis replies, Oh, I've come to accept this as a given at this point. You should probably consider the same, sister. When Ranch comes to the phone, Vegeta explains the situation, that Earth somehow has been put in danger by Black Star Dragon Balls, Raditz and Goku turning into kids, of course, and the uneasy feeling the world is exhibiting presently. Even though Ranch initially giggles imagining her father and uncle as little boys, she feels that she should probably return to her universe just in case. But she doesn't do that with the help of Vardos. Oh no. You see, in the years between r rs version of Super and r rs version of GT, Beerus and Shampa were convinced by some of our heroes from all of the different universes to wish on Super Shenron for a transit network between all 12 universes, which will allow them to visit each other at will, as well as, of course, protecting and aiding other worlds in need much faster than before. It's like some sort of galactic railway network. Every transit point is being guarded by said universe's equivalent of the Galactic Patrol, or in the case of Universe 11, a branch of the Pride Troopers. Khalifa and the others drop her off at the nearest station and Ranch is currently waiting to be transported back to her home universe, unaware of the increasing peril that is befalling her father and uncle. Meanwhile, the Dragon Team members that got captured on M2 are unable to free themselves, as the Sigma Force is able to block their energy and respond to their fighting tactics with an appropriate response and amount of force just as if the machines knew Goku's and Raditz's fighting styles inside and out. They also do pretty well against the likes of Goten and Trunks, and the more they struggle, well, <laughs> it's like a finger trap, the tighter the grip that the robots exert on their prisoners. However, it is Pan who manages to free herself from her cell, not the others. Why is that exactly? Well, it's simply down to the fact that the robots don't really consider her to be that dangerous at all. She's a little girl. Since they don't really have any meaningful data on her as well. And in this binary domain, you are either dangerous or you're not. Pan manages to disable one of the robotic guards and steals its shell to masquerade as a guard and explore the compound before rescuing her allies. Now, of course, this Pan is a little bit more mischievous thanks to Ranch's influence. So she's just wandering around going, beep boop, beep boop, I'm a robot. Yeah, this version of Pan is not annoying like the GT one. Thank you, Ranch. After gaining her bearings and understanding how these robots work, she manages to successfully jump Nat, who is holding Goten and Trunks in his body, and stealthily disables him, freeing those two. Now the three younger Saiyans are free, they are ready to free Goku and Raditz. This time, the Sigma robots are taken by surprise, and are unable to deal with this attack. With Goku and Raditz now free as well, it's safe to say that the Sigma Force now get obliterated completely. Then they are forced to fight Rildo, who is a pretty formidable opponent at the best of times, but with this additional supporter behind him, he is even stronger than before. Goku and Raditz can tell that they can take care of him as a pair, though, with Pan, Goten and Trunks free in going after the Dragon Balls that seemingly are on M2. Due to his ability of controlling the planet's environment, Rildo is a pretty powerful enemy. That is until Goku and Raditz go Super Saiyan Blue on him. In their child forms though, like with most forms of Super Saiyan in the original timeline, you know, we've seen that before, Super Saiyan Blue is much more difficult to pull off, you know, effectively. But like the original forms, once they have actually gone into the form, the stamina curve eases off somewhat. The group then find the balls and manage to find Dr. Mew's laboratory nestled within the planet. They attempt to capture Mew, but he tries to send his prototype creation Baby after them. This experiment seemingly proves to be a damp squib though, as Baby is vaporized, supposedly. Rildo gets destroyed by the combined power of the Som brothers, and the rest unfolds like it does in the original, only with Raditz there as well. The story then proceeds as you could imagine. First, Baby takes over Mew's body, then our heroes find a young alien boy and accidentally deliver him to Pital, where he causes some pretty serious chaos. In all of the ensuing confusion and mayhem, Baby manages to reach Earth, where the monster manages to hop from host to host, first using her Hercule, then coming across Daikon and Muli. 
Daikon is really terrified of his brother's sudden change of mood. And remember people, Muli's the more polite and sensitive one. Daikon then calls Gohan for help. This of course causes Baby to take over Gohan as well, once Muli senses Gohan's overall power. Him being an even better host. Piccolo tries to stop the creature inside his pupil's body, but you know, he's blasted away like he was nothing. Sadly like the original. Now we have the whole Baby Gohan vs Vegeta duel, but Muli instead feels in for Goten in this scenario. But just as the monster is about to jump ship and take control over Vegeta, someone blocks his path, attempting to blast the monster. Sadly, she misses. It is Ranch, who now has the parasite in her. Oh, you will do just fine. Baby then decides that he won't be looking this gifted horse in the mouth, and he then transforms his new host into Baby Ranch, and attempts to spread her infection across the planet. Throughout all of this, our main team are blissfully unaware as to what has gone down on the planet. They have been busy, trying to save it by collecting all seven Black Star Balls again. Goku, Raditz, Pan, Trunks, Goten, and their new tool slash friend Giru are back from space because they have completed their mission with time to spare. They are naturally given to Dende for safekeeping, with the Guardian being extremely grateful for their handiwork. With their work complete, the gang can relax for the first time in what seems like ages. Now the next thing to do would be to make sure that Goku and Raditz could now become adults again. But there's something amiss. The Guardian is under control of the nefarious Baby Ranch, something that our heroes seem to be unaware of at this time. Ranch's mind knowing how to perfectly mimic the mindset of Dende to make sure the illusion is all the more convincing. Before the gang can return home to celebrate and then press on to gather the Earth's Dragon Balls, they get accosted by their own families, who are at the lookout for some reason. Raditz can see Blue Launch looking pretty stoic. That's weird. Something which perturbs the Saiyan immensely. Launch, darling! I didn't expect to, uh, see you here. What are you doing with that thing? Launch doesn't reply. Her chosen means to communicate is to shower the gang with pellets, which is then the cue for the rest of the party to follow suit. Gohan and the twins follow up this bizarre scene by blasting the guys away, but it doesn't quite work. In a crucial moment, the six get saved by Vegeta, who managed to run away from Baby's earlier sojourn. When everything calms down and the gang are hidden for a brief second, Vegeta quietly explains to them that everyone on the planet is under the control of an alien parasite creature and that it has taken over Ranch completely. And in turn, the rest of their friends are her minions. Vegeta was able to barely escape. Baby! Goku looks shocked. You mean that little robot thing survived? How did it get here? This whole thing has gotten Pan and Goku rather inquisitive, concerned, and really wanting to know more. And as the questions get hurled in the prince's direction, there is one member who is seething with anger, sparks flying. Raditz is absolutely seething with rage. He is growling louder and louder with every passing second. His daughter, his firstborn, is now the slave of a creepy experiment they thought to have been destroyed with Dr. Mew. He hates himself for this. He hates Baby. He hates Vegeta. Why didn't he stop this? And why did he hide behind his baby girl? Vegeta can see that Raditz is sparking with fury and can sense what is about to happen next. Yeah, Raditz almost gets into a fight with Vegeta, but our heroes have no time to waste as they are being pursued by their nearest and dearest. Raditz and Vegeta are staring at each other and Vegeta bows his head all of a sudden. I'm sorry, Raditz. This pauses Raditz's anger for a second. The prince apologizing? This is enough to knock anyone out of their red mist. Before anyone can process this, there are two friendly faces which then arrive to provide extra help. They are saved by the likes of Shin and Kibito and are teleported to safety in the sacred world of the Kais. The minions can no longer sense the intruders on the lookout nor have any idea where they've gone. Now with some space between them and their now enemies gone, their group try to figure out what to do. They even consider asking Whis and Beerus for help, but they doubt that they would come to their aid for this. They've been very distant these past few years, choosing not to get involved with any more of the chicanery of the Dragon Team and their troubles after getting it in the neck from the likes of the GP and the Omni King. Whis especially was so keen for the group to become less reliant on them, 
even if it did mean that there were less trips to Earth to sample the delicacies on offer. There were plenty of angelic tears shed that day. That doesn't stop Raditz, though, being any less devastated. And he feels that he can't hurt his daughter, not even if it's being controlled by baby. It's just not possible. Surprisingly, Vegeta compounds the earlier empathy and comforts him, apologizing again for failing her as a teacher and a protector. No, she wouldn't have stood idle. She did what she'd been taught to do all her life to protect the ones that she cares about. If you had been possessed, we would have had no chance of surviving. Vegeta smirks a little at the indirect compliment, but doesn't stop Radis's lament. He wants to hear a bit more complimenting. By doing that, we might be able to save the planet from doom, but... Raditz looks down and tears fall down from his face. His entire family are gone. He just says no more. Nobody does. Not even Shin and Kimbito. And they don't get human emotions, so this is pretty deep. Meanwhile, the Black Star Balls are given to Baby Ranch by the evil Dende, and the dragon gets summoned again to enact her wish, which, like in the original, was to get Planet Plant back. Shin can sense something going down. A planet has suddenly appeared near Earth. Something that shouldn't happen. It shouldn't be possible, unless actioned by either himself or the GP. Kibito can feel this too, and they both look to the direction of the new planet, with the assistant of the Supreme Kai muttering, There is no more time to lose. We have to do something. Now, the Black Star Balls have been used again. The gang snap out of their funk and begin to run through all the possible ideas they have to spare. They first figure out that Super Saiyan Blue would be no good right now, as that would just drain both Goku and Raditz too quickly to do anything meaningful. To ensure that the two Saiyans could be 100% useful, they would need a wish on the Namekian Dragon Balls to bring them back to adulthood. But they've got no time for that. Vegeta then wonders if perhaps the power of Super Saiyan 4 could manage to turn Kakarot and Raditz back into adults, at least temporarily. He knows how to enact it, but they can't easily get back to Capture Corp right now to get to the Bloodswave machine. But then, Raditz disagrees to this idea, choosing not to resort to Super Saiyan 4. Instead, he decides to go together with Goten and Trunks, who would try to buy the rest of the group some time. Maybe the three of them will be able to get through to Ranch and make her snap out of the monster's control. Trunks is particularly determined to make sure this works. His love can't have just let this beast dominate her like that. Kibito allows this bold plan to go ahead, but then states that if there is any chance that any of them could end up being placed under the baby's control, he would either get them out of there before it could happen, or just end them right there on the spot. Meanwhile, Shin leaves the group, telling them that he will try to gather reinforcements, whatever he means by that. I mean, it's better than just standing around here and doing nothing, waiting for things to just pan out like usual. And so the plan begins. They return to Earth with Raditz, Goten, and Trunks confronting Baby Ranch, trying to get her to turn back to normal. But the monster is deeply rooted in her mind. Raditz is pleading desperately for Baby to get out of his daughter, with Baby loving all of this anguish. Oh? You don't like me in your baby girl's body? Well, Raditz, I mean, uh, Papa, I like it in here. Your baby girl is as good as dead. Raditz is using every fibre of his being not to lash out right now, but instead quietly tells the boys to fuse and not hold back. Trunks and Goten choose not to argue with this. It is decided then, it's Gotenks versus Baby Ranch, with Raditz trying to help to the best of his abilities. This childlike body was funny at first, but it's proven to be completely ill-equipped in trying to save the world, and he feels pretty useless right now. In normal circumstances, the fight between Gotenks and Ranch would look quite different, but Baby was able to greatly increase the power of Ranch, so the fused warrior has to not let his guard down at all. Especially when neither Goten and Trunks really want to hurt Ranch. And as that's going down, Goku gets back his tail and tries to train with it for a bit to get himself used to the feeling again, with Vegeta trying to explain Super Saiyan 4 to him. It's like your internal great ape and your normal form merged into one. The primal power unleashed in a more controlled state. Also, you get hairier. I got enough of that vanity from the young ones. I don't need it from you. At the same time, the fusion of Goten and Trunks has been unable to do anything, and thusly splits, leaving them open to Baby Ranch's desires. She is about to absorb them, adding them to the hive. But Raditz rushes into her with full power, 
No more loss! Baby enjoys the irony going on right now and proceeds to toy with Raditz, beating him mercilessly after each power-up. He doesn't get the escape of being absorbed, no. He'll be ended. That is until Vegeta and Goku show up! Feeling a bit outnumbered, Baby Ranch sends her army of minions led by the possessed Daikon, Muli, and Gohan against them, and even mocks Goten and Trunks by having Daikon and Muli fusing into Dali, who is brutally efficient under the monster's control. Goku is unable to turn into Super Saiyan 4 whilst in the middle of this fracas, and the army is ever growing. But Shin is there with the cavalry. Kale, Khalifa, and Kaba are here to help. Kaba helps Goten and Trunks against Dali, while Kale and Khalifa decide to get their friend out of the monster's grasp and take her full attention by, that's right, using. Baby Ranch is losing her advantage as she is now forced to face against Kale, the metamor infusion of Kale and Khalifa as well as Goku and Vegeta. Just then, the possessed Bulma bombards her with blood waves in order to turn her into the golden ape form. Yes, we know that this form is technically before Super Saiyan 4, but let's assume that this is a special Uzaru form created for this continuity. But before the process is completed, Raditz manages to get in the way of the machine and absorbs a ton of waves. So much so, in fact, that he transforms into a golden great ape himself. He grabs Golden Ape Baby Ranch and holds her in a powerful hug. Baby is trying to fight this, but the Azaru has awakened the inner Saiyan nature of Ranch. When she realizes what is happening, the Ranch within her uses all of her mental prowess to fight off the parasite and get it out of her body. At that moment, in the middle of this father-daughter embrace, Baby is expelled. Before he knows what's happened, he is surrounded by a lot of angry Super Saiyans with now a Super Saiyan 4 Ranch and Super Saiyan 4 Raditz leading the charge, who decimate him with a joint key blast, thus freeing everyone from his control. After that, Ranch falls down, exhausted, but it's not over yet. Our heroes have to evacuate everyone and call on the Namekians for help, because the wish on the Black Star Dragon Balls has drastically sped up the boom time. Luckily, they managed to fix the blown up earth, but Goku and Raditz are still stuck as children. But it doesn't matter though. They can always ask Earth's Dragon Balls to help still. But something is weird. They didn't have that weird glow around them before. After the epic showdown with Baby Ranch, the world was keen to get some kind of level playing field going again, as well as actually, you know, locking those Black Star Balls away and not just leaving them out where any little twerp could find them. Raditz and their friends have now had enough with the fact that two of their strongest beings were in pint-sized forms and they all decide to ask the Dragon Balls, the original ones, to turn them into adults again. Now, this should be easy as that one time when a crazy doctor asked Shenron to melt some ice for him. What makes this even easier is the fact they don't need to go looking for them. Vegeta had gotten ahead of the game and gathered the Dragon Balls in advance. I think he was keen to see Raditz and Kakarot adults again. Hmm, <laughs> it's hard being the strongest adult in the room now. And Vegeta was being sarcastic if you couldn't tell. Vegeta did note one peculiarity with the Dragon Balls when he put them together in a neat pile. He hadn't noticed this before. The balls, they kind of lost their glow. They seemed duller than usual. That was odd. Nobody, not even Bulma, could recall that happening before. Well, maybe Shenron wasn't in the mood? Perhaps he too was feeling kind of meh after what happened recently. This was a pitch delivered by Raditz, of course, and everyone sort of rolls their eyes at this. What? Dragons can feel blue sometimes! We don't know what he gets up to when he isn't granting us wishes! Raditz is feeling impatient after being snubbed for his musings and begins to call upon the dragon himself. The odd things get even odder. Instead of the usual dark, inky black sky that is iconic with Shenron, it instead turns a very sickly shade of red. Oh no, it's not that mega evil Shenron from last time, is it? The Black Star Balls in disguise? Well, no, not this time. A moment later, the ground starts to shake and everyone is confused at what appears before them. Nothing like the other dragons they had ever seen in the past. It was a totally different dragon, and this one was carrying a cigar. Ugh, Shenron! Look what that filthy habit's done to you! I knew you should have never spoken with Dr. Breeze about that! Says Sassy Raditz, visibly shaken. Hey, my father's trying to quit- What does this have to do with this anyway? Uh, Shenron, this looks, uh, interesting. C can you grant our wishes, please? Says Bulma very, very timidly. But Pan then pipes up. Guys, Shenron seems kind of weird. 
The dragon is casually taking his time with processing this request. After what feels like hours, he puffs up a smoke ring which was the size of a large elephant in the faces of our heroes, causing them to cough and splutter. He then finally speaks, giving them his answer. Wishes. I have no intention of fulfilling any wishes. <laughs> okay, that was weird. Pan and Ranch are taken aback with the dragon being so callous and ignoring their request. After getting then angry with this lazy beast, and then trying to reason with him, going through all the emotions here, it is becoming clear that something very badly wrong is about to happen. That would make the whole baby thing look like a walk in the park. Before they can even finish another sentence, the Dragon Balls start to float upwards and are then consumed in a storm of wind and black smoke. The seven orbs then combine with the might of the creature and, in a blinding flash, the form scatters into seven smaller objects which then travel around the world. The red sky vanishes, leaving everyone stunned. The only one who could shed some light perhaps into any of this is Whis, as the Kais wouldn't really know since they are relatively detached from the inner machinations of Universe 7. In a fit of curiosity, Whis contacts Goku and the rest of the group to tell them that this is a side effect of the Dragon Balls that was a long time coming. He speaks of the team overusing the power of the Dragon Balls. You see, it's quite strange. The Super Dragon Balls have never done this since, you know, they're so steeped in legend, and thusly have never been worked so hard as your set. Despite the sassy tone in his voice, the gang quickly realise that the Angel's right. They were used too frequently and wished on way too often, mostly due to the fact that the Dragon Radar was a thing, making what was once something that would take decades to achieve something that they could do in a weekend, or even just an hour, which makes Bomber feel pretty guilty. Dang you, fast travel! Goku asks what has happened to the Dragon Balls exactly. Well, they're now dragons. Seven powerful separate dragons, in fact. Goku feels guilty about this whole situation too. Now if I were you, I would probably think about stopping them before they cause even more havoc. Meanwhile, King Kai is grumbling to himself somewhere. <laughs> what am I, chopped liver? Raditz then pipes up and asks the question that everyone was thinking, hopefully chirping. Well, come on, guys. This should be a cinch. Where's my old pal? Head on over here and bop those clowns on the head and tell them to behave, would ya? Raditz seems to be expelling his annoyance at having to stay in this body for a little longer. Oh, as much as I'm flattered at the eloquence of your invitation, I'm afraid this is a matter of consequence. This isn't like the last few times our paths have crossed where you did nothing wrong. No, you brought this on yourself. You mortals in this case will have to deal with the outcomes of your own actions. But me and Lord Beerus believe in you. Good luck! The line disconnects. So that's that then. Goku lets out a deep sigh. They're on their own. And while usually he's up for a challenge like this, Goku doesn't feel too good about this this time around. The gang then propose that they should split up into smaller groups to find the dragons and even assess their power to see if by them splitting into seven dragons, this would make the overall dragon weaker and thusly prove to be small fry in terms of strength. Pan wants to join her favorite aunt despite the protest from Videl and Gohan. Don't worry guys, I'll take care of Pan. It's what I do. So the groups look as follows. Goku and Raditz, Ranch and Pan, Goten and Trunks, Gohan and Piccolo, with Vegeta trying to outdo them all as a solo act. The first creature that is encountered by one of the groups is Hei Shenron, who's spewing out his pollution breath around the place. He doesn't seem very strong though, and is tossed around by Goten and Trunks quite easily, which causes them a great deal of discomfort. Now the creature may be weak, but he's much more durable than they predicted, and takes their punches like a champ. In our version though, he is able to activate his super form after enduring enough punches. His power becomes much greater after this, and he takes Goten and Trunks by surprise. The two young Saiyans then have to resort to Gotenks in order to beat the beast, but they do manage it and get the two-star Dragon Ball now restored to its former glowing glory. It had been repaired. Maybe the other ones would do the same if they're able to win. Meanwhile, Gohan and Piccolo have found out that something has leveled the large portion of the city. Gohan speculates that it might have been caused due to the earthquakes that happened recently, caused by the Black Smoke Shenron. Finally, they spot a mole-like creature way too focused on digging instead of fighting. When he sees the two, he dives into the tunnel and tries to scurry away. Piccolo then tries to focus and locate his power underground. But 
This Naturon Shenron is a much more cunning creature than Piccolo bargained for, and is able to hide its power from the Namekian. Piccolo then has to resort to his now improved hearing, but Naturon is prepared for that too, sending out seismic waves which confuses Piccolo's sense of hearing. As the Namekian's aura feels familiar, Naturon seems drawn to him and uses the opportunity to get the jump on him, and absorbs Gohan's mentor. This causes Gohan to get pretty angry, but he then can feel that Piccolo is still alive inside and in no immediate danger. He needs to think this through though carefully, as Naturon seems to have learned Piccolo's moves whilst absorbing him, and also seems to be accustomed with Gohan's tactics as well, since the pair are so closely linked. He even uses a giant form to grow even more fearsome. Gohan is forced to do an impressive Masenko mouth blast beam struggle, but something then happens that Naturon did not expect to happen. It happened as a special beam cannon shoots out of his own stomach, his lunch coming back to haunt him. Piccolo has managed to free himself, and as the beast is starting to revert to its original form, the teacher and the mentor take him down, earning the seven star Dragon Ball in the process. Pan and Ranch then find Oceanus Shenron, causing trouble and mayhem amongst small fishing villages, forcing the people of the village to worship her in order to be spared. The two Saiyans rush in to battle her, but Oceanus has her impressive wind powers that are able to mess with their ability to fly, as well as deflecting their key blasts. They cannot touch her. Oceanus states that all she wants is to be left alone. She doesn't wish to fight Pan and Ranch, and instead wants to channel her efforts into caring for these villagers. She only wants to be admired, nothing more. Ranch, having a very fresh memory of being recently mind controlled, is having none of that. She knows where this is going. She asks Pan to distract the Dragon Princess while Ranch herself starts to fly very quickly around in the opposite directions to the winds sent by the dragon. This ends up creating a tornado that Oceana struggles to control, her having to cancel out her own windshield in order to fend from Ranch's counter. This allows Pan to get a hit on her, which is then followed by a series of fierce attacks from the pair of them. Oceanus is far from done though as she transforms into her true form and proceeds to channel Black Smoke Shenron's power, threatening to poison the villagers. Pan and Ranch take her down though by the combined power of the Kamehameha and Final Friday, earning them the six star Dragon Ball. So far so good. Now you see in this story, by using multiple characters instead of just resorting to Pan and Goku over and over again, it's able to utilize different styles and as well, you know, using the personalities instead of just making them cheerleaders to Pan and Goku. Meanwhile, Raditz and Goku find a huge monster that is literally feasting on West City's power plant. It's Rage Shenron, who's creating a whole lot of electric slime for our heroes to deal with. Raditz is not concerned at first. After all, they fought mightier enemies than this. Don't worry, Kakarot! He doesn't look that <laughs> Raditz stumbles after being viciously electrocuted. Goku manages to quickly resuscitate his brother, him being humbled pretty quickly. They decide to go into their blue powers and finish the creature off right away, but they are pretty shocked when it survives their combined attempt at blasting it, thanks to him covering himself in the electric slime. This isn't going to be easy bro after all. Ray Shenron is taking everything that they throw at him and his electrical attacks are actually more perilous than they had first thought. Raditz however has an idea. He cuts a huge cord from the power plant that hadn't been damaged and tosses it at the beast. The monster feels the cord touching him, it doing nothing initially, and then just laughs at Raditz. The beast picks up the cord and starts to gobble on the electricity, growing even bigger and more bloated. And then both him and Goku perform a double dragon fist. While they feel the pain from the electrical field around Rei Shenron, they do manage to pop the dragon like a balloon. When his remains are trying to combine into a coherent being again, they get blasted again by the Son Brothers. Wow, that was harder than it looked. I hope Bulma has a spare generator. Meanwhile, Vegeta is also looking for dragons and finds a frozen portion of the city. While there, he sees an opponent who appears to be deliberately waiting for him. Despite the cold enveloping him, Vegeta is pretty surprised to see a blue-skinned humanoid dragon. Nevertheless, the aura that he can sense from this dragon is far more interesting and far more serious than the others that he had sensed and then eradicated by his allies. The prince smirks and feels absolutely confident with what he sees. This is not an issue, but also should be worth his time. Hmm, unlike your softer brethren, you actually look somewhat threatening. Shame that I have to take you down so suddenly. For a moment, the ice dragon doesn't respond. 
Vegeta isn't surprised. Cool by gimmick, cool by nature. But after what seemed like hours, Ice Shenron smiles back at Vegeta sharing the latter's bravado. Oh, Prince Vegeta, you are mistaken. The biggest shame of all is that unlike your friends, you foolishly chose to come and face one of us alone. I am saddened that you have so little faith in what I am capable of. Surely my kin would have taught you to expect the unexpected. Aside from flashy powers with very little behind them, your words matter not and carry no weight behind them. Are we going to fight or am I just going to have to end you where you stand? Ice closes his eyes and welcomes the invitation. Whatever you desire, Prince. The fight begins, and initially it seems that the Prince had indeed gotten the upper hand over the winged menace. But when Vegeta is lured into a false sense of security and prepares to launch a final, powerful, final flash charge, thinking that would be the finishing blow, Ice simply counters by freezing Vegeta's hands together, now stuck in his signature pose. Vegeta is taken by surprise for sure, but this isn't his first rodeo, so he uses his frozen limbs to fight his opponent. It's not like he's lost them, he's just got to use them in a different way. This does get noted by Ice though. The dragon is pretty impressed by his tenacity. I would have expected you to cease your petty resistance, but I will say... You have met my expectations, Prince. However, I wish to savor this altercation. With that and a confused Vegeta, Ice decides to freeze the Saiyans solid for later. Vegeta's expression of surprise left stationary for as long as he is frozen. Ice walks over to the now Princical and kneels down, placing a hand on the formation. I am not finished with you. You are too much fun. This whole ordeal is being watched by a being very similar in appearance to Ice, yet one that is having mixed feelings about what he just witnessed. The golden interpretation of a dragon is not impressed. Did you really have to be so dramatic with your neutering of the matter? Honestly, you make the prince look stoic by comparison. Ice, who had looked calm and collected, turned to this other dragon, and his expression became a little bit more petulant, breaking the illusion of calm. Don't look at me like that, brother. There is a reason behind this other than endearment. When we have absorbed enough power, I will bring him back and finish the job. To have even more fun with him when the odds are more stacked in my favor. The other dragon still isn't convinced. You really think that we will be the ones to end this? Our weaker kin are all gone. It's just us. And from what I gather, Nuova, you are right. However, I care not. Their demise are all according to the plan. You seriously think the frog or the bulbous rat monstrosity would have been enough to finish Earth's strongest? No. Soon it will be either us or the first star who will be left to grab what's left. Nuova watched his brother for a second, sighs, and then rolls with his brother's method. Well, fine. We'd better get going before the prince thaws out. We need to strike fast and take the dragon balls before the earthlings do. Well said, dear brother. Well said. And so the two menacing beings left Vegeta, who was slowly trying to thaw out from his icy prison. But this ice was no mere ice. Ice's ice was far tougher than the prince could have anticipated. Meanwhile, our heroes intend to slowly meet up and check out their progress in fighting the shadow dragons. The prognosis was good at first, the dragons being offed slowly, but, you know, getting back together, getting some dragon balls, it was quite beneficial in the long run, but Goten and Trunks actually get ambushed by Ice and Nuova before they can actually revel any more, keen for some more frozen treats. As they had recently fused into Gotenks, they can't fuse again for the moment, so soon, and they know it. But they still feel quite capable of being able to beat them together, or at least the very least delaying these bozos from causing any more trouble until they can fuse again. Like with Vegeta, Goten and Trunks feel that they got this at first, and it does start off in their favour. But still, the combo of Ice and Nuova is on a whole other level. In a matter of minutes, the brothers up the ante considerably, and Goten can sense this. And despite trying to wish to bail, Trunks will not give up. Their elemental powers are dangerous and an unexpected combo, and it causes the two young men to lose the ordeal, and then allows Ice to take away their Dragon Ball. His brother stops him from finishing the two off, however like with Vegeta. These two are not worth it. And besides, don't forget what we were told. Ah yes, I forgot. No killing. 
I forgot that you were always a buzzkill, brother. We are not here to playfully take lives, Ice. We have what we came for. Let's go. Luckily for our heroes, Trunks is able to send out a distress signal. But that insubordination, Ice knocks out the boys and then looks playfully at Nuova, who rolls his eyes and walks away. Not long after they disappear, though, they got the message, the Dragon Team. Raditz, Goku, Pan and Ranch get to the boys and offer a helpful sensu. They reveal that the twin dragons have proven to be pretty formidable opponents, unlike the other dragons, which were pretty much no problem at all, which causes ripples of concern to wash over the gang. Gohan and Piccolo are trying to sense them, while Vegeta... Where is Vegeta? This delays their search for the dragons for the moment. It does take them some time, because the prince's life energy is pretty faint in the ice block, but they do help him, and they get there faster when they actually were able to get there. He would be really furious right now for being hoodwinked, if not for the fact that he is really weakened on the account of him being frozen for quite a while. He... he... he tricked me! N next time, he... he won't be so, so, so lucky! Don't worry, Vegeta! Goku chimes in. If we were together, we could take these two no problem! Vegeta grunts at his ally's never-ending optimism. Meanwhile, Piccolo and Gohan, whilst finding out Vegeta's okay, continue the search, and soon have intercepted Nuova and Ice. At first, it seems that the surprise attack will be the end of the dragon duo, but you know where this is going to go by now. Their fight begins, and Piccolo is the one who uses the Hell Zone grenade against Ice, while Gohan takes on Nuova. The Saiyan got quickly complimented by the Golden Dragon, which took Gohan by surprise. He can sense that this entity had some sort of connection with him, but he couldn't quite think why. It was really strange, unlike other villains he had fought. He is curious, but his voice remains stern. You're different from the other dragons. Why are you doing this? Nuova shakes his head, but his expression carries a subtle trace of fondness for Gohan. But it's very, very discreet. Those other four that you and your friend met are limited by their simplest of desires and urges. They are mere tools in our grand plan. Their existence was summoned here by the weakest of wishes. Wait, summoned? Not created? You mean that- Nova blocks Gohan's attack. Correct. You are a smart one. We come out to play whenever the power of the Dragon Balls has become corrupted, each time reshaped by mortal wishes. And I must say, you humans have been very busy these past few decades. We could barely keep up with your selfish desires. But, but you hurt people in the process. How can you justify that? <laughs> Only the lower ones do. My brother and I are far beyond those primitives. If you just give us your Dragon Ball, you can end this cycle of violence much quicker. Isn't that what you want, Gohan? Peace. But Gohan refuses. Meanwhile, Ice Shenron is pretty irritated by Piccolo keeping him entombed in his attack, and so, to try and redress the balance, he absorbs the two-star Dragon Ball in his hand that he took from Goten and Trunks. His power skyrockets as he is able to impale Piccolo with an enormous icicle. Then he blasts Gohan in the back and takes away his Dragon Ball. However, Nuova doesn't take this very well. He is absolutely enraged. No! This was my fight, Ice! You didn't have to hurt them like that! I was so close to ending this without conflict! Oh, for goodness sake, you and your pacifism! Stop complaining. As you said yourself, we have a mission. And we don't want him to do it for us, do we? Ice tosses the seven-star Dragon Ball to his brother. As much as Nuova hates to admit this, his sibling has a point. Even though he despises his methods, Nuova agrees to absorb the seven-star Dragon Ball taken from Gohan and Piccolo, in case any other Earthlings try to nab them. They are going to need it to face against the rest of the mortals, and they are right, as Goku, Raditz, and the others arrive on the scene. This time, Vegeta goes in strong at his full power of Super Saiyan 4, keen to right the wrong from earlier. Despite this, he is still pretty surprised by the power boost that Ice has gotten in the interim thanks to the absorption of a Dragon Ball. Ranch and Pan are helping them as best they can, as they are also furious about what he did to Gohan. Meanwhile, Trunks is tending to the wounded, while Goku, Raditz, and Goten are the ones to try and take on Nuova. The dragons are very powerful, but the Saiyans have strength in numbers. The two dragons decide to make a desperate move. Nuova causes a giant explosion that forces everyone to back off, while Ice creates an icy barrier around the brothers and the explosion. 
This gives them a degree of separation from their opponents and buys them just a little bit of time to recover and formulate a secondary plan. Before the fighters manage to break through, something new emerges from the icy cocoon. Ice and Nuova have fused together into Nuovice. We took that little trick from the Metamorans. Ah, we remember the times when they were still around. It's a pity that they attracted too much attention from the galaxy's ne'er-do-wells and the most of evil. Now with the power of four Dragon Balls and fusion and a time limit on their backs, the dragons need to act fast. And act fast, they do as their combined power is absolutely monstrous. While Nuova's personality keeps the fused dragon from straight up eviscerating their opponents, the creature is pretty relentless, as it easily dispatches of Super Saiyan 4 Ranch and Blue Kid Raditz, and takes the Dragon Balls from them with little fuss. Vegeta and Goku are trying to take them back, but the monstrosity quickly absorbs them. To our hero's credit though, the fusion cannot take this much power in one sitting, and after barely a few minutes and the surge in power, it results in the being diffusing abruptly, leaving Nuova and Ice with only three Dragon Balls each. This does seem more manageable to our heroes, and Ice is looking desperate. Well, you are quite the annoyance. How about instead of wasting our time fighting you, we will freeze and scorch this sorry excuse for a planet. Ice is losing his patience. Nuova, despite all this resistance, is steadfast and remains composed. This is not our mission, Ice. We are missing only one Dragon Ball now. We have no more quarrel with these people. You bet that we have a quarrel with you. Vegeta seems to be quite angry. Y yeah, what, what he said. Raditz is pretty surprised to be agreeing with Vegeta. You were always too soft, brother. Ice scoffs as he begins to unleash an attack that would make the last Ice Age look like a joke. The Saiyans attempt to stop him, but he warns them that a detonation of his body while charging this attack will create an effect even more powerful than the blast he is actually trying to attempt to use. As he is about to launch an icy doom upon the planet, his blast gets blocked by Nuova's fiery blast. Ice, instead of getting angry, seems to be calm, as if he knew that this was going to happen. So you decided to betray me, brother. I knew it was a matter of time. You care for them too much. What? Care? Raditz is confused. How could a dragon like that care for them? The wish has twisted your heart, Ice. I cannot let you do this. As they both struggle amongst themselves, all the Saiyans decide to do is to help Nuova and add their Ki Blast to the mix. As Ice is about to explode, causing an icy destruction, Nuova engulfs him in his own flames to try and cancel out the effect. The three Dragon Balls that were occupying his body fall to the ground. I guess this is a ceasefire, huh? Goku looks at Nuova. What do you plan to do with these Dragon Balls, freak? Vegeta isn't sure that he trusts the dragon. I need to rebalance them before my most powerful sibling finds them. Rebalance? I need to take them to the source. Super Dragon Balls? Gohan begins to understand. Nuova slowly nods. Like I said, you are a smart one. Originally, all of us shared the same goal but all the selfish wishes that we had absorbed on the way started to twist our minds. I might be the only one left still loyal to the cause, and if I don't do this, Black Smoke Shenron will be more powerful than ever. Will you help me to find where those Dragon Balls landed? Y yeah say the group, and so Nuova and the Dragon Team have joined forces. But meanwhile, someone already started collecting the Dragon Balls thereafter. Sin Shenron grins widely. Everything is happening as he intended. In the resulting silence after Ice's explosive conclusion, the team and the Golden Dragon now had to figure out what to do next, as well as get with the program as to how to work together despite fighting each other only moments ago. As the tensions had indeed slowly started to fade away, becoming clear of their present situation between Nuova and the Dragon team, the Dragon started to actually explain without the feeling that he was on the back foot for once, or about to be ambushed, he felt sort of at peace. He had a feeling that he chose to listen to, despite Ice having the same sentiments, but ignoring them. Also, he had that connection with Goku, given that he had the four-star ball embedded in him. Yeah, he knew he could trust these people, ultimately, to help restore order to the Dragon Balls. And after that, who knows? We don't have much time, said a rather relieved, but still rather stoic Nuova to the serious expressions staring back at him. We may have been able to stop ice from enveloping this world in an icy tomb, but there is a far greater concern coming our way. There is one more, 
brother of mine fast approaching, lurking in the shadows. I can feel it. If my brother finds these three Dragon Balls that belong to ice, no one, and I repeat, no one, will be able to stop him. Not even myself. Raditz was stunned. Seriously? But ice was so strong with those Dragon Balls in him! Is your brother really that formidable? Nueva gravely nodded and continued. I'm afraid so. Even if I were to consume these Dragon Balls right now in front of you, I still would not be strong enough to take him head on in battle. Vegeta glared at the dragon, him becoming more and more useless by the second. But something had clearly gotten to him before that. Yes, we get it. Big bad coming. But go back a second. This rebalancing that you speak of, what did you mean by that? What does that entail? The dragon grimaced. They were getting bogged down in the specifics at a time like this? Nuova really didn't want to waste any more time talking when Shin was roaming free like this, but he was also aware that if he didn't explain any more to these people, these creatures will not help him, and the one they called Vegeta would probably, and gladly, lead the charge against him. There was no other option. As you might be aware at this point, your Dragon Balls were created from the shards of the original ones, the Super Dragon Balls, crafted by the Dragon God Zalama many eons ago, what many pray tell to be the first Namekian in existence. But they are not meant to be used as frequently as your people have grown used to. In most cases, they take many decades to find, but for you, it's done in minutes. That's why we're in the situation we are right now. Because of their overuse, they have become corrupted. I wish to purify them at the source. Goku nodded. So, it is your job to fix that, but why are you guys so hostile? As I explained earlier, since we are connected to each and every Dragon Ball, and what it has been through through these years, the corruption weighs heavily on our minds, and therefore pollutes our judgment. Usually, the level of negative thoughts is something we can handle, but this is the most corrupted we've ever seen them. You people have utterly abused their power. Naturally, the basic instinct for the weaker of us was to simply punish you and purge you from existence. Our heroes had no argument for that. The creature was right, actually. There hadn't actually, on reflection, been a year when a wish hadn't been granted on the Dragon Balls. Thank you, Bulma, for wanting to look young. Ranch pondered this for a while. All right, so you didn't get completely corrupted. I get that. And you want to fix it. But what would a truly corrupted dragon want from them? Nova shook his head. I can only imagine what is going through my brother's head right now. He always was one of the more arrogant entities in our crash. Vegeta scoffed. Hmm. I think the trait runs in the family. Nueva scowled, but otherwise ignored that jibe. He must feel real precious to look at him from that glass house of yours, Vegeta. Watch your tongue, brat! The prince didn't even bother to look at Raditz when he said this. Oh, when I get back in my grown-up body, I will smack you upside and back! After that little bickering, the heroes and Nuova eventually decided to seek the Dragon Balls with the help of the Dragon Radar one last time, one last ride, before vowing to either curtail their use of them, or better yet, never use them again. Nuova would really like that. Quickly, as to be expected, they discovered that the balls were already being gathered. It has to be Shin, my strongest sibling. He was waiting for us to combat each other before he started to collect them. Whilst we've been jabbering on like this, he's been using this time to swoop in and grab the remainder. Well, now we're just going to have to take them back from them, aren't we? Raditz seemed pretty ready to fight. I can't believe this, but I'm agreeing with you for once. Vegeta nodded. In the end, they managed to locate Sin Shenron, who was busy absorbing the last of the three balls previously belonging to Ice. It goes around like that. He seemed pretty content to see the group, as if he were expecting them, and in fact, gladly anticipating them. Ah, why if it isn't my dear brother and the callous mortals who have been abusing our powers? Together, it seems. Intriguing. Nueva glared at Shin and shouted, Brother, we have all the Dragon Balls right here! We can end this now! We do not need to absorb any more! All we have to do is bring them together and we can rebalance them at the source! End this corruption! The mortals have promised to limit their use going forward! There is no need for this hostility! <laughs> corruption? I wouldn't go so far as calling it corruption. What you call corruption is for me simply my thinning patience. For countless millennia, we have maintained the balance of these items, 
checking to see if the power was being abused by selfish mortals such as yourselves. But this group over here, oh my, they have grossly overstepped the boundaries. Their over-reliance on the power of Zalamite's legacy has endangered not only this world, but the entire fabric of the universe. The very fact we have been manifested in their plane of existence is testimony to my beliefs. No, my brother, it is too late for mere compromise. It is time that we, the sons of Zalama, had our own wish on the Super Dragon Balls. Shin, it is not our duty to, but his sibling grinned, exposing sharp teeth. Duty? <laughs> this has all gone far beyond our duty, brother. We need countermeasures, drastic ones at that. And once I reach the source, I will make sure they are set in motion. You can stand with me if you want, or try to defend these pitiful mortals some more and face my wrath. I'm fine either way. Vegeta and Raditz had had enough of listening to Shin Jabba, as they both powered up and charged to attract the dragon. To their shock, not to our shock, he easily caught both their punches. They knew he was going to be powerful, yeah, but... He merely glanced at them, as if their powers were nothing, and just threw them away like a piece of rubbish. Next, he started attacking Nuova with a heavy heart, admittedly, since this was his brother after all. It became apparent very quickly why Shin was considered to be the strongest of all dragons, even without the help of the Dragon Balls. With only four of the orbs to his name inside of him, he was absolutely dominating them. All the Saiyans were trying to inflict some damage, but the effects weren't all that great. I mean, sure, the sheer amount of warriors decking Shin in the snoz and try saying that four times fast, was what started to slowly wear him down. But still, if he absorbed the remaining three balls right here, yeah, he was going to be completely unstoppable. Damn this kiddie form! If you could go Super Saiyan 4, Kakarot, we could have at least tried wheeling out Godits! Uh, I'm sorry, Raditz. I don't think my body could take Ultra Instinct. Vegeta sighed and looked at Raditz. Rajita? Oh, oh, right. Hm. You're lucky I'm willing to do that ridiculous dance for you. So... The two warriors went into Super Saiyan 4 and fused into a new version of Rajita to slightly help the balance of power. Shin Shenron had initially dismissed this threat, but learned about his mistake the hard way, as the fused Super Saiyan had proved to be much more of a threat than he had previously bargained for. While not exactly dominating the situation, Rajita was able to get a few pretty hard punches on Shin that allowed Nuova and the other Saiyans to put greater pressure on the final Shadow Dragon. But sometimes in these battles, it's not all about brute strength, but cunning as well. His brother Hayes was the one that was about to get him out of this situation. As he seemingly stumbled, Hayes let out a huge cloud of toxic gas that started to attack the eyes and mouths of the Saiyans, who started to suffocate. Nuova was unmoved and tried to go for the Dragon Balls on his brother's chest, but Shin had anticipated that and subsequently blocked the attack. And then he just took the three remaining Dragon Balls as if they were nothing. I really wish you had chosen to stand with me. Truly, brother. It didn't have to be this way, but alas. Shin shook his head as his sibling started to disintegrate after his innate Dragon Ball was taken. As a result, Shin Shenron had become Omega Shenron. He powered up and the sheer amount of energy created was so enormous that it threw Rajita, Goku, Ranch and all of the other Saiyans around the place like ragdolls. The creature was towering over them, all tall and majestic. And right now, though, Omega had no intention of finishing them off. His wish on the Dragon Balls would be enough to satiate him. As he grinned at them, laying around the place, still with the poison in their eyes, he vanished in a beam of golden light. He, he, he's gone! Gohan tried to compose himself. We have to go after him! I don't like saying this, but Beerus and Whis have to give us a hand this time. Vegeta cursed. This is no longer just a mortal matter. The very universe is at risk. In that moment, they decided to contact Whis, who indeed wasn't very keen on assisting them, but even he had to admit that a corrupted dragon, you know, might have a wish that could cause potentially disruption to the entire galaxy and universe. It could spell trouble even for them. And surely the GP would be okay with them stepping in for something so grave, right? Beerus, though, was of course mad at them for allowing this to happen in the first place. Why do I have to get lumped with the universe with the Dragon Balls? Do you ever hear about Ewen having to deal with stuff like this? Absolutely not! I get stuck with you. We did let our heroes know that the Super Dragon Balls had started to vanish from Universe 7. So, it's no longer just our problem. Goku looked at the rest of them. 
I think he's heading for Universe 6. Now with the reluctant help of Whis, our heroes used a shortcut to get to their twin world, where they witnessed Omega Sharon absolutely decimating Hit, Kaba and Kefla, with both Shampa and Vados watching from the sidelines. But Omega was on a whole other level, making Beerus and Shampa start to think that they might actually have to intervene. Our heroes were too late though, as Omega Shenron had already gathered all seven Super Dragon Balls. Before the GODs made the decision to actually step in, Super Shenron had already been summoned. I wish, Omega smiled, to become a Dragon God. And as such, he started to grow and transform into a being much more familiar, but far larger and greater than they remembered him. He became Black Smoke Shenron, but right now, he was as enormous as Super Shenron himself. The monstrosity smiled in triumph. Everyone here, including the gods, were just fleas when compared to his cosmic powers. He would be able to bend two entire universes to his will. But the one thing that surprised everyone was the fact that Super Shenron hadn't disappeared. No, he was seemingly watching to see what would happen next. As if that hadn't been made clear before now, our heroes are in serious peril. There isn't much higher you can go in terms of magical beings bestowing powers onto people than Super Shenron. Well, you see, Omega Shenron now indeed got his wish on the Super Dragon Balls. Nobody was there to stop him because, like we have said in countless videos before now, the upper echelon of the heavenly beings of Dragon Ball are completely and utterly incompetent and unknowing of the mortal realm, really. This blindness toward the perils of the Earth Dragon Balls causes Shin to transform. However, instead of simply buffing up to Omega Shenron properly, we see this creature metamorphose into a gigantic version of Black Smoke Shenron. His appearance has completely changed too, far less spiky and now much more ominous. Now, the evil serpent has the powers that go beyond the gods, with the likes of Super Shenron completely unaware of the ramifications since well, he was just floating there, not doing anything at the sight of this. How are Raditz, Ranch and the others going to deal with that threat with no other being stronger than it? As you can probably tell, the likes of our favourite pineapple haired boy isn't going to be put up with such trivial matters as this. God or not, I'm not giving up, Raditz yelled and fired a flurry of key blasts at the general direction of the evil dragon. But the monster just took it. Well, it was even more galling than that. The beast didn't even acknowledge any of Raditz's attacks. Like it were an insect, discreetly crawling on your person and you don't even notice it. No, those weird scratches you sometimes get without even realizing it. Raditz stood there, completely shocked. How could this thing ignore such a ferocious attack like that? Vegeta though, just glared at Raditz with a mixture of frustration and amusement for seeing Raditz fail at something. You know, old habits and all. Seriously, you didn't honestly think that that would work, did you? All you're doing is wasting your own energy. Raditz shrugged manningly. That's better than doing nothing, like you are. Vegeta ignored him. In fact, most of the people there ignored him, as their cat friend was getting a little bit more involved. Beerus was starting to lose patience. Despite noticing the significant change in malevolent energy, the cat and angel weren't at all worried, thinking this being is just being merely annoying. So, now that you're a god and all, what do you plan to do? You do know that we have every intent of bringing your fun to an end, right? The now fully restored and renewed Black Smoke Shenron chuckled. Your words speak volumes, puny gods. The overuse of the Dragon Balls in your universes has made you too blind and sloppy. Even your dragon hadn't noticed the terror you were about to face. He grinned at the two cat GODs as well as their Kai's. As to what do I plan to do, I'll just do what you two are too weak or too selfish to accomplish. Do your jobs for you. I will reshape your universes into a realm where mortals know their place. None of this trying to drink tea with their rulers. I will become worthy of Zalama's legacy. The sound of the name. Super Shenron flinched slightly, as if that name was enough to wake it from its apparent torpor. Which, of course, was noticed by Goku and Ranch, them having a very keen affinity with dragons over the years, obviously. But none of them said a word, not wanting to attract Black Smoke's attention. They needed every lead they could get right now. 
With things getting dicey and both the cats getting very keen to punch something, they turned to their attendants. Whis, Vados, is it a good time for us to intervene, please? Beerus looked at the angels with a serious expression then, keen for the answer to be yes, praying that there is no danger of the cosmos noping them out of existence before Black Smoke tried to do so. Well, he is technically threatening the balance of existence, we started, but he hasn't done anything yet. Vados finished the sentence. Champa then growled with anger at the hearing of this from his own angel. Some use they were right now! Goku looked at Black Smoke Shenron with a look that reeked of trying to find a reasonable solution. Listen, we know how you feel about the Dragon Balls. You think that we use them for purely selfish stuff? But most of the time, we use them for a good reason. To save people. To save our home. Surely you can see that from what you remember. Right? Black Smoke grinned, sensing Goku's desperation in his voice. Only to erase consequences of your own actions. Right, Son Goku? You fail to recognize that in what you say. Your own foolish mistakes are the only reason that you and I have any sense of a connection. At times when you people had endangered lives, to erase your sins, to forget your own faults, banishing them. Here, Black Smoke took a long look at Vegeta. From existence. In the midst of all of this, Ranch was getting pretty annoyed. She had had enough of all of this cryptic nonsense. What's the point then? Here, Black Smoke turned to her with an intriguing expression, which conveyed her to continue. Why were the Dragon Balls even created if there was no intention of people to ever use them? That's ridiculous! All it does is toy with people's base desires! Precisely. You are a very clever girl. You mortals were never meant to use them. But you see, the divine design that sparked our very creation was undertaken by Namekians. The Dragon God never intended the Dragon Balls to be used by lowly mortals for their own base wants and needs. They were meant to be tools of the gods, to aid them in shaping the land. And as you know, all too well, your gods did a less than stellar job of it. You have no right to do that, to mess with mortals, Gohan chimed in. You can't just punish the whole universe for the actions of a few people. It doesn't make any sense. Goku looked at his son, pondering. He stepped forward and slammed his chest with his fist in a sort of primal stance. If you want to punish someone, you can punish me. It's my fault the Dragon Balls came into our life. It's my fault we were the ones to overuse the power. The rest of the people in our universe have nothing to do with it. Don't bring them into this. Black Smoke Shenron then pondered this though, looking somewhat surprised. How touching. You are willing to give yourselves up and sacrifice for your past transgressions? All of you, without question. He looked at our heroes, hoping to see a shadow of a doubt. But he didn't get that. There was nothing. They stood firm with Goku. All of Universe 7's fighters, annoyingly for Black Smoke, stood together, ready to accept their punishment. After a moment, their Universe 6 allies joined them as well, standing right next to them. The dragon cackled loudly. Even though he wanted the universe to suffer in its entirety, he at least sought some satisfaction in making the perpetrators squirm, them taking responsibility for once. Good. So be it. Prepare to experience the true wrath of a dragon. And so, Black Smoke's eyes started glowing with an angry red glare as he started to unleash his punishment upon all the fighters of the two universes. Trunks, Goten and Ranch held hands. Pan hugged her grandpa and father. Vegeta, Goku and Raditz gave each other respectful nods. Beerus and Shampa also bowed their heads slightly before the sacrifice of the mortals. But nothing happened. Was that all a ruse? Much to the surprise of everyone, including Black Smoke Shenron, the hurtful act never carried out. Everyone remained unscathed. Black Smoke writhed in rage. What's going on? I was to erase them! Why didn't it work? And then, after remaining silent and still for all this time, Super Shenron finally spoke. Hey, 
who spoke in the divine language, this causing the gods to give a little smirk. Beerus and Weiss looked to each other. How did we not see this coming? What a fool this dragon has turned out to be. The rest of the gang were confused. See what coming? What? What do you mean? They deserve to be punished. They have overused the legacy of our creator, Great Super Shalom. They need to go! Blacksmith started to lose his composure, while Super Shenron remained stoic and unmoving. Remaining utterly in the dark, the mortals could at least grasp that what Super Shenron was saying right now was not something that Black Smoke wanted to hear. No, no, this is not how this is supposed to end! You cannot just forgive them! Meanwhile, Super Shenron looked at Goku, just as if he nodded at him. No words needed to be said. Goku knew exactly what he had to do. Goku took his hands out and started to slowly charge an attack. Soon, the others realised what he was going to do and joined in with their own respective attacks. Ah, fire! Masse! Double! The Saiyans and the other defenders of both universes began to charge their signature attacks. The combined power of universes 6 and 7 united in their joint effort to stomp out this imposter of a god. I, I am Black Smoke Sharon! This won't work on me! I am eternal! Indestructible! I am not Dragon Balls! Without me you are nothing! You hear me? NOTHING! And although previous attempts to attack hadn't done anything, this beam felt as if it were being amplified by something. Something magical. Almost as if a super general was helping them in spirit. And it struck a gigantic dragon right into his head. It didn't evaporate him exactly though. No. He wasn't given the satisfaction of a quick death. His scales started to crack, revealing a familiar green serpentine body. This this cannot end like this! No! Black Smoke Shenron protested, when his body started to crack open like a shell, freeing Shenron, who at this time was bigger than ever. Finally, there were just some black scales left that withered like smoke on the wind. Their old Shenron was back, mightier and more majestic than ever, and was looking right at them. Like the whole experience had powered him up to unforeseen levels of power, almost to the level of Super Shenron himself. Thank you, my friends. Thank you for ending this nightmare. He looked at his super counterpart. However, Black Smoke was right about one thing. The Dragon Balls have been overused. So it is with regret that they must leave the Earth, leave this universe, be taken to a place where mortals will never again be able to reach them. It is for the best. Well, that's a relief. But before you do that, could you at least make me normal again? Shenron looked at Raditz, who then popped back into his normal adult self rather quickly. Now how about Kagarot too? Actually, I wish to offer Goku the chance to travel with me. Goku smiled at Shenron. All right. What? Everyone shouted, including the gods who were looking at Goku. Sounds like another adventure. I could do with a good old-fashioned adventure after all this. You can't just leave, Grandpa. We'll miss you. Pam was getting angry. Don't worry. It's not goodbye forever. Or at least, I hope it's not. He looked at Shenron, who wasn't saying anything. Super Shenron also didn't say a word. Where are you taking him? Vegeta asked the dragon with a flat, dry voice. To the realm of our creator, the dragon god Zalaba, so he can train under him. Well then, I wish to go as well. Vegeta looked stern. But before Shenron could respond to this request, Goku intervened. No. Goku flew over to Vegeta and hovered at his eye level. You can't come with me. Not this time, Vegeta. The others need you and Raditz here. You guys got this. I can't think of a better team than all of you. Besides, you got a big family. You can't just leave them behind. Well, so... So do you. Vegeta gave Goku a weak smile. Yeah, but we both know that you're a better family man than me. And as such, 
Goku bid a hearty farewell with his loved ones, and naturally there was a lot of hugs and tears. In fact, nobody had any idea whether they'd ever see Goku again. Shenron then gave everyone a ride back to their respective universes, and before Goku and Shenron left for the Dragon Realm, they visited all of his friends, and Goku of course had to explain everything to Chi Chi, who was very sad, but in a way understood that such is the nature of Goku. In the end, Goku, Roshi and Krillin met at a certain beach to once again have a spa for old times sake. And then the dragon and Goku flew away, even from the regular G.O.D.'s eyes. Beerus often asked Whis about the whereabouts of Goku, but Whis always just smiled and looked away. He knew where they went, but he couldn't tell a soul, not even his boss. Universes 6 and 7 had their guardians, with Ranch, Goten, Trunks, Kaba, Kale, Khalifla, mentored by Raditz and Vegeta, and everything was good. That is until Universe 3 scientists started to remember his disgrace from the Tournament of Power, but that, my friends, is a story for another standalone chapter. For now though, we say goodbye to Raditz and Ranch in the GT timeline. But what did you folks think? Did you feel this was a good way to wrap things up? Are you curious about this new standalone chapter? Leave a comment below and let's get this discussion going. And I will see you in the next video. Catch you later!